Okay, this is Jonathan.
Okay. Um, to uh, um, this conference on the economics of Brexit. Um, I'm Jonathan Portis from uh, uh, the UK and a Changing Europe um, and King's College L London. And I'm just going to briefly welcome um, everybody and uh, um, introduce the conference. Uh, this is, I think, um, possibly um, the first uh, sort of large-scale conference um, that's been de that's devoted to analyzing what we actually know about uh, the impact the economic impacts of brexit uh, since the uh, since brexit happened and in particular since the implementation of the trade and cooperation agreement on January the first two thousand and twenty one um, so of course there was a huge amount of analysis um, in the run up to you know both uh, uh, between the referendum um, and brexit itself uh, forward looking um, forecasts modeling and so on of what the impact of brexit would be under different models um, but now that we have more than a year of actual data and experience we can begin to at least tentatively say something about um, the, uh, 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 the the early impacts so sort of working backwards through the agenda, as it were. Um, we will, uh, this afternoon, finish um, with a discussion of my particular topic, uh, um, the post-Brexit immigration policy, which in my view is one of the most interesting aspects of what's happened um, since Brexit, and which has evolved in a way quite differently to what I and, and some others may have uh, 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 might have forecast uh, a few years ago. Uh, and we'll have Madeleine Sumption from Oxford um, and Mirto Economy from the IMF talking about that. Um, we'll have uh, discussions on uh, um, the impact of Brexit on services trade uh, um, with uh, um, my UK and Changing Europe colleague Sarah Hall from Nottingham and Jundu from Aston. Um, and we will also have uh, some analysis of the political economy of Brexit, um, looking both at trade with Meredith Crowley, another UK and Changing Europe uh, colleague, um, with some new results, um, and uh, DMO Fetzer from Warwick, uh, one of the foremost analysts of uh, uh, the, uh, sort of at a micro level, some of the political drivers and implications of Brexit. Um, going backwards just before uh, lunch, we have two new pieces of research, both of which you have been, appeared in the press um, in the last couple of days. Um, Tom Sampson um, from LSE uh, talking about his analysis with others of trade patterns um, between uh, 2016 and now, the sort of macro level trends of what's been happening uh, to UK trade both with the EU and the rest of the world and what we can conclude about Brexit from that. Um, and then published just this morning, Josh DeLion uh, will be talking about his research with Nick Data and others, also from the Center of uh, from Economic Performance, um, on uh, the impact of Brexit on trade at a, more, at, a, at a very micro level, and in particular on supply chains and on food prices. And many of you will have seen the stories, um, both by Lizzie and by others that appeared in today's press, um, about the impact of uh, Brexit on food prices what might one might call the, the re-smog effect. Um, um, and that brings me right to now. Um, I am not going to do the proper formal introduction of, uh, of Adam Posen because that is very much for Lizzie. Um, but just to say how both excited and grateful I am to, to uh, have Adam, who is a close both professional and personal friend, um, back in London uh, um, some years after he uh, departed these shores and departed the Monetary Policy Committee. Um, Adam, of course, was very outspoken about the uh, economics of Brexit, austerity, and many other things while he was here. But I think this is his first big uh, uh, um, intervention on the topic of Brexit since leaving. Um, and I'm really, as I say, grateful and excited uh, to hear what he has to say. But over to Lizzie. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, thanks for having me today and to UK in a changing Europe. Um, 
I'm Lizzie Burden. I'm a UK economy reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, for the past year or so, I've been writing as part of my job the Beyond Brexit newsletter, which has given me the painful privilege of watching our next speaker's predictions about Brexit's impact on the UK economy pan out on a week-by-week -week basis. Um, previously appointed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer as an external member of the Bank of England's Rate Setting Monetary Policy Committee, and since 2013, President of the Washington-based Peterson Institute for International Economics, Adam Posen is perfectly placed to uh, give us the transatlantic perspective on how Brexit has impacted the UK economy and its place in the world. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Adam. Thank you. Um, don't applaud my managing to get out of my chair. Um, I, I, I wish to reciprocate both Jonathan and Lizzie's words. First to Lizzie, uh, this is the first time we're meeting directly uh, given uh, COVID, but I do read the Beef for Brexit newsletter, as you all should, and she's been making a real contribution from her perch at Bloomberg, so I'm delighted to have her on the panel, sharing the panel with me. And I just reciprocate Jonathan, one of my closest personal and professional friends. What he and Anand Menon and their colleagues have accomplished with UK and changing Europe um, I think is extraordinary. I, the crowd here and online is in recognition of what they've achieved as the center of objective, relevant, honest, and topical work, uh, serious work on Brexit and on related issues of Europe, of UK in Europe and Europe of Europe. And uh, what they've built in a short time is quite incredible. So uh, I thrilled to be back under UK and a changing Europe, in a changing Europe's auspices. Sorry, I keep getting the preposition wrong. Um, and congratulate them on their latest big grant from ESRC, I believe. Um, so the, as Jonathan mentioned, the conference today is the big uh, independent assessment with some very distinguished academics and researchers coming up. I'm here to give a slightly different perspective, as Lizzie mentioned. Um, so my last big intervention, as it was in Europe, on Brexit was a few years ago. I gave a lecture at uh, King's College London, um, uh, which got a reasonable amount of notice. And a year before that, I did a video screed, or, or did a talk, which turned into a video screed that went somewhat viral. and the. Two main points um, that I was making at the time about Brexit, from which other things followed, were first, as many others have made since, gravity matters. It's one of the few things that economics can treat as not quite a physical law, but the idea that there's real reason why you trade and invest primarily with uh, the economies that are closest to you geographically and historically and that Brexit was just running in the face of that. And second, that Brexit wasn't just about trade, that it had to be seen in the context, not just a political economy context, but an economic context of broader actions involving foreign direct investment, financial flows, networks, um, immigration. And, uh, as Lizzie said, um, unfortunately, most of the things that I and then others, including write, those writing for UK and a changing Europe, have come out pretty much as the economists would have expected. So what I'm here to do today um, is to go back a little bit, but more to go across, which is to say I want to try to put Brexit in more of a global context. And again, I want to do this in two ways. I mean, first. I want to talk a little bit about how British openness, economic openness, compares to other countries before and after Brexit. And second, I want to talk a bit about some of the other work I've been doing, which I think is highly relevant, about the changing nature or what I would call the corrosion of globalization that is taking place and that recent events, notably the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, has accelerated. And because I think a lot of the Brexit discussion 
has quite understandably tended to be focused on the domestic politics, the impact a little bit on the blowback to Europe, but not quite taking into account enough the global context. And then having said these two things about how Bre UK post-Brexit compares and openness and how the context is changing, I want to offer some forward-going thoughts um, about what it would mean to be a global Britain in a non-Tory sloganeering way, um, in a genuine way, in the current context. So with gratitude to Jonathan and the organizers for letting me be a bit um, more normative, less analytical in some ways, I guess, than some of the other papers, so I'll ask your indulgence. So there are a number of works, and again, there's some very powerful work you're going to hear later today on trade, but the basic idea of defying gravity was always a stupid one. Um, there is no Wright Brothers jet plane equivalent that gets you out of reality. Or to put it differently, um, for those of you who've seen the, the musical Wicked, there's a triumphant song by the lead character near the end in which she sings, I'm defying gravity. And she rises up over the, the mindless throng. And of course, we all know that however nobly motivated she may have been, a couple decades later, she's under a house and or rather, her sister's under a house, and then she gets dissolved by water. Um, so the historical record of defying gravity is it looks really nice initially, and then it doesn't end well. Um, putting it differently, in economic terms, once you're defying gravity, you end up lost in space. Um, the UK has seen, just overall, a huge decline in its trade because it had a huge terms of trade shock to its trade with its primary trading partner. And so then the more interesting question is, what does that mean now that it turned out exactly as we forecast? Um, so I think the first thing to be said is that um, the impact was, of course, first felt in traded goods and almost as immediately in the migrant UK, EU, work, EU labor that couldn't come in the way it once did or benefit others the once did, but it also was felt and has increasingly been felt across other dimensions, including foreign direct investment in, in UK, including the access to the scientific community and joint funding with Europe and so on. Again, the people watching this or in this audience don't need to hear all of that. But um, what I'd like to do is just sort of give you a bit of a sense of the scale from a top-down level. And the data, which I'm going to show you, it's been put together with my colleague Lucas Regnifo Keller and Oliver Ward. It's government publicly available data, but it's, I don't think it's been put together in quite this way. So uh, can I use this? Yeah. No? Yeah. That's fine. So um, if you look at the left chart, what we're doing is just taking what is the standard uh, imports plus exports as a share of GDP. It's a rough measure, there's some critiques of it, but it's a good sense of general openness. And this compares from the start of 2017 to the latest available data we could get, which is the full end of 2021. And so the idea of making that comparison is not just since Brexit, but so that we all ignore and jump over the hump uh, or the downward hump, the valley in trade that COVID caused. And what you can see is, we, in all my comparisons, we're grouping things in two sets, UK versus the large economies of Europe, and UK versus what, for want of a better term, I'm calling the liberal Pacific. Uh, Canada, US, Australia plus Japan. Commonwealth doesn't quite fit when you include Australia or US, but anyway. So essentially, trying to compare two different definitions of like, uh, one being who were your peers in the EU, and the other being who were your peers as global liberal democracies who are of similar values. And what you can see is just the overall decline in trade in UK is much sharper than anyone else. Canada basically suffers a trade decline because they were exporting energy and there was a period there of low energy use and then that's since come back up. Um, you can see that on net, again, this is smoothing out COVID, 
uh, trade has continued to grow for the main economies of Europe. It's continued to grow for Australia and particularly Japan. And that for even the US, and remember this includes the Trump term, and this includes President Biden doing nothing to reverse Trump on trade, uh, trade shrunk less than it did in the UK. And so then if you look at the time series on the right, the story gets a little bit more complicated, but the basic message is, um, except for Canada, everybody else sees a recovery in trade following COVID, and the UK basically sits flat. Now, we can go into in a couple minutes whether how bad that is or how good that is. Uh, there's no simple mapping between openness and per capita GDP growth, so I don't want to oversell this. But it is a statement that at least top down post-Brexit Britain does look different than its peers in two senses. It recovered trade less from COVID than others, which is, which is I think, a nice sort of difference in difference approach. Um, if we think about receptiveness to foreigners, and Jonathan Portis is, of course, one of the world's leading experts on this, and you'll hear more from him and colleagues later, what we see is there was this long period starting, of course, uh, in the early 2000s where the UK was attracting and retaining a large number of foreign-born people. This is the, the growth in the foreign-born population, so, that, so that's sort of a proxy for immigration. And what you see is after Brexit, the EU uh, immigration just tails off and goes negative. And again, this shouldn't be a surprise, but I think people aren't quite so aware at times of how stark this is. As Jonathan has pointed out in recent writings, and I think importantly, we've not seen a sharp decline in non-EU immigration. And to the degree there is a trough of near zero EU immigration in the UK, that was largely due to Theresa May's policies at the Home Department and excuse me, the Home, Home Ministry and at the uh, SFPM. And so it is a bit of a pleasant surprise to me that when so much of the Brexit pro-Brexit campaign was run on xenophobia that we have not seen the overt xenophobia in, in terms of migration from elsewhere. So one cheer. Um, but that said, remember, this shows, again, we haven't had a sudden pivot, right? We haven't seen a huge compensatory ex expansion in non-EU migration. Again, colleagues speaking later today can say more about this, but just for the broad picture, you should understand where this is. The, the, it matters for migration and therefore labor force and therefore for fiscal sustainability and therefore diversity. And the UK is different. And again, putting this in international perspective, you know, the UK differs less on this chart, but it is more the UK um, ceases to be more open than others. So if we look on the left, looking at comparable Europe, Spain and Italy, of course, had this huge surge in migrants from the Med, from the Mediterranean, early in the 2000s, and then capped that off very quickly and, and went back down. But on average, if you left out, if you were to leave out that period, the UK is not hugely, but meaningfully accepting more migrants than the rest of wealthy Europe over this period. And uh, we get, this is growth, by the way, this is not levels. Um, we get to recent years, we get to post-Brexit, unfortunately we could only find data through 2020. The UK is on a downtrend. Uh, everybody else in rich Europe is back on an uptrend. And this is pre Ukraine invasion, okay. If we look at the, uh, what I'm calling the liberal Pacific, it's a little more mixed, um, but the UK had been in sort of pole position. And what I think is worth noting is contrary to a lot of people's expectations, there was significant periods, including of late, in which Japan was challenging the UK for the highest population growth among the liberal Pacific economies and in which the U.S. has steadily been going down. Um, some of you may have seen the article I had in Foreign Affairs a couple of years ago called The Price of Nostalgia, and there's an associated set of charts on the Peterson Institute website 
just documenting how strong and how long the U.S. withdrawal from globalization has been. And so the, the self-image and the public image of the U.S. as this magnet for migration has basically been in reverse since the mid-90s. So if you want to compare the U.K. to that, the U.K. remains much more open. But I don't think that that's necessarily the standard that you want to be doing, especially when even Japan and Australia, which have their own very fraught racist histories, um, have opened up significantly in recent years. Um, okay. And so here's some data on foreign direct investment inflows. And before I go into it, there's a bunch of issues with the data I'll discuss in a second. But this, to me, is actually extremely important. Um, there's been a lot of attention, rightly, in the UK about uh, capital flows. So about the city of London uh, managing other people's money, about oligarchs from Russia and elsewhere and Middle East, maybe not laundering money, but putting money safely into London real estate and other products. And of course, there's a long history of worrying about the pound. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those issues. But what I think often gets overlooked um, is the issue of how much foreign direct investment the UK used to attract. Um, and foreign direct investment here means both brownfield and greenfield. Brownfield being you are acquiring somebody, owner from abroad is acquiring a company or a property in the UK that already exists. Greenfield that you're creating a new property. Mm -hmm. um, what's important is there's a lot of evidence, including some by colleagues of mine at the Peterson Institute, that suggests inward foreign direct investment is very positive for growth. It, there's that you tend to get higher wage jobs, you tend to get more advancement in innovation and technology, you tend to get more transfer of skills, um, and you tend to get s sales of associated business services and other things the more FDI you get in. Now, this is controversial in some parts of left-wing Britain, um, you know, global multinationals doing bad things and so on. Um, again, we can get into it, but the data is actually pretty clear. Um, if, if, you're, if you're lacking inward FDI, you're missing a lot. And um, for those of you who long ago watched my greatest one-hit wonder, my Brexit video, you know, I, I, I talked a lot using the image of the auto industry, or not the image, the example, which has come to pass, which is not that Toyota and Nissan and Ford would stop producing cars in the UK, but they would stop producing cars in the UK for export to Europe. And therefore, the plants and the associated investment would decline over time, and it would not be replaced. And that is what we are seeing. So now let me put it back into global perspective. By its nature, FDI flow data is extremely choppy because one very large telecom deal or financial market deal can bias the data for a given year. So what we've done is tried to do multi-year averages. And over a long period in the 90s and early 2000s, which not coincidentally, I would argue, coincides with the period following the Maastricht Treaty, following the UK having a prime role or in, in being a, um, a bridge into European markets for American and Chinese and Japanese companies, um, it all falls back in recent years. And, and this data is, again, I want to admit, it's fully choppy and there's one particular big transaction in financial services in 2016 that drives up that little spike, not so little spike, you see in the second to last data point. But basically, even notwithstanding that, um, the UK is no longer defying gravity or, or being an outlier uh, compared to other economies, like economies in terms of forward and direct investment, inward foreign direct investment, excuse me. Um, and so again, there is this step change, which I think more recent data will continue to bear out. So, the international comparison is in all these dimensions, immigration, foreign direct investment, volume of trade. We've been trying to get some data um, on uh, what tariffs the UK faces and other measures of, of not so much how open the UK is, but what access the UK has to the rest of the world. And I'm hoping to put out in 
under UK and into changing Europe auspices uh, follow up on this lecture with more details. But just to say that it's not just the UK has, in a sense, had the Brexit experience, it's the Brexit experience <laughs> has taken the UK either back from being a leader in international openness and attractiveness to the average, or from the average to below average in international openness and leadership. Um, so what I did was, it shows you how much the world changes. So several years ago when I was last making charts myself, um, spider charts, which is what these are called, were the hot thing. I then spoke to my young colleague Lucas and said, can you help me make some charts and data? And he's like, sure, what's a spider chart? Because of course now things have gotten completely uh, advanced beyond that. But so humor old fogey me. What a spider chart does is it says, takes a number of dimensions. We we're hoping to have a fourth dimension, but for now we have a three dimension. Um, and it says you can, you can sort of standardize by the size of the measures in your sample and says how far are, out are you. And so if you look at the left two pieces, um, in comparison to the rest of the other major economies in Europe and then in the liberal Pacific on the bottom, the red triangle shows you just how uh, much more open the UK was even just a, a decade ago or five, seven years ago. And you look at the bottom uh, chart, the UK was essentially the most open by far. If you think of the area of the red triangle versus the others, the UK was the most open by far of the economic terms of uh, Canada, Australia, US, and Japan. And in comparison to Europe, the UK was the most open by far in terms of FDI and immigration and was roughly average in trade. And so we fast forward a few years, and again, I've offered to Lizzie, or she kindly asked, and all, all our data will be posted on the Institute website. You can check our calculations. You can do more interesting things with it than I've thought of doing. Um, well, once we, once, you know, it may not be today, it may be next week, but it will be there and you can play with the data and I hope advance it. If we shift to the right column, we're looking post-Brexit and you can see how the red triangle has completely shrunk. So this is post-Brexit, post-COVID. And so now the UK is essentially the lowest or the second lowest on inward FDI, on immigration and on trade compared to Europe and it went to being still noticeably more open on trade than the liberal Pacific economies, but not more so on immigration or inward FDI. So again, just that's the picture. Okay. So um, putting it in more time series, so this is just summarizing the previous charts, and I'm sorry to belabor it, this is the chart I, that I have my little comment on. Um, <laughs> So the, the dark red is the current state of the UK. The pink, hot pink, is the previous state of the UK, the cool Britannia area, era, um, or pre-Brexit, let's be more accurate, rather than cute. Um, and then the lines in the background are based on the average of the countries in the sample. And so whether you look at it, all the rich countries looked at, at EU, or even at non-EU, you can just see the shrinkage of the British world economically. So let me now subject you to some minutes of things that are not charts, um, trying to get beyond the point I have so laboriously driven home. So I, I think it has to be said that um, for all my worries about Brexit and things turning out pretty much as we said, there have been two positive surprises. The first, as I said, is my deep concern had been, uh, I think not unreasonably, but I'm glad to have been wrong, that Brexit represented a truly nationalist, xenophobic shift in policy, and at least on immigration, we haven't seen that. It's been very anti-EU immigration, but it has not been made things any worse um, on the general immigration. And the second one where I want to be acknowledge I was one of my fears what turned out so far not to be justified and which I think is very important is I was quite worried that given what happened was what I expected 
that the UK would try to engage in a race to the bottom, particularly on financial services and standards, in order to try to attract capital and, and, and investment uh, to make up for what it was losing. And I have to say, again, for whatever differences I have with the Johnson government and others, to their credit, um, there has not been a big deregulatory wave in the city and financial sector. Um, I had the privilege to host another old friend of mine, uh, Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England at the Peterson Institute uh, a week ago yesterday, I think, or a week ago today. No, a week ago tomorrow, sorry, um, last Thursday. I had the privilege to host uh, UK Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, and he strongly reaffirmed on the record that there's not going to be any race to the bottom on financial services. And I, so far, he's been right, and I hope he maintains that. Um, so I mean, there are some positive things. What remains to play for, in a sense, um, is what economists refer to as the dynamic effects of trade and investment. And the dynamic effects are essentially what affects the trend growth rate going forward, not just the volume of what you're doing, what inputs you have, it's how well you're using them. And the basic concern when one shrinks the triangle of trade and openness, as it were, um, which go, is that you are losing competition internally. And therefore, you get less innovation and less turnover and dynamism in your corporate sector, in your investments, and in your labor force. And that, as mentioned, I mentioned with FDI and Jonathan and others can speak out with respect to immigration, it also tends to de decrease your dynamism when you lose diversity of talent coming in and diversity of corporate cultures and so on. Um, again, just to be very clear, in the literature, the empirical literature we have, the direct effect of trade on productivity growth is not is there, but not terribly clear. The direct effect of immigration and FDI on productivity growth is quite clear and quite strong. And to the degree that you end up with less competition in an economy, whether through trade or other means, that definitely negatively affects productivity growth over the long run. So that's what's to play for. And, um, Various people, including the current prime minister, have at times invoked so-called global Britain as an ideal. And initially, when this term was being tossed about, I was very dismissive. I, I said, they're not going to be Singapore on the Thames. I just don't want them to become Cayman Islands on the Thames. Um, and as I said, at least with respect to financial regulation, I'm thankful that so far that's not clearly not what's happening. And it may be that one salutary unintended side effect of the, the war crimes, the, the tragic invasion of Ukraine by Russia, is that London and the UK are self-evaluating the extent to which they were a money-changing place for people with ill-gotten gains. Um, let's leave that aside now and look forward. What would be mean to be a global Britain in the current context? And the first thing to be said is that you're going back to gravity. You're not going to expand that triangle of openness and certainly not the apex of trade um, by making deals with a bunch of non-European economies. Or you'll expand it over time, but not in a big way. Um, it's changed a little bit since I quoted David Cameron in 2017, but you know you still have more trade with Ireland than you do with essentially all what used to be called the BRICS, except China. And even China has only recently passed Ireland as a share of UK trade. So to whatever degree one thinks that trade is an issue going forward, yeah, it's nice to try to do a deal with Australia and New Zealand where you give them side payments to get back to where you were <laughs> when you were a member of the EU. It's better than the alternative. It's OK to fantasize about a trade deal with India. Um, the, 
the destroyed careers of trade negotiators of all countries who've traded, tried to make deals with India um, through, the, through the last few decades, I think should be a cave hic dragones warning for all, but fine. Um, you can certainly, as the UK, and for a bunch of strategic and economic reasons, I would encourage applying to join the Comprehensive Partnership for Trade, yeah, the CPTPP. I can, I can never keep the acronym straight since they replaced TPP. CPTPP. I think that would be great. But this is all small beer, small potatoes, small whatever you want to call it. Um, so, what should be the global Britain strategy going forward? Well, unfortunately, and this is something where I will not backtrack on things that I've said in the past, unfortunately, the attitude of a lot of British policymakers and politicians, in particular of the current government and those who supported Brexit, who are among the current government, is that the UK can basically decide what it wants and others will have to deal with it, um, as opposed to the UK is now a relatively small economy in a big world and has to adapt. And I don't think that mindset is yet gone. Um, I wish it was. What I want to do now, though, is talk a little bit about why that's a little more challenging now than it would have been even a few years ago. As uh, former Prime Minister Harold Macmillan once said, you know, events, dear boy, events are what determine policy. Uh, COVID and the Russian invasion of Ukraine are real events. The anti-globalization politics in the US that, as I mentioned, I have documented has been building for more than 20 years is a real trend and event. Um, the rise of China and with that, which was not inevitable, but by Chinese choice, with that, the increasingly um, not just autocratic at home, but aggressive actions in global economic affairs by China is a real event. And so when the UK government and the UK public opinion and people like you all who are part of forming that public opinion uh, think about what the UK can and should do, it is not just, oh, we hold all the cards in the negotiation or, oh, we will just make the best deals we can. There is a real environment you have to think about. And so what is this environment? Um, so I published about a month and a half ago a piece in Foreign Affairs Online, which of course I don't get to choose the title. As you all know who write for anything, uh, editors get to choose the title. So the title was The End of Globalization? Question mark. And they were right because that happened to be a nice hook. But my, my view is not that globalization is ending. But as I mentioned, the globalization is corroding. And why do I fixate on that particular word as opposed to deglobalization, globalization end of globalization, pick your verb, or noun? Um, noun, actually. Um, I emphasize corrosion because consistent with what I tried to present a few minutes ago, globalization is really a multi-layered fabric. It's not just about trade. It's about investment. It's about business networks. It's about transfers of ideas. It's about humans moving back and forth. It's about intellectual capital. And even within trade, it's very differentiated what the nature of it, depending on what's being traded. Is it business services? Is it commodities? And so what we're seeing is, and have been seeing for a while now, is that globalization has been corroding, meaning it's fraying in parts. It's not that it's stopped expanding. We can look at CPTPP, for example. There are trade deals, major trade deals among significant economies going on. But in some places, one layer gets eaten away. In some places, there's holes. In another place, it's, it's, it's frayed. I already used that image, sorry. You, you put it all together, and the fabric is much looser, much more subject to tear. And is much more uneven than it once was. And for those of you who are into the political science international relations vision of this, that's exactly what you would expect if the rules-based system 
the, the U.S. Uh, encouragement and enforcement of a rules-based order for organizing economic activity has been eroding. And that is, of course, exactly what's happening. So things get more political, they get more spotty, they're more uneven. And that is, of course, a world that's much worse for development, economic development of low and middle income economies. Again, I'm not suggesting that the US was this munificent charitable institution that selflessly brought the developing world into richness. Of course not. But the US was, for several decades, into the early 90s from the war, basically providing a situation where the default was companies and countries who could get into globalization could do so on a somewhat fair basis. And if they had complaints, they could get them addressed in a somewhat fair way. And the default was the world was less about direct military power and bribery and more about markets. And that may sound like a very qualified claim, but it is not an accident that coincided with the greatest rise most widespread rise in human living standards in world history, and that is not just China. That's hundreds of millions of people in India and Eastern Europe and other parts of South Asia and a little bit in Africa and some in Latin America. But that's going away. And in a world where we have China and the US getting more political and getting more domineering and the institutions are less reliable, you end up with a lot of developing countries, and this will be even more evident in the years to come, having to choose sides. And that limits their economic options, or having to make political capitulations in order to get what they want. And if you're feeling very clever like Argentina, you can try to play off, China is going to bail us out. The US says, I don't want you to take money from China, take money from the IMF. Argentina says, well, you want me to take money from the IMF, it better be softer conditions than last time. And somehow it is. Um, occasionally that's going to work, but generally that's not going to be a great strategy. It's not good for the world. And so my view, as I set out in this end of globalization question mark article, is that these long-term trends of China and the US were already corroding globalization, but frankly, the EU and Japan and Australia and some others in Singapore were, were a big bulwark against this, and at least on the U US side could sort of push the US not to be too awful about it. But then comes COVID, and there is a very reasonable reevaluation of global supply chains for issues of shortages and resilience. And then comes Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and politicians take it too far, but quite reasonably suggest, uh, maybe I don't want to have all my sourcing from one place, or certainly not sourcing from places that are geopolitically or ethically or national security suspect. And so what's the result of all this? So the result is, and this is me forecasting what's underway and what will become more visible over the next couple of years is that um, it's easier to put in sort of good space and talk about industry, but it's about much more than just trade and manufactured goods. But so essentially you have a large number of multinational companies and investors increasingly encouraged on a national security basis by their governments to say, okay, I have to reallocate where my investments are, I have to essentially buy costly insurance and build redundant production trains, uh, processes or sourcing of products or sourcing of inputs. And I may essentially have to create one ecosystem to build and sell into the greater China and one ecosystem to, to source and build and trade into North America. and. The one in going into Europe is going to be uh, partially open to the US, but I should expect that it's going to be less open to the US and vice versa uh, in coming years. And so in that world, as my friend, the WTO director Ngozi has spoken about trying to put a positive on it, or as 
some of the cabinet members of the Biden team have called it friend shoring, or um, ECB President Christine Lagarde gave a speech at the Peterson Institute on Friday talking about open strategic autonomy, which I think is a preview for what Macron is going to push in Europe. It's about making very strong political choices to encourage friendshoring, nearshoring, a lot of tests and national security direction about where things get produced, where things get imported, and so on. Now again, it's kind of analogous to Brexit in the sense that, as I said repeatedly and others, and I think UK ICE has talked about, you can set out the economic pros and cons of a situation that is entirely reasonable, and I would argue in some cases fully justified, for elected officials or the population to say, I don't care about the economic consequences or my values, my sovereignty, my human rights are more important than the economic consequences. That's, you know, that's the way democracy should work. But um, it is similar to Brexit also that this is a world where trading opportunities are going to be more constrained, where investments will be losing some e economies of scale, um, where you're taking out more self-insurance, which may be the rational thing to do, which again lowers your returns on capital, and where self-interested special interests and companies will be increasingly able to exploit saying, hey, I'm your national champion or I'm your regional champion, you gotta protect me. So that's the world now, and I think increasingly so over the next few years at least, since I'm sad, I'm just checking the timer on my clock. Um, I'm sad that's the case, and I'm devoting my professional life to trying to change that. But if that's the world we're in for the next few years, what does this mean for a post-Brexit Ukraine that I was describing earlier? What would it mean to be a global Britain in a deglobalizing world? So let me conclude by talking about a few things on that thought. Um, the previous talks about global Britain, and I did find, or Lucas helped me find, a, uh, a sort of white paper from the government that talks about what a global Britain would be. And again, it, most of the stuff under this heading up till now has been misleading or misguided. Um, and essentially, it's about accumulating trade deals and then a lot of fluff. Um, now, what the UK has done is defy gravity at a time when the world is shrinking in economic terms. And to extend this analogy to painful links, and I'm sure Lizzie can smack me about for this, but um, as the world shrinks, its gravitational pull on you shrinks. So in other words, the chances that if you're off in space, you're just going to float away go up. The UK is increasingly unanchored to anything in economic terms. And the things to which it is anchored, like the WTO um, or the US-UK alliance, are getting politicized and becoming more undependable less powerful, and so they're less good anchor. And so it's no longer just, oh, we're out of the EU, the EU can make deals on regulations without us at the table. It's now, is the world gonna make deals without us at the table, or worse, is the world gonna divide up without even bothering to make deals, and we get forgotten about. Now, I, I'm not, this is directional. It's not like the UK is gonna disappear as an economy. It, it's the, the very sound numbers that UK ICE and others have come up about the costs of Brexit strike me as a little bit low, but very reasonable. You know, a few percentage points of GDP over a few years, um, and then, as I said, to play for how much of a permanent effect or a lasting effect on growth. But what I would suggest is it's no longer about
being excluded from the EU or self-excluding from the EU. It's that you're not part of any big block when the world is dividing at the blocks to, vast, to massively oversimplify. And in terms of friend shoring or open strategic autonomy, well, you're certainly not part of EU's strategic autonomy plans. And for the US, particularly for manufacturing, it's not clear what good you do versus a Mexico or, a, or a, another developing economy that has cheaper wages and potentially more uh, growth potential for the US planning process. So I think the way forward for a global Britain in this world has um, four elements. First, and this is something that probably is going to be very old news for this audience, but you have to, you being UK decision makers, you being informed UK public opinion, you have to, even more than before, resist the imperial hangover delusions. Um, this is a problem for the US, it's a problem for France, it's a problem for everybody, but it's still a problem for you. Right? So, I mean, again, I'm not saying anyone in this audience would say it, but it's like talking about mental health. You think, I'm crazy. Well, you're crazy. Well, fine. You're both crazy, but you still need help. Um, the, the idea that there's going to be renewed Commonwealth, special relationship with U.S., special relationship with India um, is just fanciful. Um, but the worst thing, I think, is letting the UK's security ambitions and foreign policy grandeur, which still has more justification than its economic, uh, drive economic decisions. Uh, these, the national security and economics are going to be joined together in coming years, unfortunately, but probably not in ways that are favorable to the UK. And so you have to let some of this go. And I get, I get sick. Liter lit not literally. I'm sounding too much like a 20-year-old. Um, I get nauseated, literally. Um, whenever I hear, you know, President Biden in the U.S. or other cabinet officials in the Biden administration, who I assure you I'm much happier with than the previous administration, you know, talk about U.S. is back. U.S. is a leader. Well, on sanctions, yeah. Um, on economics, no. Um, and so it's even more ridiculous, and I had this in a discussion with then Trade Secretary uh, Liz Truss, uh, we did a couple of years ago, the idea that the UK will somehow lead the new regime in economics. Now that we're no longer in Europe, we can lead ahead. I mean, nobody wants you to lead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, follow. Follow constructively. Try to make sure you get to join the right clubs from here on out. Be a good member. Second thing I think for making a global Britain work economically is um, to not think so much about trade, but think fundamentally about attracting good labor and capital. And here, as I tried to indicate in my opening and at various times during the charts, I'm actually more hopeful than I would have guessed I would be at this point. Um, as I said, we haven't seen the total anti-immigration turn that I feared Brexit portended. Uh, we haven't seen the financial race to the bottom that I feared Brexit portended. Um, we have even seen, although again partly due to tragic other events, uh, at least some sense of turning away from uh, capital that's just different forms of sort of money laundering. Um, these are positive. This is something you can build on. You should be, and this is where you can be a leader, as the people here from King's College London know well and other universities, attracting the students of the world is a very high value proposition. And if the US continues to behave as it's behaving, your market share should only grow. And it will mean more for you than for the US because your market is smaller. 
um, attracting FDI rather than uh, short-term flows of capital or, or throughput of capital may not be feasible in the auto sector, for example but it is feasible in R&D and business services and specialized services. So thinking in terms of attracting labor and capital rather than trade, I think, is the second point. The third point, to do my final defying gravity bit, let gravity pull you back to Earth before you end up floating away. Um, as an American, as American who served and worked and lived in the UK and loves the UK, but as American, I can say what others cannot. You really should go back to a EFTA-like soft Brexit deal. You should be working towards that. There's no substitute for it. And the kind of world I described is going to make that even more the case than it used to be. And so, I mean, you can get into the niceties of what that actually means, but essentially, Regulatory convergence on the European model and accepting that in trade issues you're going to become like Switzerland or Sweden is really what, or what you should be doing. Switzerland or Norway, excuse me. Um, go ahead with CPTPP. Go ahead with these other bilateral deals. But what's really going to bring you back to earth is, is by hook or by crook, quietly or openly, <coughs> reversing some aspects of Brexit. And finally, fourthly, the one place where the UK did, I think, often, not always, but often live up to its self-image and its ideals was being in policy spheres a mediator of sorts between the UK and the EU. Not a mediator in the literal sense of mediating disputes, although that did happen occasionally. But I, I probably need a better word than mediator, but essentially a, a middle force intellectually between U American and European policy proclivities in the economic arena. And that goes back to the charts that I showed, that while the UK, in terms of closedness, the shrinking red triangle, has moved much more closed compared to what it was before and compared to the big economies of Europe, it remains at least as open and in some ways still much more open than the US and the liberal Pacific nations. And so there is room in particular in the setting of standards over technology transfer, foreign direct investment, human rights and investment, financial services, where the UK can play a constructive role that would be in its own self-interest and in the world's self-interest. We can get there. There is a path to a global Britain in a changing world economy. I hope you all will help me convince the political leadership in Britain to take it. Thank you very much. Um, somewhat depressing, but appreciate, on a note. <laughs> appreciate you not pulling your punches. Um, I want to start with the inflation question. It's obviously something you would have thought about a lot at the Bank of England. Consumer price growth is running at a 30-year high in the UK. Of course, this is a problem around the world, but the Bank of England is leading the path on monetary tightening. Uh, we're expecting the fourth back-to-back -back rate rise next week. And of course, the war in Ukraine has exacerbated the inflation problem, but the seeds were already planted in the pandemic, but of course, before that with Brexit. The IMF, looking ahead, says that inflation in the UK will remain elevated for longer than any of its G7 peers. So Adam, is the reason that the UK's inflation problem is going to be worse, Brexit's impact on immigration and the labor market by making the labor market even tighter? 80% yes. Um, so I think that's absolutely right, Lizzie, to think about it this way. So what all the major economies, major so large economies, large market economies are facing is this combination of um, disruption and labor inelasticity, to put it in economy speak, 
um, economists speak, as a result of COVID and the reopening. And we see, as my colleague Jason Furman has taken great pains to spell out in the data, but I think is pretty obvious, we see a very large gap between the inflation rate in the US and the inflation rate in Europe. And there's been some convergence, but it's clearly almost entirely due to the energy shock, which of course affects Europe much more than affects the US for a variety of reasons. So if you take out energy, which you should, there's you know two to three percentage points a year of at an annualized rate rather of inflation higher in the US than in Europe, which when you were starting off with inflation targets of two percent, that's a big number. Um, I know you asked about the UK. I will I will get there. Um, so where is the UK in this? So the UK ends up as Governor Bailey said in his remarks at Peterson last week, and I think this is accurate, the UK ends up sort of in between. It doesn't have, for now, quite the inflation rate the US does, and, but it does have a labor market that looks more like the US. And so, and so arguably, the um, inflation factors in the UK are more like the US, meaning less transitory, less defined by the supply shock, more likely to have inertia and persist. Um, how much is Brexit, so why did I say 80%? How much is Brexit to blame? You know, I, I think that, and Jonathan's written some stuff I've read in the popular press where he, he argues don't overdo this, and certainly the Bank of England argues that or at least says it's too hard to tell what's Brexit and what's not Brexit, as you've reported on. Um, I, I, I think we're all getting a little too cute. Um, you know, you've seen a huge drop in migrant labor. You've seen a disruption in labor markets that everybody experienced due to COVID and reopening, but with fundamentally less room and elasticity uh, for reply because of Brexit. And that has to be part of it. Um, that has to be a major part of it. Because when you look at the monetary factors or the growth factors, you know, sort of process of elimination, all the other things we talk about, it, it, the UK doesn't look that different than the Euro area. Um, so then there's also a question of how much is Brexit affecting the macroeconomic side directly in the sense of inflation expectations and financial flows, which again, I know you've kept track of. Um, and there's a place, again, where I've been surprised, actually despite the recent news, I've been surprised positively. As Jonathan knows and is too kind to point out, um, going back to 2017, I kept expecting the pound to lose a lot, particularly versus the euro as a result of Brexit, and that has not happened. And so beyond the usual warning one should never try to predict exchange rates, um, you know, I, th I think it has to be said that the credibility of the monetary regime, the inflation targeting regime of the Bank of England, has held up better despite Brexit than I expected. So, but again, it, it's, when you look at the macro factors, um, it's very difficult to see anything other than the labor market issues. And when you look at the labor market issues and there's been no regulatory changes and no sudden shocks to the, to the nature of the labor market, it really seems like Brexit has to bear a disproportionate role in explaining the inflation. Okay, well, uh, they're looking for answers to the cost of living. They're looking to tariff cuts on food. Uh, reported today. Of course, one of the big drivers of UK inflation is food. Just this morning, a report by the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics showed that um, Brexit has driven food prices up 6%. And we know that that's partly because of border delays and the impact on uh, goods that are perishable, but also because of extra red tape. But the physical checks on EU imports of goods have been delayed, delayed, delayed. There's speculation that they'll be delayed again in July. So while food producers complain that that would give EU exporters an unfair advantage, uh, to uh, it, do the delays to the checks show that tolerating smuggling is the only way we can practically make Brexit happen? <laughs> 
All right, that one I'm not going to say yes or no, um, <laughs> even with a percentage. Um, but I, I do think you're on to something very fundamental, Lizzie. I mean, again, food, for obvious reasons, and I'm obviously someone who values food above pretty much all else, um, <laughs> food, for obvious reasons, takes an outsized importance in our consciousness. And I'm reminded of the um, Calvin and Hobbes strip which uh, they wrote when it was the We Are the World for Famine in Ethiopia. And, and Calvin says, it's amazing, it's terrible to think that there are all the people who go hungry and if, I can't believe it. And Hobbes the tiger says, wow, I know what that feels like. And, uh, and, and Calvin says, no, you don't. Um, so I know you didn't mean it this way, Lizzie. This is me being sort of sanctimonious, I'm sorry, but I mean, we, we, let's, all of us in the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> again, I know you weren't saying this, but let's all of us in the Northern Hemisphere use this moment to realize that food inflation of 6% is nothing to compare to the people right now in Egypt and the Middle East who are literally going to do without cooking oil and wheat. Okay. Anyway, close percent, uh, close parentheses. Um, shorter, shorter reply. Food is something that is not easily substitutable because it's seasonal. The better food for you is, the less substitutable it is. So there's no way to exaggerate the effect of not having people to pick the strawberries and pick the, pick the seasonal vegetables and fruit in the UK didn't matter. But of course that's now or now past that. I think the ultimate message is yeah, you're running a natural experiment on what happens when you suddenly run a trade war on yourself. This is what happens. Um, now, the Peterson Institute, we just published, and I think we've gotten some traction with the Biden administration. We did a serious, careful attempt by two different methods to say, okay, if you cut tariffs in the U.S., what would it do to inflation? And we just published this, and it's gotten picked up, and I think we're contributing, and some new noise coming out of the by an administration. I mean, again, it doesn't change the fundamental macroeconomics of inflation, but it is material. So our estimates were if you cut basically the tariffs that Trump put on, so not specifically them, but sort of the same amount of tariffs across the U.S. economy, just that, you could reduce the inflation rate by one and a half percent, plus or minus, probably a little less, but between 1.3 plus or minus. And that's a big number. And so, sorry, bottom line, I'm glad to hear about the announcement today that they're looking at that. The, you run a trade war against yourself, bad things happen. Better to retreat. Okay, well, a quick reminder, if you're in the audience in the room or if you're watching at home, Please do send in your questions via Slido and we'll, or maybe Slido, I don't know. <laughs> Slido. Um, and we'll come to them in just a little while. Um, Adam, you argue that trade gravity is a stronger force than any idea of a special relationship we may have with the US. Um, from your perspective in Washington, how far off is a post-Brexit UK-US trade deal? Is it even possible, given the lingering tensions over Northern Ireland? Close to impossible. Um, so here, I'll just be brief. Um, the UK, the US Congress, for its own reasons, all of which pretty much are bad, um, doesn't want to approve any trade deals of any kind with anybody, except trade deals that uh, make things slightly better on environment and labor standards, which I'm in favor of, and make things worse in terms of protecting U.S. industries, which I'm not in favor of. So like USMCA, which was the uh, supposed update for NAFTA um, with Mexico and Canada, uh, improved somewhat uh, environmental and labor standards agreements with Mexico, with Canada, they were already high, and went way backwards in terms of allowing Mexicans companies and subsidiaries to export to the US. So, and that just shows you what the state of affairs are. So even before we get to Northern Ireland, um, 
you know, what's in the trade deal for the U.S. that would cause Congress to do anything? Basically nothing. Um, so, you know, I think we just had, I guess, the meeting between U.S. Ambassador Tai and, I'm sorry, I lost the name of your current trade minister. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. My apologies to Minister Trevelyan. Um, we just had the, that's me getting old, that's not a slight, that's not meant as a slight. Um, we had the meeting between Trevelyan and Tai, and there was basically an empty statement that came out of it, which is fine because there wasn't going to be anything else. So then you throw on Northern Ireland. And again, for this audience, this probably doesn't need saying, but let me just say it again. The people who claim Irish descendants in the US is a very large number. They are concentrated, they're spread out throughout the country, but there are concentrations of them in particular districts and states. As a result, even on a cynical basis, a large number of leaning Democratic politicians feel very vested in uh, the Good Friday Agreement and in peace and security in Ireland. And some of them, frankly, if you went back 25 years, had Sinn Féin sympathies. Um, and then you go beyond the cynicism. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and the President of the United States, Joseph Biden, have Irish ethnic backgrounds and feel this very personally. So this is not going to happen. A percent, please. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, and in your talk, you mentioned Brexit's impact on foreign direct investment. And of course, it's not just inflation that the IMF warned about last week. It's also growth. Uh, they slashed their growth forecast for the UK economy so that now the IMF sees the UK having the slowest growth of all the G7 nations, and one of the reasons was investment. If you combine the Brexit effect with the loss of Russian money, can we ever get back to our former status on FDI and growth? You can get back part, probably most of the way over several years but not immediately, and it will take work. Um, so I appreciate the question, Lizzie. And it just sort of goes back to the way I tried to conclude my talk, which is don't focus on things like the US-UK trade deal that isn't going to happen. Focus on things that would make you an attractive destination for foreign direct investment. And they have to be different than they were in the past if, as you rightly said, it's not about Russian money laundering and it's not about being a platform for uh, foreign companies to export into Europe. Mm. And so there, again, there are plenty of ways, British technical abilities, British cultural abilities, British services, essentially going back to the Blair Brown Cool Britannia. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, I mean, that's what you have to sell. There may be a bunch of other things I don't know about yet. That's the great thing about a free market economy, but I know you no longer should be selling essentially offshore accounts <laughs> for oligarchs and you no longer should be selling, we can make cars that go into, to go into France because neither of those go forward. So in terms of numbers, you know, I showed that chart of which again, the data is messy, it's up and down, but uh, you can see, if you look on that chart um, in my talk, you can see that the UK was well above its weight to use the expression in terms of attracting FDI in the 90s and early 2000s pre-Brexit. And um, that was a real outlier status that I think was thrown away in large part by Brexit, but in part because of these more fundamental changes in the corroding of the global economy that I mentioned. So can you get back to that height? Probably not. But can you get back to being more than comparable to your European neighbors and doing better um, you know, relative to the size of your economy? than Australia, Japan, US, yes, you can do that. OK, a bit of hope. Um, we're going to take questions for, through Slido, if you've got one. Um, the most popular one so far is from Philip Lingard, and he says, will a Labour government find the 4% GDP boost from rejoining the single market and customs union irresistible and join those avoiding full political membership debate? That's a good question. I don't know enough about the politics. I mean, I obviously follow it, but I don't pretend like Anand and others who don't pretend to actually know 
uh, the politics to make an intelligent comment. I, I would just say, all, as, all things aside, I think labor or whoever would be serving the British public interest by saying, yep, we tried this, it didn't work, um, or it worked all too well, and therefore, whatever we want to do about political sovereignty separate from Europe, we got to try to get back mostly towards Europe economically. Now, again, that may be politically completely a non-starter, but, you know, as this conference will discuss, there have been a lot of things that have happened that have not been good from an economic point of view. The next question comes from uh, Vijay Srao, who says, all things, equal, all things aren't equal given COVID and the war in Ukraine, so how can you assess Brexit fairly? You can assess it fairly by accepting a certain amount of humility and inaccuracy, but you can still be fair. I mean, in like literally in statistic terms, you can be unbiased but, but less efficient in your estimates. Um, and that's why I tried to do things even in these very simple charts. And the, the better complement to that is some of the papers we're going to be hearing at this conference the rest of the day, which goes into micro data, like the study about the breakdown in relationships of small businesses exporting to the EU that's going to be discussed. Um, but this is why I did in my charts and in my talk, I did essentially what, what a very simple version of what economists call difference and difference. I'm saying, okay, Every, in a sense, to put it in crude econometric terms, the identification problem is in some ways easier because everybody had the same COVID shock at the same time. Everybody had the same Russian invasion shock and disruption to markets at the same time. So the question is, what about the structures of your economy led to the shock being transmitted or amplified or diminished in your economy. And that's why, Lizzie, your question earlier about, say, inflation, you know, you, you look across the economies and you say, UK inflation falls in between EU and US. Given energy, you would have thought they would, you would have thought they would be below EU if it hadn't, and some of that may be due to idiosyncrasies of the British natural gas market, fine. But you know, you, you try to pull that out and you say, huh, there's a definite labor effect here and it's pretty evident in the UK that it's not so evident in most of Europe and looks more like the US. What's going on here? You know, so I, I think, is it definitive proof? No, but in some ways, the, the, the intellectual case gets stronger because you've had a common shock across economies and you're looking at how they responded to the shock. Some of the data I presented, we tried the other way you can try to be fair. Again, may or may not be persuasive, but I will stand by fair, is to take very comparable data and say, let's smooth out those shocks. You know, what's the, what's the change from before all that to now? And that's why I love that scene you know, of the shrinking triangle of, of, of openness for Britain. Not that I love the outcome, but the visual of it. Because, I mean, again, on trade, not just Germany, France, Italy, Spain, they all see a bounce back in trade from the low in 2020. UK does not. Canada, especially now with energy, US, Australia, Japan, they all see something of a bounce, not as big, but something of a bounce back from trade. UK does not. Okay, and, the, and I know that study from the Center for Economic Performance did try to strip out the effects of the pandemic. The last question I'm gonna jump to on Slido is from Stephen Boxall and he says, if the UK was the most open economy prior to Brexit and openness is good, why were so many people so dissatisfied in the UK that they voted to leave the EU? That's a very valid question. Um, and it goes back to something I've, I've and others have been saying for a long time and I mentioned in the middle of my talk, which is economics isn't everything, right? Um, people voted for the UK, I mean, excuse me, for Brexit, for a variety of reasons. And as best as we can tell from the polling data combined with the location data, it seems to have been motivated by political ideological factors as much as by straight economic factors. And again, there are plenty of people in this room who've gone through this much more detail than I, but this is a global point. 
it, it, you look at the US, people tried to say Trump came in because people were angry about economics. But when you looked at the micro data, the, the swing to people voting for Trump was small business people and ex-urban people who were white, and particularly white women. And they were not disproportionately affected by the things that brought in Trump. Um, but they made a choice. And similarly in the UK, and again, other experts in the room may want to contest this, but I mean, I always, I always look back at Ireland, I mean, excuse me, at Wales, right? Wales, you know, if anybody was paying any attention, right, the simplest fact was Wales was getting the most money per capita from Europe, except for a couple little parts of Scotland, right? Because they got convergence funds, and they got agriculture funds, and they got, let's try to shut down coal funds. And, you know, it was very clear. You were going to be taking a material hit to your standard of living and to your communities if you voted for Brexit in Wales. And it is perfectly reasonable and acceptable for people in Wales to say, I don't care about that as much as I care about the color of my passport and the color of the immigrants coming in near me. That may or may not be nice, but that's their choice. They're allowed. But that don't tell me it's about economics. And, and economics was bad because they voted against the straight economics. And I mean, again, this, this conference is about the economics of Brexit. It should be. I think the evidence is pretty clear, as the papers that are about to be presented will show you. But that's just another argument of saying the reasons for Brexit, for at least most voters, had to be non-economic. Well, on that note, we've run out of time. Thank you so much to Adam Posen uh, for all your thoughts, for everyone listening and for all the questions you sent in, and to Jonathan and UK in a Changing Room Europe for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, everyone could come in and uh, we, will, uh, we will get started. Um, so um, just to say in advance that I deliberately made the timing so that we didn't have to keep absolutely to the minute, that there's a little bit of flex. So uh, um, we'll start a few minutes late here. We'll probably end, end some time between 12.20 and 12.25. Um, uh, so there'll be no rush. Um, I th a couple of people have not unreasonably said that they didn't realize that questions would only be via Slido, and so we will relax that for, uh, for this. Anna will, um, uh, I'm sure, very professionally manage to uh, take some questions via Slido, but also some questions uh, um, from, from people uh, in person as well, um, although you might have to really stand up and wave if you're at the back. Um, but uh, with that, um, thank you very much to uh, um, Anna Isaac, um, the economics and quite a lot more correspondent for The Independent <laughs> now. Uh, uh, um, the, um, as, as many of you will know, the person who's broken probably the golf stroke economic story in British politics for the last uh, couple of months. Um, uh, is going to chair the next session, so I'm going to sit down and hand over to Anna to introduce the speakers and the topic for this session. Thanks very much. Hello, as Jonathan said, I am Anna Isaac, I am Economics Editor at The Independent, and I am here to, uh, with the panel, uh, hear more about uh, Brexit's impact on trade. Um, our panellists have been taking it in turns to dominate the news bulletins in the past couple of days. Um, on my left, I have Thomas Sampson, who's of the London School of Economics and the Centre uh, for Economic uh, Policy Studies. And on my right, I have uh, Josh De Leon, um, who also works for those institutions. Both of their research has been looking at the data, the data we now start to have that is no longer in forecast mode, but is in utilization mode with um, the trade and cooperation agreement, um, aka the Brexit trade deal. We're going to have two presentations, and then we're gonna have some questions. Um, now, uh, post-COVID, if you don't know how to use a QR code, where have you been? But um, <laughs> if you prefer not to, so there's the Slido option, use the QR code, put your questions there, I'll see them on this iPad here. If you prefer not to do that, um, you will have the opportunity to take questions from the floor, but it is, it is a bit more uh, egalitarian for those of people at home if we, can, if we can do both. But if you do have a question, when I throw it out to the audience, um, I might ask even, because you're very flat to me, uh, to stand up as well as put your hand up, I'm afraid. So if you don't mind getting ready for that in a bit, that'll be fine. But before we do that, we're gonna go with the order on the programme. And we have Thomas Sampson with his presentation first. Thank you. Uh, now, are my slides? Hello? Okay, is that, is that better? Good, thank you. Uh, I'll probably learn how to just push on buttons myself. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we uh, published yesterday. It's a collaboration with my, my far more brilliant co authors, Rebecca Freeman, Kalina Manova, and uh, Thomas Preyer, um, trying to think about the effect of Brexit on UK trade so far and to understand kind of what what we can and can't say about how UK trade has responded to the uh, to the shock that is uh, Brexit over the past few years. Um, in in this audience the kind of importance of this question probably requires no uh, motivation. It's obviously kind of one of the key debates that has uh, dominated uh, when talking about Brexit is you know, what would the uh, trade effects be and how would the UK economy uh, respond to any changes in trade that occur. Um, if we go back to the, uh, the ex-ante forecasting that happened before the uh, referendum, um, 
economists at that stage, kind of, you know, one of the main channels through which economists expected Brexit to, to hit the UK economy was through changes in, in trade. And to give you a sense of the magnitude of what would have been expected, a fairly kind of uh, conventional uh, forecast from some of the work that was, was done is that we might expect to see UK-EU trade fall by around 30% in the long term as a result of Brexit. Okay. So that's what we expected ex ante. And then, you know, what we are now in the position, uh, now that Brexit has happened and the trade and cooperation agreement has come into force, we can start to actually see how, how trade has um, responded. And that's going to be the focus of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so here's some, some kind of simple data to get us started thinking about this question. And in fact, you know, this data is very similar to what Adam has already shown us uh, in his talk uh, in, in, the, in the first session. Um, so what I'm plotting here is for, we've got exports at the top and imports at the bottom. Um, and you can see how UK trade and also the average of trade for other G7 countries has changed since 2012. So they're normalized to be equal in 2012, and then we can see the time pattern over the next uh, 10 years. And there's just kind of, you know, a couple of points that I would uh, kind of make about, about, about this graph, which again is, is kind of very much consistent with what Adam was saying, is, you know, there, there's volatility in short-run trade data, right? This is quarterly data, so it does jump up and down. Uh, but broadly speaking, you can see that uh, on both the export side and the import side, UK and G7 trade evolves relatively similarly for most of this period. There's a big downward spike when COVID happens, and then you see trade start to recover through the end of 2020. But then what we see in 2021 as the trade and cooperation agreement comes into effect is a divergence. And in particular, there was kind of a strong rebound in, in global trade growth in 2021, which the UK did not fully benefit from. And you can see a gap emerging between the dotted line, and, which is the G7, and the solid line, which is the UK, for both exports and, and imports. Okay. So this is the, 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 the point that has been made elsewhere, and um, John Springfield, who's in the audience today, has done much more extensive work on this, uh, showing that since the TCA come, has come into effect, UK trade growth has grown slow, more slowly than comparator uh, countries. Right? And this is an obvious concern with the uh, performance of the UK economy over this period. Why do we see this decline in, in trade growth? Okay. The obvious culprit is the, the TCA and the new trade barriers that have been introduced as a result of, of, of Brexit. Um, so what we want to do in this work is dig a little bit more deeply into, you know, to what extent can we indeed attribute this poor uh, trade performance in the UK uh, to Brexit? Or could part of the effect also be due to you know, other shocks to the economy that are going on at the, at the same time. The kind of key idea behind how we're going to try and do that is to compare changes in trade with the EU to changes in trade with non-EU countries. Right? So this is, again, you know, sort of building Adam. Adam had a very nice explanation in the, in the Q&A earlier about how we try and disentangle Brexit effects from uh, COVID effects, right? And the basic point is, you know, Brexit is a shock that has hit, you know, the UK and not the rest of the world. So that's a useful comparison we can make, right? What we can also say is that Brexit is a shock that's primarily hit the UK's trade with the EU, uh, not the UK's trade with other countries. The trade barriers the UK faces vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world have, com have, have, have changed very little as a result of Brexit, at least so far. So to try and sort of dig into and identify what, it, what is the effect of Brexit, we're going to make you know, a series of comparisons between how trade with the EU has changed relative trade to trade with non-EU countries. And, you know, again, the underlying idea there 
is simply that Brexit is primarily a shock to EU trade. So to the extent that it is driving trade dynamics, we would expect to see uh, bigger effects on EU than non-EU trade. What we're also going to do, right, you might also be concerned that, okay, so if we suppose you see growth in UK exports to the EU relative to non-EU countries, perhaps that could also reflect differential demand changes in the EU versus the rest of the world. So it's not just what's happening in the UK that matters, but also how much demand there is coming from these different uh, regions. Right? So to try and absorb that element of the changes, we're also going to use data on uh, US and EU trade with, with the EU and with non-EU countries as a way of kind of comparing how, how, how UK is changing relative to other countries' trade. And then finally, the kind of additional trick we're going to do to try and convince ourselves that we can indeed identify what is Brexit versus what is other economic shocks is we're going to analyze all these changes within very detailed products. Right? So why are we going to do this? Well, suppose energy prices go up and we start to see more trade in oil and gas and the value, the value of energy trade goes up. Now, if the UK trades more energy with the rest of the world than the EU, say, that will mechanically drive up the UK's trade with the rest of the world. And we don't want to attribute that to a, to a Brexit effect. So by looking within products, and we're going to use data for just over 1,000 products, uh, we can say, you know, are we seeing, you know, within these products, are we seeing changes in trade with the EU versus the, the, the rest of the world? And so that's, that's the kind of strategy we're going to take. Um, our data is going to cover three different periods. So we're going, to, you know, we're going to have a baseline before the referendum. Then we'll look at what happened between the referendum and the introduction of the TCA. Right? So during that period, there were no formal changes in trade barriers between the UK and the EU. But obviously, everyone knew something was coming. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we might also see firms kind of anticipating the changes and responding in advance of that. And then finally, we're going to have one year of data under the, under the TCA, which is going to give us at least an initial indication of what is happening to UK trade under the new uh, trade regime. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is kind of run you through the main results we find. Uh, I'm going to do that by showing you a series of, of charts. Um, and all these charts are going to have the same basic uh, structure. So I'm going to kind of try and explain you know, how to read these charts. And I'll do it in quite a lot of detail for this chart. And then we can go through the other ones um, a little bit more uh, quickly. So we're starting off here with the effect on imports. Right? So all these effects that we're reporting are the, our estimate of how uh, imports from the EU into the UK have changed relative to imports from the rest of the, the world. Right? And so the dark line there in the center is a plot of the estimated effect by quarter starting in 2013 and going through to the end of uh, 2021. Uh, the blue lines, the upper and lower blue line, those mark out kind of, you know, in statistical terms, it is the 95% confidence interval in our estimates. Informally, it's giving you a sense of how precise our estimates, well, you know, we think our, our estimates are. So, you know, statistically, we think that there's a 95% chance that the true effect falls within that boundary. So the, the, the narrower those boundaries are, the more confident we are about the precision of our estimates. Okay. All these estimates are relative to the pre-referendum period, right? So the interpretation is what has happened relative to the second quarter of 2016. <coughs> So big takeaways from this graph, what you can see is, you know, there is noise quarter to quarter. Trade flows are seasonal. They move around because of, you know, lumpy shipments um, and, and fluctuate up and down from quarter to quarter. You can see that going on. But there's no obvious trend in EU relative to non-EU imports uh, in the period between the referendum and Brexit actually taking place. So we're not seeing significant evidence of diversion of UK imports away from the EU before we actually left the EU. 
Then when we leave the EU in January 2021, well, that, you know, that coincides with COVID. And you can see there's a, there's a steep drop there in the initial quarter of COVID. Uh, we think that that is probably a COVID effect rather than a Brexit effect. And it bounces back quite quickly so that by the end of, by the end of 2020, when the TCA comes into effect, EU relative to non-EU imports are actually very similar to where they were pre-referendum. What we then see, though, is you know, these estimates falling off a cliff. So as soon as the TCA comes into effect, we see a sharp decline in relative imports from the EU. Um, and that, you know, this is the first quarter. So it happens immediately in quarter one. And then roughly kind of it, it, it's, it's fairly flat thereafter. So what we're seeing here is around a 25% drop in relative imports from the EU upon the introduction of the uh, TCA. Right? And you know, as someone who spends a lot of time looking at trade data, 25% drop in one quarter is a, is a big effect that we don't typically see. So there's clear evidence here of a, you know, of a large TCA effect. Now I'm going to show you the exact same graph, but for exports rather than imports. So looking now at what we think happened to UK exports to the EU relative uh, to exports to the rest of the world. Right? Here the picture is rather different. Uh, and in particular, again, we see that you know, the, the, there's no obvious trend pre-TCA, but also we don't see a post-TCA uh, drop-off here either. There is, a, there is some decline in the first quarter, but that bounces back in, in Q2. Um, and you know, looking at this graph, there does not seem to be an obvious effect of the TCA on exports to the EU relative to the rest of the world, at least so far. Right? An important caveat with everything I'm saying is this is just year one. Trade flows will often take more than a year to, uh, to, to adjust. So there's you know, plenty, plenty more to come as, more, as time passes. But at least initially, we are not seeing the drop off in EU exports that we saw on the import side. Now that kind of raises a, you know, a sort of interesting question is, you know, does that mean that exporters have not been affected by the TCA? Right? There has been a lot of coverage documenting the struggles many exporters have faced with sending goods to Europe uh, now that they face kind of new red tape and new customs regulations under the TCA. So you know, it is a little surprising here that we're not finding an an effect, right? We, we were surprised by this. We have te you know, tried to push this result in many different ways. It's pretty, pretty robust, right? It seems to genuinely be there in the data. Um, that said, once you start to kind of unpack this and to look a little bit more beneath, beneath the surface and to understand kind of what's going on in more detail, there is clear evidence that exporters have been affected. It just doesn't seem to show up in the aggregate values. So to give an example of that, let me talk about the evidence we found on trade relationships between the UK and the EU. Right? Now, kind of ideally what I would like to tell you at this point is what's happened to the number of firms exporting to the EU and how different types of firms have been affected. That data may be available in the future, but it hasn't been published yet, so we can't do that. Instead, we're going to kind of try and construct an alternative measure, which is like an imperfect proxy for how many relationships there are between uh, UK exporters and EU importers. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to count the number of, of, of very detailed products that are exported to EU countries. Right? So at the most disaggregate level we can get it, our trade data has over 10,000 products in it. Right? So these are pretty disaggregated product categories. To give an example, you know, one of these products is umbrellas with a telescopic shaft, but not toy umbrellas. Right? So for umbrellas with a telescopic shaft, we can count how many EU countries those umbrellas are exported to uh, each quarter. Right? And we can do the same thing for all the 10,000 other products, and we can do it for both EU countries and non-EU countries. And that's going to be our measure of, of an export relationship between the UK and the EU. It's, you know, 
do we export umbrellas in quarter two 2021 to Slovenia? If we do, one relationship. And then let's count them, count them all up. Okay. So having constructed this measure of the number of relationships, what we're then going to ask is, how has that number of relationships with the EU changed after Brexit? Um, and we're going to do that comparison kind of in exactly the same way we did for the values earlier. So we're going to compare you know, EU number of relationships with the EU to the non-EU, and we're going to use US and EU trade data as, uh, as controls. So here are the graphs we get when we do that. So we've got export relationships on the left, import relationships on the right, the structure of the graphs is exactly the same, same as before. And the main thing I want you to focus at on is, you know, particularly on the export graph, you can see again, we've got relative stability. There's a, a spike related to COVID. And then the TCA hits, and this thing really falls off a cliff. Um, and there's about a 30% decline in the number of export relationships in the first quarter of trade under the TCA. Right? So this is... You know, this is, this is evidence that a lot of exports that were previously sent to EU markets simply cease once the TCA uh, comes into effect. Which export relationships are being affected? Okay. Well, if we break it down by looking at the kind of size of the export relationships, it's overwhelmingly low value, lower value relationships. Right? So it's the the, the relationships that account for kind of smaller amounts of trade um, and that are with smaller destination markets. So, for example, a relationship with Slovenia is much more likely to have been destroyed than a relationship with France or Germany. Right? We don't, as I was saying, we don't have the firm level data yet, but this pattern is very consistent with smaller firms stopping exporting while larger firms continue. Why, why is that likely to be? Well, if we think about the TCA as imposing new uh, kind of fixed costs of trade, right? All the costs of filling in forms, meeting new regulations, dealing with all the customs procedures. For larger firms, these costs are an annoyance, but it's an annoyance that you pay and you continue trading. For smaller firms, it's an annoyance that makes it no longer profitable to do business with the EU. And so our interpretation of these results is probably that just a lot of smaller firms have ceased, um, ceased trading because of these new fixed costs. But the larger firms, and it's these larger firms that overwhelmingly drive aggregate export dynamics, have continued to export. And that's why we don't see an effect. Uh, that's why we think we don't see an effect on the uh, values side, at least yet. That said, kind of, you know, one... One, one fact we teach when we teach trade economics is that small firms don't currently account for much trade, but they are also one of the key sources of future trade growth. So if you, if you kill off the smaller firms today, there's reasons to be concerned that this is going to have negative effects on future, uh, future export uh, growth, um, which obviously you know, we will see if that does indeed happen. Uh, so to, to kind of sum up, what do we take away from this work? Uh, firstly, you know, there's this very obvious big decline in imports. We think it's around 25%. Export values have held up much better, but this stability is in a way misleading because once you look under the hood, uh, we're seeing this destruction of trade relationships. Uh, we also see a lot of heterogeneity across different types of of products. So, for example, if you look at consumer goods, you do see a fall in the value of EU exports relative to, to, to non-EU exports. To finish, you know, I want to finish with some, some questions and some caveats. The asymmetry here between import, the, our import and export findings is puzzling. Right? It's even more puzzling when you take into account the fact that the UK has delayed many of the checks on imports. If you'd asked me before we did this work, I'd have said we're more likely to find an export effect than an import effect. At this stage, we don't know what is the cause of that um, asymmetry. Right? We can kind of speculate about it, but clearly there is more, you know, there is more research needed here to understand exactly what is going on with, with UK trade. So that's kind of one, you know, uh, it, it's always nice when research can motivate future research. So you know, one thing is why, why are we seeing these asymmetric import and export effects? 
The other thing is, you know, I started by showing you that you know, UK exports underperformed in 2021. And then I said, but we don't think that that was a TCA effect. That then leaves open the question, you know, why was UK export performance so poor in 2021? All right, and that's kind of another open question that I think still needs uh, addressing. And you know, one possible explanation, well, could it be that UK exporters that, say, rely on imports from the EU now find those imports more expensive? And that's affecting their exports, not just to the EU, but also to the to the rest of the world. So there are kind of spillovers from the TCA onto exports to the rest of the world. That's another question that deserves uh, further research. And then, you know, important caveats. We're only looking at the first year. So, the, you know, there is, we don't want to draw any long-term conclusion on this. Everything I've shown you has been about goods trade. Um, services is, you know, for the UK, services accounts for about half of trade. So we also want to know what happens to services trade. The services data comes out more slowly, so we haven't looked at that yet. But clearly, that's another important question. And then, you know, there, was, there have been some data collection issues related to the exit from the EU. So thinking more carefully about whether those could have induced any bias in the data is also, uh, also uh, important. So, you know, there's lots more work to be done in this area. But, you know, very clearly, the TCA has been already a major disruption to UK, um, to UK trade, and it has made, made life much harder for importers and also for certainly smaller exporters. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And we, we now go from Monday's headlines to yesterday's headlines, which is the, um, from the cliff edge to the shopping basket. So let's hear from Josh. Good. So um, everything I'm going to talk about here is going to build very nicely on what uh, Thomas has shown you already. So Thomas has shown very convincing evidence that um, UK imports have fallen as a result of Brexit. And what we do in this report is, is kind of show you why is that important for the UK economy? And it's important for, for a number of reasons. And so this is joint work with uh, a number of um, colleagues who have done a lot of work on this project, some of which uh, are in this room. So um, we know that Brexit created trade barriers. Um, some of them were introduced in 2021, although they're kind of being phased in. Um, and in this report, we want to look at, particularly on the import side, um, to show you kind of how have imports changed and how has that varied across different products? But then think kind of economically, what does that mean? And we want to focus on two ways that that's going to affect the UK economy. The first one is that UK businesses use imported goods um, for production. So around two thirds of imports um, across the world is used as inputs to production. So that's going to affect UK businesses uh, that rely on those imports uh, for their activities. And then secondly, as, um, as was mentioned in the first um, panel, um, we have some results that show that these changes in imports have affected food prices. And I'll talk in detail about why we focus on food and whether these effects um, are likely to be seen across other um, products. So um, this is just a timeline of, of what's happened in Brexit. And I'm putting it up here because um, most of what we focus on is going to be post-TCA, so most of the effects that we see are coming uh, after the uh, implementation of the TCA in, in 2021. But some of what we see is going to start to be uh, materialised in the data um, from sort of the end of 2019, um, when uh, this current government got uh, elected. So I'm going to talk about kind of pre-TCA pre as that period 2019 to uh, the start of 2021 and then post-TCA um, as that period. So just to kind of preview the, the key findings, um, as Thomas has already shown, UK imports have fallen uh, from the EU. And in this, in this research, most of what we're going to do is compare UK imports from the EU with UK imports from non-EU countries. Uh, so a little bit different to what Thomas is doing, where he's comparing uh, UK imports from the EU or UK imports in total with uh, you, uh, other countries' imports um, volumes. And one thing we do is just to show that there's a lot of variation across products. So different products have different um, 
kind of timing and extent of changes in importing. And in the report, we're going to, we show kind of various different uh, representative products that show you um, in what ways different products have kind of responded in terms of their trade flows. Um, and then what we show is that UK supply chains seem to be affected by these changes in imports. So importing is important for UK firms. And we're seeing that uh, for some key kind of production sectors in the UK, like motor vehicles, um, imports have, have really adjust, have fallen from the EU. And in some cases, they kind of rise from non-EU, but they're, um, they are being affected. And then finally, we've got this headline number uh, that you've already heard at least once today, that uh, Brexit trade barriers caused a 6% increase in food prices between the end of 2019 and September 2021. And I'll go through each of those in more detail now. So um, I'll, just like Thomas did, I'll spend a bit of time explaining what our charts show on the first chart. And then uh, hopefully for later charts, um, we can go through it in slightly more detail. So this is just splitting out UK imports of goods. Um, and we also focus on goods for exactly the same reason, that uh, the goods data is, is available more punctually uh, than services data. But services is obviously really important. Um, so this splits out UK's imports from, U, uh, from the EU in blue and from non-EU countries in red. And it just kind of normalizes each of those values to be 100 in January 2020. So whatever the value was at that time, fix it to 100. And then everything that comes later is just changes relative to what that initial value was in, 2019, uh, in 2010. So what we see is they kind of roughly move together um, throughout that period. And then on the implementation of the TCA, which is the kind of second yellow line, you see that UK imports from the EU fell quite dramatically, while UK imports from non-EU countries uh, didn't fall um, equivalently. But what we see is that these trends kind of vary a lot when you look across different products. So what we did was uh, split all goods into kind of 100 different categories, and then produce this same graph that you've just seen for each of those goods. And kind of a number of key trends occur um, in terms of sort of the extent of the deviation between EU uh, imports and non-EU imports and the timing with the, which those kind of trends um, are taking place. And so here I just want to show you two examples. So this is UK imports of vegetables, roots, and tubers, which are um, many things that you have in your fridge at home, but this is a kind of technical um, trade data term. Um, but what you see is that UK imports from the EU and non-EU move kind of roughly together. There's not really a significant deviation um, before the implement of implementation of the TCA, but then uh, imports from the EU kind of fall while imports from non-EU countries rise, and it's kind of quite striking uh, that the timing just kind of comes in exactly on 2021. So we see that there, you know, UK importers seem to be uh, adjusting, their, um, adjusting their imports from EU countries to non-EU countries. This is the same chart, but for textiles. So they don't follow quite as closely in the kind of pre-period. But the key point that we want to make is that um, you start to see divergence before the implementation of the TCA. So if you look at how kind of close together the two lines are, in 2016 at the referendum, um, they're much further apart by the time it gets to uh, kind of just before the uh, implementation of the TCA, and then they kind of diverge further. And what we see here as well is some evidence of stockpiling from the EU. So you can see a spike in uh, December 2020, where it looks like UK importers were um, kind of importing large volumes for textiles, something that can clearly be stored. Um, which is an important point when we come on to talking about food later and why we see effects on food prices. Um, and so we see kind of evidence of stockpiling. And as I said, in the report, we, we do kind of this chart for six different products and talk about how representative they are and what other products look kind of the same. Um, and we have these charts for um, every product in the UK, every goods product in the UK. So if anyone has a particular good that they're interested in the trade patterns of, please do send us an email and we can uh, send you the relevant chart. Um, now, kind of looking at imports is interesting, and, but what we 
want to kind of move on to doing now is to think about which kind of UK industries are affected by changes in imports of those products. So um, car companies use imports of tyres, say, um, heavily, um, as well as other kind of imports um, in their production. And what's happened to, if we kind of aggregate over all of those um, different inputs that are imported into the car industry, what happens to their imports? Uh, so as I said at the beginning, two thirds of international trade is in uh, intermediate imports. So you know, this is clearly really important. So most of these imports are used by UK firms in their production. Um, and there's previous evidence that shows that these intermediate imports uh, can affect productivity. So if you have cheaper access to intermediate imports, that makes your, you, you know, makes production more, more productive. Um, you get more output for your input. Um, and it can also affect employment and wages. So just a couple of lines on, on what we're actually doing here exactly. So um, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, produces these what they're called input output tables. So it tells you for every industry how much of each product do they import from abroad in terms of in, as a share kind of of their or we we compute then the share of each product um, that goes in, that is imported that goes into their production, and what we're going to do is essentially kind of use those shares to average over uh, as weights when we kind of average over the national level changes in imports that we see from the EU and the non-EU countries. So when I show you a chart, hopefully it will be um, a bit clearer. And again, we're only focusing on imports. Oops, sorry. Let me skip that. So what you see here is essentially the same chart, but instead of plotting imports, what you see here is for, motor for the motor vehicles industry, how has uh, the UK's imports changed of um, products that are important for that industry to use for its production? So 20% of the motor vehicles industry production costs, or just under 20%, under is imported products classified as motor vehicles themselves. So you know, 20% of the total costs, including labor costs and everything that they purchase from UK industries and capital costs and everything else that's imported, is imports of other things classified as motor vehicles. So it might be um, tires or car bonnet or whatever it is. And, and so what you see is that uh, imports of those things for the motor vehicles industry have fallen from the EU relative to from the non -E, from non EU countries, um, which is important, right? It's, it's showing that industries are having to diverge their supply chains from um, EU countries to non EU countries. Um, and here's just another example. So this is fish production. Um, and so we've done this for both kind of fresh fish and preserved fish products. And they use various inputs like um, imported fish, unsurprisingly, but also things like pharmaceuticals. And what you see again is like a clear divergence, some of which happens kind of before 2021, which you know, partly is to do with uh, COVID, of course. But by the time we get into 2021, there's just a huge divergence in where fishing industry imports are coming from um, in terms of uh, whether they're from the EU or from uh, non-EU countries. And again, so we've done this for every product in the UK. Um, and this, just to stress, this is again only goods imports. Um, but in the report, we show kind of six different uh, products for which we think they, they have kind of representative trends of um, of other trends that we're seeing in other products across the UK. And again, get in touch if you have a particular industry that you're interested in the uh, trends of. So finally, I want to spend quite a bit of time going through this uh, impact of Brexit on consumer prices that's uh, in the headlines this morning uh, across many places. So we begin by constructing a novel data set where we match UK uh, trade flows to the um, Office of National Statistics data on consumer prices. So the ONS, to compute their aggregate CPI variable that you'll see in the headlines, what they do is collect um, very disaggregated price data um, on 
every product and then aggregate it all up into that one number. And so we take the kind of really disaggregated data and we match that to the trade flows data. And so you can see for every kind of disaggregated product, or at least for the ones that we're able to match, you can see both its price in the UK that you get on the shelves, and you can see how much we imported from the EU and from uh, outside the EU. And so the reason why we focus on food uh, in, the, in the report, and this was something we did kind of straight away was to split out food products, is that this is a place where we'd, using this methodology, expect to see um, pass-through of trade onto prices. And one of the main reasons for that is that food is perishable. So if we look in each month at uh, what are the imports of a particular food product, so um, you know it might be potatoes or whatever, um, we might expect to see a correlation between changes in food in that month with the price of food in that month, which is obviously different to something like textiles that we saw before, where it can be stockpiled, you know, the price might take a while to pass through. So that's one of the reasons why we focused on food. Secondly, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, at least once, I think twice, a lot of international trade is in intermediate products. But food tends to be kind of imported in its final form. So, you know, if we looked at the price of, uh, say, semiconductors, on the UK consumer shelves um, and imports of semiconductors, we might not see that much pass through because, you know, well, semiconductors wasn't a good example. Um, something that takes a lot of other intermediate inputs, uh, we might not see much pass through, but because food, you know, you import a potato, it goes onto the shelf as a potato. There's nothing else that's going in there. There's not that much processing that's done in the UK. Therefore, we'd expect to see some kind of pass through between um, uh, the imports and uh, food prices. Uh, and then finally, we just we know that there are a lot of barriers to trade in food, uh, and we think that that's kind of the main reason that, that, that would drive uh, changes in prices that you see on the shelves. Um, and so what we show is that uh, products more reliant on, the, on EU imports have had significantly higher price growth. Um, when we repeat the same exercise for all of the other products that we uh, see in the data, that we can match in the data, we don't see that same effect, um, which isn't to say that we kind of rule that out, that there's been an effect of Brexit on prices in other industries. Um, maybe the, the effect was less, but it's, it's partly methodological uh, for the reasons that I explained that we, high, that we focused on food. Um, and I'm going to show you a chart and, and talk a little bit about the methodology of, of how we think that we can kind of rule out COVID-19 um, and various lockdowns as uh, a driver of these changes. Uh, so ignore most of the information on the slide, but the key thing that we're going to do here is that we want to compare um, the imports, uh, sorry, we want to compare the prices of products that are really reliant on imports from the EU with products that are less reliant on imports from the EU. So, you know, something that we don't import much from the EU, uh, such as lamb, a lot of it comes from outside the EU. Uh, we see smaller import shares. Um, you know, we're less reliant on the EU. We're less likely to see a price effect pick up, given that we haven't seen significant changes in kind of trade barriers with non-EU countries uh, with the rollover of most of the kind of third party trade agreements. Um, in comparison, something that we import from the EU you know, is much more exposed to these new trade barriers. We're therefore more likely to pick up a price effect. So this is kind of the, the natural experiment, uh, to use Adam's uh, word from earlier, um, that we're going to exploit here. And we're going to do it in kind of two ways, um, which I'll talk about a little bit in more detail now. But so this is kind of our key chart. Um, there's quite a lot going on. Uh, so I'll try and kind of talk you through it slowly. So what the points, the, the kind of bobbles are showing, what's the average kind of price difference between products that are exposed to the EU versus products that are kind of not exposed to the EU? So, and, and then, then so uh, the kind of bars that come out from that tell us how reliable do we think those estimates are? How much variation is there in the data? So like how precise can we be about that difference between products that are exposed from the EU and uh, exposed to the EU and products that are less exposed to the EU. So in all the cases in the lead up to the referendum where the bars kind of cross the zero line, what that's saying is that there's no kind of statistically significant difference between 
um, the prices of food products that are more exposed to the EU and the prices of food products that are less exposed to the EU. And that's good because that means that later on when we pick up differences between those two groups of products, it's likely to be due with something that's changed because in the lead up to that product, in, in the lead up to the changes due to Brexit, these two groups of products, they're moving similarly together. So if you think about those charts that I showed you earlier, this is a similar kind of thing to saying that those two lines from the EU and the non-EU, they're moving together before anything happens with, with Brexit. And then what we see is um, after the uh, implementation of the TCA, uh, those things are no longer, these kind of bars are no longer crossing the zero line and they're above the zero line. And what that tells you is that products that are more exposed to the EU, they, we import more of them from the EU, have higher price growth than products that we import less of from the EU. And that's kind of the key finding. And what I want to highlight is that we see, uh, so this red line is the 2019 general election. And what we see is, uh, you kind of can't see it so much here, but we see that the prices of those products start to rise in anticipation um, before, uh, in, in that period, but crucially kind of before uh, anything happened to do with the pandemic. And during the period of the pandemic, if we split this thing out by months, so these are quarters, but we can split it out monthly, we don't see any correlation in the changes um, with kind of events that happen um, with COVID. So it's not like the lockdowns are happening, that's driving this difference between EU imports and non-EU imports. It does seem to be lined up exactly with the implementation of the TCA and a little bit of anticipatory effects when the current government got into, into power and you know, it became clear that we're gonna have a Brexit where the UK is gonna leave the customs union and the single market or confirmed further. Um, and I should say we're also controlling for kind of aggregate macro trends here. So these are all kind of taking out the average change in price in the UK economy in any given quarter and just focusing on the difference between the products that are more exposed and less exposed. And, and so if we do the same thing, but rather than kind of splitting it out month by month, just kind of aggregating over the whole uh, post TCA period, um, we get a kind of aggregate price change after the TCA relative to the before the TCA. And from that, we can compute this 6% number. So I'm not going to show you any of the tables um, for your sakes, but um, trust me on the fact that we can then compute out this 6% number. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Well, um, those were both absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we're very lucky with some of the talent we have in the room today. And perhaps lucky in the UK that we have this infrastructure of think tanks and economists so that we can analyze this phenomenal impact. Um, I'm gonna selfishly ask a question. So now's a good moment if, you're, if you have a burning question to refine it, get it in on Slido, um, or um, we'll also come to the room as well. Um, but to be selfish and take a, take a panel privilege. Um, Thomas, I, I guess my question for you first up is, is anyone actually using the TCA? That's a very good question. Um, so, and what I think you mean there is, are people actually using the uh, tariff free rates rather than just paying the tariffs, right? That's what you're, you're getting at. Um, so the EU publishes data on, for, for, for imports into the EU from the UK, we know what share of imports enter tariff free versus paying tariffs. Um, I'm going to apologize that I don't have the exact number in my head, but I think it's around 70 to 80 percent by value of imports, EU imports are entering tariff free. So most UK exporters are using the, the TCA, but clearly not all are. Right? And that's why we need to be a bit careful when talking about the TCA. You know, it's a zero tariff, zero quota de deal, but only if you meet the rules of origin and not all exporters meet the rule of, rules of origin, about 20 to 25 percent of UK exports are actually still paying tariff on exports to the EU. I haven't seen comparable data from the UK side yet, uh, but when we do, we'll get a sense of uh, whether EU exporters are using the TCA. And also that might change when the UK finally actually implements import checks, which currently we're not really doing. 
Brilliant. Thank you. It's, uh, absolutely fascinating work. Um, and one question I had for you, Josh, um, before we go to the floor, is um, to what extent do you think um, trade displacement is occurring and that being part of this story of, of, of higher food inflation? I'm thinking particularly given some of the rollovers that were challenging for some African nations that trade in food with the UK. Um, so definitely when we kind of split out by product the trade flows data, um, we're seeing clear evidence of diversion in trade um, to, to non-EU countries for specific products. Um, whether that's kind of driving the food price result, I think, I think we kind of rule out that it's not because what we're doing is isolating the difference between um, products that are exposed to EU imports versus non-EU imports. So we're kind of that's what we're what we're driving but what we do want to do is kind of split out more uh the countries that are being traded with for each of these food products and and see uh, if we can kind of shed more light on um to what extent diversion might be able to kind of mitigate the the food price rises that we're seeing uh in the data brilliant um, and if anyone wants to send one of those special requests to josh feel free to cc me i'd absolutely love to find <laughs> out um, right, okay, so if we could start with, we'll take a question from the room and we're going we're gonna to alternate. So let's take two questions from the room and then we'll come to Slido. I'm going to ask you, and I know it's annoying, if you could stand up if you have a question so that I can actually see who's, who's got one. Have we got any questions from women in the room? <laughs> uh, I'll take that as a no. Okay, uh, we've got a question right at the back, uh, sir. Uh, we've got a roving microphone, thank you so much. John Springford from the Centre for European Reform. Thanks for the shout out, Thomas. Um, I uh, just had a question about whether uh, trade with the EU is fully independent from trade with non-EU sources. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why you might worry about that. Um, one is that we know that the single market has generally been trade creating with countries outside the EU. So leaving it might reduce trade with countries outside the EU. And thinking about why that might happen, well, you know, if you're an importer of inputs from the EU and you're suddenly going to face trade barriers, then you might say, right, I'm going to go uh, to the rest of the world for my products and vice versa if you're an exporter. So I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about that. That would be great. Are we going to take another question? Uh, yeah, if we, take one, if we can take one more from the room before we go around. Uh, this Gentlemen here, if you can say who you are and where you come from. The mic's just on its way, sir, if you, if you wait a moment. Thank you very much. Yeah, Bernard Casey, I've come from Frankfurt for this. Um, I'm interested in motor cars as opposed to food, so this is a bit more in Thomas's direction. What one knows about motor car production is that even items like screws that go into a car not only come from somewhere and go into the car, but actually go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards very many times. Um, to what extent is this backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards being reflected? I presume it is, but can you say a little bit more about it in the uh, results that you showed for motor cars? Thank you. Okay, um, uh, we'll deal with those two questions first. Um, if, uh, Thomas, we could go to you on the EU versus non-EU question from John Springford, then we'll go to Josh on that same question before we come to cars. Okay, great. Um, thanks uh, for the question, John. I mean, I, I, I think you make a really good point, and I think I essentially agree with everything you said. Um, our, you know, our, our approach was to try and isolate the kind of differential EU versus non-EU effect. But as you, as you point out, there are good reasons why we might also expect to see that uh, shocks to you know, EU trade costs have spillover effects on trade with the uh, rest of the world. So you know, I think the, the substantive implication of, of, of that observation is about how you interpret our results. It would be a mistake to interpret our results as saying this is the you know, this is the complete and total effects of, uh, of, of the TCA. Instead, what we're kind of identifying is the, the partial effect on EU relative to, to non-EU trade. Um, the reason we think that, that that's interesting is that, you know, though these spillover effects we would expect to exist, and we hope to do future work looking 
at them. I think, you know, again, if firm, with firm level data, you could try and look at exactly those things. Do we see firms that import more from the EU start exporting less to the rest of the world when the TCA hit? That will be a really interesting question to, to look at that we don't have the data for yet. Um, but, you know, even kind of with that, we would still expect that you know there is a larger effect on on EU trade than non-EU trade because obviously EU trade you're not only facing those effects but you're also facing the additional uh, costs. So we were kind of interested in you know, how big how big that effect is, and that's kind of what we've that's what we've picked up so far. But as you say, it leaves kind of lots of uh, future work to do. And Josh, if you'd like to address that. Uh, yeah. So um, I completely agree that there's likely to be diversion um, across countries. So what we do differently to what uh, Thomas is doing is compare UK trade with EU countries with non-EU countries. It's probably even more likely to be uh, spillovers that you'd see on the non-EU side. Um, and what we do on the kind of trade side and the, in the product level analysis is is exactly that. So we try and look at for which products um, are we seeing rises in imports from the non-EU countries and for which ones are we not seeing that and, and kind of you know, we'd like to try and explain why uh, for some products do we see that diversion and why for other products do we do we not see that diversion? And I think that's a really interesting question. Um, specifically on the methodology of like the price change um, research, we fix the exposure share to 2015 for exactly that reason. So we take the exposure of um, imports of each product to the EU in 2015, and we don't look at any trade data beyond that point um, for precisely that reason, that like if you looked at the difference between UK imports from the EU and non-EU countries in uh, 2021, uh, for countries, for, for, for cases where you kind of see a big diversion to non-EU countries, you'd see a big opening up of the gap between imports from the EU and from the non-EU countries. But you might expect to see less on the price side, right? Because you're substituting your imports from EU countries to non-EU countries. Um, so for method methodological reasons, we just hold that fixed to 2015. Um, brilliant. Um, and then, Thomas, we come to Bernard's questions about the screw that moves back and forth mm. and how we deal with that kind of a problem, particularly in the car industry. Yeah. I mean, so purely as a measurement issue, the way trade statistics are collected, uh, every time it crossed a border, that would be recorded in, in trade statistics. So if that screw is going back and forth 10 times between the UK and the EU, that would count you know, 10 times in, in, in trade statistics. Um, now, as you kind of, uh, uh, kind of alluding to, that kind of raises a question of, you know, well, how do we actually want to measure the amount of trade that's going on here? Um, so there have been attempts to measure what's, you know, typically referred to as trade in value added rather than just the, the total amount of trade, uh, where if you had trade in value added statistics, you'd count that screw essentially the first time it crossed the border, and then from then on it wouldn't get uh, counted. So there are alternative trade data sets which are kind of strip out the multiple border crossings. That's not what we've used in our work, um, primarily because, you know, as you can imagine, doing that stripping out uh, requires some additional data, and so that data becomes available more slowly and isn't available for uh, as yet for the period, you know, for the most recent years. But that would be it would be an interesting extension of our work to see if you got different results if you looked at value added trade rather than gross trade. I mean, would that, sorry, would that also affect those relationships? Because with little things like that, mm -hmm. that was what I was also. It, I mean, it, it, so it, it's not obvious to me that there is kind of a clear way it would lead to a bias in the results we are finding there. Because, as, you know, as long as, suppose it's trade back and forth between a plant in Poland and the UK, as long as it's crossed once, we would observe that uh, as, as happening. Okay, um, so now we turn to Slido. Um, uh, this has been marked as a question for Thomas. It comes from uh, Jill Rutter, um, who is a fellow of UK and a changing Europe. Sitting just um, there. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen, yeah, I can see Jill, to a familiar face. Um, um, she's asking uh, primarily for Thomas, but I actually think given the, the UK's role in terms of food processing and some of the logistics that might go on there, 
Um, it will also be perhaps relevant for Josh. Um, he will decide that. But this is the question. Could the reluctance of EU logistics firms slash truck drivers explain some of the fall in imports from the EU? That's a good question. Um, it seems very plausible that it could. I don't have any data to specifically shed uh, light on that. You know, but, but obviously, you know, trade, trade has to go both directions across the border. And if, you know, even if the UK has not imposed import checks, but if truckers know that if they come to the EU, they're going to face checks. So if they come to the UK, they're going to face checks when they leave. That could, you know, at the very least, increase the cost of hiring those, those services. So I think, it, yeah, it, it, it seems likely that that could play a role. I don't have any way of kind of quantifying how important that is at this stage. Um, and I guess any disruptions such as that that you noted? Well, I, I'd just say that one of the reasons why we focused on food is because we think it's exposed to those kind of changes. Um, so, you know, if there are delays at the border, if you've got a food product that needs to hit the shelves quickly, um, you're more likely to see disruptions. And, and so, you know, we think that it's more likely to be playing a role in food and the pass through of, of trade to prices than it might do in another sector where, um, you know, it's not perishable or um, it doesn't rely on kind of just in time um, supply chains. Um, and uh, a question now um, from Stephen Boxall, um, which I'm going to take a slight liberty with. Apologies, Steve. But Steve is ask, uh, Stephen is asking, why would importers switch from EU suppliers to non-EU ones? They now have to complete import paperwork for both, so friction to trade is the same. Um, and I suppose what I'd ask is, is in your responses both, if we could think about the, the international examples <laughs> where we might have um, low or no tariffs, so comparable tariff quota rates as we do with the TCA. So if you can pin down a particular product, I think that would be particularly pertinent to Stephen's question there. Um, or if not, because the TCA is very unusual in its tariff-free, quota-free um, uh, construction, perhaps we can draw on that more. Um, but if we could go to Thomas first and then Josh. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do a very good job of pinning down a particular product. I might leave that to Josh. But the way I would think about this is... Uh, what, what matters is not simply the, tr the, the trade costs, but also how much exporters that you're buying from in other countries are selling the good for. So previously, when we were part of the EU, you might have sourced goods from France, even if French exporters were more expensive than, say, American exporters, because once you accounted for the fact that the American exporters may have been cheaper initially, but then you had higher trade costs, then they ended up more expensive at the end of the day. So it's that kind of combination of what is their, the, the price that they're actually selling for plus the trade costs that, that matters. So you know, to answer his question, previously you may have sourced from French exporters because the, even though they were more expensive, they had lower trade costs. Now, if they now face the same trade costs as the US, then you're going to switch and source from the from the US. So I think it's that combination of thinking about how much does the good cost plus the trade cost that's the way to understand what's going on here. And, and Josh, are you also seeing this somewhat gravity-defying effect, or how would you explain it? Well, I, I'd kind of reiterate what Thomas said, but I, I think another way to put it would be that even though the trade costs uh, might be the same now um, from EU countries and non-EU countries, uh, there's been a change in kind of the relative trade costs. So the trade cost from the EU has increased, while the trade cost from other countries perhaps has not changed by so much. Um, and this is kind of important for the, for the supply chain work that we're, that we're kind of trying to highlight because um, if before it was efficient for you to source something from the EU and that trade cost has risen but everything else has stayed the same, um, when you switch your sourcing to a non-EU country or, or indeed leave it, the, leave it from the EU but with a higher trade cost, that's going to have kind of pass-through effects onto um, your production activities in the UK, um, which is likely to affect, you know, labour markets and things more broadly. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be very greedy and myself ask another question um, before, we, before we have perhaps one more from Slido, or if you're really desperate from the floor, um, we may come back to you as well. Um, but I guess, I guess um, 
for both of you, I'd love to know how, given that we, we have sort of three different structures um, that are all interrelated, we have the withdrawal agreement, we have the trade and cooperation agreement, and we have, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, how are you accounting for the impact of um, what isn't, uh, you know, your data relies on the border, you've explained mm. that, um, it's when it passes through that border, it, it clicks into the system and it gets recorded. How do we deal with that when we, um, when we have this very uh, unique relationship with uh, the trade border that is in Northern Ireland? Yeah, that's a, a good question and it's, it's a difficult one to answer. I mean, I think maybe kind of we can sort of think about it in two parts. One is that for, for aggregate overall UK trade, and apologies to anyone who might be Northern Irish, Northern Ireland doesn't matter. Northern Ireland is 2% of the UK economy. It's incredibly small. We've spent a lot of time talking about it in the context of Brexit for, you know, for obvious reasons, right? And it matters for lots of political reasons and in terms of you know, maintaining peace and stability on the island of Ireland. It doesn't matter for the overall UK economy. So I think it is a reasonable first pass when you're looking at the UK economy as a whole to pretend Northern Ireland doesn't exist, right? And you know, apologies if that offends anyone, but that's a pretty sensible way to proceed. There's then a kind of more interesting answer, though, which is we're now in this very unusual positions where we have customs checks within the country, right? We don't just have customs checks with other countries. We now have customs checks between Britain and Northern Ireland. And that's going to give us this unique opportunity to learn about what happens when you actually put kind of customs checks within within a country, which is something we haven't really seen since I think 19th century, when uh, 19th century states used to do this. Um, we don't have the data to do that yet. Again, I come back to data availability. But at some point, we're going to get a really rich data set on trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And that's going to be fascinating to study exactly what the effects of the Northern Ireland uh, protocol uh, are. And I think we will, we will learn a lot from that in, in future. Um, and just, yeah, for you. Uh, well, so far, so we only really look at timing. So we're not trying to tease out the effects of different parts of different agreements. Um, but we, so far, we're kind of just looking at, at this time, what happened to trade flows. And we know roughly, you know, what's happening at, at what time. But it's clearly really important to start thinking about what are the types of trade barriers um, that are going to be affecting trade. Um, and one of the kind of more difficult things with Brexit is that all of these trade barriers are non-tariff. So historically, trade economists have used tariffs and they're really nice to work with because they're a number and you can compare it across sectors and then you can look at what happens to trade flows. One of the hard things with Brexit is that these barriers are kind of not tariffs. Um, so we're having to kind of think of different ways to work out how... Um, how exposed different products are to um, to changes in trade barriers, um, and Thomas and I are kind of starting to try and get at that um, in other work. Brilliant. Um, uh, we've we've got a question from um, anonymous, um, which is, how do we address method methodological? Thanks for that. Uh, methodological changes in the way data is collected for analysis particularly looking forward now as collection methods have changed in 2022. And I'd ask um, for both of you to come in on that one, um, and particularly um, if there isn't a, a methodological point, um, uh, which bit of data that the government already collates you most want them to release now? So if... Uh, uh, Josh, do you Josh want to go first? first? Yeah. I'll, I'll, let you go well, first. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely leave the, the methodological question to you, because I know you're the expert on that. Uh, <laughs> and have the author of some excellent Twitter threads. Um, so I'll leave that part to you. In terms of the data, I mean, I'd, I'd definitely like to see the service. I, I do a lot of work on services trade and I'd like to have the services trade data um, more detailed, firstly, across the products that it, that it happens and then uh, that it's recorded and um, kind of more timely and, and kind of better micro data across the country. But, um, that so would be my preference. Just the, just the small matter of 80% of the UK economy, absolutely. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, and uh, Thomas, any, yeah. any, uh, we, we have all read your threads, they're great, but the methodological points of beef, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, so the, the issue for those of you who haven't been following the details of how trade data is collected is that when we were a member of the EU, uh, data on trade within the EU 
couldn't be collected from customs declarations, which is the normal way of collecting trade data, because there weren't any, because that was the great thing about being part of the customs union. Uh, so it was instead collected through a survey called the Intrastat uh, survey. Having now left the EU, and this happened for exports last year and for imports this year, trade data is now collected through customs declarations. So there's this methodological change in how the data is collected. And that raises the question is, you know, if you had collected the same, you used the two methods to collect data for the same year, would you have found the same statistics? It was suggested to the government that they might want to run the two surveys in parallel, the two methods in parallel for a time so that uh, we could assess this. They uh, neglected to, to do that for whatever reason. So there is this kind of outstanding problem. So for exports, when we switched from, from the Intrastat survey to customs declarations, does that mean we now measure more trade or less trade or roughly the same trade? Do those biases differ for different products? Um, that's, the, that's the problem we face. Um, I think, and I'm gonna kind of link this now to, you know, what data would I really like? Please give us the firm level trade data. Um, it does exist, it is collected. It would be really nice to have it. It is supposed to come out, but just the sooner we can get our hands on that, and the more other firm level surveys we can match it to, the more we can learn about what is, what is going on. Um, and in particular, with that firm level trade data will hopefully help us to understand whether there are some biases from this uh, change in, in survey methods, because we'd be able to look for, you know, for individual firms, how has their trade changed over time? And if we see kind of some, you know, essentially really bizarre changes at the firm level, that might be an indicator that there are problems with the change in data collection methods. So that's, that's what I would like to do. Lovely, lovely to end on an extremely geeky point. Um, and so it just leaves me to say a tremendous thank you to our two very learned panelists um, and to say, um, you know, keep, keep up the uh, headline domination, please. More, more, more trade in the news. I think it's going to be important in the weeks and months ahead, particularly with food and the situation in Ukraine. And thank you for being a fantastic audience and um, listening so attentively. Thank you so much. very much and we're back at about uh, one fifteen or so um, for uh, um, the, uh, the afternoon panels on uh, um, trade in services, the political economy of Brexit and finally uh, immigration. Thank you all very much. That was great. Um,
Hi everyone and uh, welcome back. For those who don't know me, I'm Arnand Menon from the UK and a Changing Europe and I'm delighted to introduce uh, two fantastic scholars and economists to talk about two slightly different things. Uh, Meredith Crowley from the University of Cambridge is going to follow on with some of the stuff you've already heard this morning by talking uh, in more global comparative terms about trade deals. Yeah. And then Timo Feitzer from the University of Warwick, uh, who has done loads of interesting work on the sort of political economy of the referendum, is going to introduce some of his findings around that. They're slightly different themes, so at the end we might end up with questions that are slightly different for each of the speakers, but let's just see how this goes. And Meredith? Ready to kick us off? Okay. So, um, thank you very much, Anand, for that introduction, and thank you for having me here today. So, what I would like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about what economists refer to as the pro competitive effects of preferential trade agreements. And these are the ways in which, by signing a trade agreement, we actually get reductions in prices through uh, competitive interactions. And so this is a joint work with um, Lou Hahn, who's a professor at the University of Liverpool, and Thomas Prayer, who um, you may have noted was actually a contributor to the paper that Tom Sampson presented in the last session. So as background, a useful starting point is to understand that Britain, like all countries in the world, sits in part of a larger ecosystem in which there's overlapping networks of preferential trade agreements around the world. And so if we look at all members of the World Trade Organization, the average member of the World Trade Organization has 13 preferential trade agreements with other countries. And so in the map of the world that I have up here in front of you, this comes from the World Trade Organization website, and the countries in this map are color-coded according to roughly how many preferential trade agreements they have signed with other countries around the world. The lightest pink countries on this map have signed only one preferential trade agreement with another country somewhere in the world. The deepest red countries, and this includes countries like the United Kingdom, like the you know, region like the European Union, Australia, those are the darkest red countries, and they've signed at least 40 preferential trade agreements. Okay. Now, currently, the UK has trade agreements with 69 countries around the world, and they're working on further free trade agreements. You know, some of them, um, there's some that have just recently been signed, but we also have things like the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership is an open area of negotiation for the UK. So, relative to the studies we saw before, before the Brexit referendum, before the trade and uh, cooperation agreement was finalized, the new aspect that I want to talk to you about with preferential trade agreements is how they have additional beneficial effects by reducing prices and increasing competition. Okay, And so the basic idea for people to have in their mind is there's a lot of analysis that's been done by government agencies like the UK Department for International Trade and groups of academic economists, groups of private economists, and they estimated various costs associated with the UK leaving the European Union. But the class of economic analysis or the models we use to do that type of um, analysis of what you get from a preferential trade agreement assume a world in which firms are either perfectly competitive or monopolistically competitive. And so what that means in particular is we don't allow for a firm that is operating in an oligopoly where it has a lot of market power and can charge a price considerably above its marginal cost of production. And so today I'm going to be talking about what do we know about the impact that preferential trade agreements have on firms profits per unit of sale, or what economists refer to as the markup. So the big question for today is, how do preferential trade agreements affect market competition, the market power of firms that are exporting to a country, and then the firm's markup, or profit per unit? And so the key question here is, if we have what we call anti-competitive effects that cause prices to rise, or whether we have pro-competitive effects that cause prices to fall. 
And so the question for Britain are what, when we do this type of analysis where we're very much focused on market competition and prices, what are the implications of moving from a relatively deep trade agreement, such as being a member of the EU single market, to what economists refer to as a shallower trade agreement, which is how we would characterize the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU today. Okay, so what we do in this paper is, unfortunately, we envisioned the project to work with um, data from within the UK, but because of the COVID crisis, we um, couldn't access the um, tax data for the UK. And so we've switched our focus to looking at the price setting behavior of 582,000 firms located in 11 low and middle income countries that export to all countries in the world, so 165 different destinations around the world, including the UK, including the EU. And with this, the entire universe of transactions for these 11 countries, we look at 257 preferential trade agreements signed around the world to understand how does signing a preferential trade agreement impact the number of firms that export for, for example, Mexico to the United Kingdom, and how does that signing a preferential trade agreement affect the market shares of those Mexican firms in the UK, and then ultimately what does that mean for the profit per unit that the Mexican firm is earning? Okay. On the theoretical side, where I told you just a moment ago, traditional analysis assumes that markets are competitive and firms are setting their price equal to their cost. Our contribution is to build a multiple country model of global trade that features what we call oligopolistic competition or imperfect competition among firms from multiple origin countries. Now, any preferential trade agreement that Britain signs is taking place against the background of the already existing multiple preferential trade agreements it has. And so if we really want to understand what the impact is of signing an additional trade agreement or having a new policy as part of a trade agreement, we really do want to be looking at it in part of this larger context of the multiple agreements that already exist. So we're going to develop this new model, and then we use the model to do counterfactual policy analysis. Like if we did this, what will happen um, to various economic outcomes? And in particular, we want to know how markups charged by multiple exporting countries that are trying to reach a destination change when there's a preferential trade liberalization that only affects a sort of subset of those countries. So the first thing we have is that in terms of our empirical findings from this large data set, we come up with a sort of puzzling result in light of the standard economic model of international pricing. So there's an important contribution from two economists, Atkinson, um, Eric, Atkinson and Burstein in 2008. And what we find in our paper is that when there's, for example, a 10% tariff cut in an average trade agreement, a firm exporting to that country will see its market share rise 18%. So this means the firm is getting more market power in the foreign destination, but the firm's markup is falling. Now, this is a puzzle for economists who look at imperfect competition because generally, whenever we have a model in which firms are imperfectly competing, if the firm's total share of a market goes up, it generally has more market power and the ability to set a higher price. So economic theory would tell us when a firm's market share goes up, it should have more market power and its markup should rise. Okay. So our theoretical contribution is to try to get a grip on what is going on and how can we understand this in light of economic theory. So we start with this workhorse model of international pricing. We do two things. That model was developed to just study two countries. We're going to introduce lots of countries and lots of destinations. And then we're also going to allow for the possibility that competition between firms from the same origin country is more intense than competition between firms in different countries. And so for a specific example, imagine you've got two firms exporting to the United States, so say Mexico and Germany. Traditional economic models would say that the good arriving from Mexico competes as intensely as the good arriving from Germany. It doesn't matter which firm makes them we're going to allow for the possibility 
that Mexican goods are perceived by American consumers as more similar to each other and that German goods are perceived as more similar to each other and there's a little bit of a difference between the German varieties and the Mexican varieties. So when we do this, what we find is that in this kind of framework, when you cut a tariff, say the U.S. cuts the tariff on Mexico, it would raise overall Mexican market power and stature in the U.S. market, but for each individual Mexican firm, they become more competitive with one another, and that reduces the individual market power of the firms. And so on net, the price that Mexican firms can charge can either go up or down depending on exactly how many firms enter and exactly how intense this competition is among them. Okay, and so this is sort of, we're gonna let the data tell us which way things are happening in practice, but we set this framework up so that we can get either result depending on um, what's consistent with the data. So I'll skip the review of the literature. Sorry, in the interest of time, get to the big stuff. So our data set, um, the map of the world here shows you where the country's um, data is coming from. We're looking at 11 countries from around the world. The heavy hitters in this data set of 26 million firm product origin destination year observations, so 26 million prices we have, um, are really China, Mexico, and Egypt. So if you look at this list of countries, some of them are quite small, but Mexico, uh, China, and Egypt together are, are all quite um, large, important exporters to other countries around the world. So in terms of, I won't go through the, the detailed methodology, but the key finding is the first step. When we look at the individual firm's market shares from these individual destinations, most of the benefit of the preferential trade agreement for these low and middle income countries on the firm's market share comes through the tariff cut. So if you cut the tariff 10%, the firm's market share in the destination goes up. This is coming at the cost of those other firms that may have already been exporting to the country. So you get the gain in your market share because the other, other firms that were exporting to that country essentially lose out on their competitive edge because you have a bigger tariff cut. Now in terms of the markups, I just described this already, there's two kind of avenues in the benefit. One is just signing the preferential trade agreement itself, just the, the signing of the document and some of the provisions in it, which in many cases there are provisions about things such as both parties to the agreement have to have a competition authority regulating competition and preventing um, what we'd call anti-competitive practices. That seems to have a positive effect reducing markups. And then further, when you cut the tariff, you get an additional reduction in this um, uh, profit per unit or markup. So we have this puzzle. The market power of the firm is rising, but its markup is falling. So how do we reconcile this with the data? Well, so we have with all of these 11 countries, 26 million observations, we can break down the firm's market share in a destination. So algebraically, that quantity can just be decomposed into the origin country, so Mexico's market share in the US market, and the market share of each individual Mexican firm over all Mexican firms that export to the country. And what we find here is that Although the firm's market share in the destination rises in total, this comes from two forces. One, the origin, its country's market share becomes more important. So Mexico becomes more important to the US, but there's been an entry by new Mexican firms. And so for each of these individual Mexican firms, their market share is falling. That decline in the average firm's market share is causing the firm to lose market power and that's what's leading it to cut its markup. So another fact I'll just say is this 10% tariff cut is associated with a 22% increase in the number of firms from the exporting destination. And so um, the implication here is that when a preferential trade agreement lowers the barriers for firms to enter a foreign market, this induces a very intense degree of competition among firms from that country. And this intense competition leads the firms to cut their profit per unit or the, the markup over their costs that they charge consumers in the importing country. 
Now, I'll just take a step back and say, remember what we saw this morning in the studies from Josh and Thomas. So Thomas told us, you know, one of the things that they'd been seeing is that although UK imports from the EU had been holding up, he also said that the number of discrete uh, export uh, observations is going down. So the value is, was holding steady for the UK, but the number of distinct exporters was falling. And then Josh told you, well, prices are rising, and some of this we can attribute to Brexit. So what I'm telling you is in this entirely different data set, we see the same phenomenon. When you get entry by more agents, you get the prices coming down. And so here, the sort of story for Brexit is, if we want to understand where some of these price increases are coming from, we can speculate at the moment, we'll eventually be able to validate this with data, that the price increases Josh is observing are coming because there's less intense competition by Europeans selling into the UK market. And we would expect the same effect is working in the other direction. Now. Um, I've been going slow through the results, so how many, I uh, just want to check on my time. Okay. So very briefly, we develop a model that captures these features. So we want to have a model with multiple countries. The firms have different costs of production. We have a limited number of firms from each product origin destination. So typically we have about uh, 10 firms um, from each origin. We allow the firms to optimally choose whether or not to sell and what price to sell at as the economy evolves. And then we importantly allow for different degrees of competition among firms from the same country versus firms from different countries. In terms of a counterfactual analysis, we can just go through and say, well, in this type of world, how big are the price cuts and how much entry occurs when we have a sort of model economy? So we'll show an example today of one model economy. We'll have five countries. They'll trade 4,000 products. Each country in its own domestic market will have 10 firms producing each of those 4,000 products on average. Okay, and we're going to look at the, the model in two periods. The first period, there's going to be an equilibrium where all countries, all five of them, set a 10% tariff on everything. And then we're going to allow two of these countries to have a trade liberalization. So they'll move their tariffs down to zero. And then we'll look at how the market shares of firms, the competitive structure of the economy, and ultimately the prices they charge change. Okay. And so just um, I'll skip the summary just to go and show you the pictures because they're a bit more interesting. Sorry. The first one is just if we look at the two countries, so this first graph shows you the market shares of the five different producers, each country in country two. So if you look at the before picture, the big gray piece of the pie that says 36.4%, that is the share of, product, of consumption in country two that's produced by country two firms. The other four pie slices, gray, pink, green, and blue, are the shares by the other four countries in the world, okay? And it's set up stylistically for them all to be the same at a baseline so we can see how things change when we have a liberalization between just two countries. So when we liberalize trade between countries one and two, the first thing you see the dark gray slice gets a little bit bigger. The market share of country one in country two goes from 15.9 to 18.7%. The colorful slices all shrink they're crowding out trade from the other countries. And also, the domestic market in country two shrinks. They're producing less that they're selling in their own market. OK, this is only showing the sales within country two. Those country two firms are now going to be selling more into country one. Importantly, what happens when we have this type of trade liberalization is we change the size distribution of firms and we change the, mag the number of firms participating in each market. And so here in this graph, I have two distributions of market shares. One is blue, the second one is pink, and where the two distributions overlap, we have gray bars. At one extreme end, you see the number one. That tells us that of the 4,000 products that country one is producing to sell to country two, 
There's just a handful of products where there's only one firm in country two, one exporting to country two. If you move down to the middle of the graph where we have a 0.5, those are going to be representing the height of the bar tells you how many products in this model economy is country one having sort of two firms operating and each of those firms basically have half the market. If we move all the way down to zero, um, in this case there's no firms that aren't selling anything. So the key thing is the vertical lines. You look at there's one blue vertical line right at about 0.45 and a red purple vertical line at 0.4. So what this tells you is the average market share of the firms in this economy, they're all getting smaller. So what's happening is new firms are entering. The number of firms exporting from country one to country two rises from 8,900 to uh, 10,000. And with this rise in the number of firms, all the firms' sales are getting smaller. When their sales get smaller, they're losing their market power. Now, we can also have some a different experiment where we can look at the same model economy and we can look at firms but we won't allow new firms to enter and we'll just say what happens if you don't allow any new firms to enter when you have this tariff cut if you don't allow new firms to enter you don't really get any change that's the the point on the second graph so the key thing though is if we have the firms becoming smaller with the trade liberalization what impact does that have on prices and that's what we see in this graph here. So what this graph here shows us is what is the markup of the, the price over the cost of production. And on the um, x-axis, I have the number 1.9. That says that the if a good with a price, with a, sorry, with a cost of one would have a price of 190. So it's a 90% markup on the, the price over the cost. And again, we showed two distributions. Blue is what it was like before in the high tariff regime. Red is what happens afterward in the low tariff regime. And the vertical lines show you the average markup before in blue and red after. And what we see here is the price cost markup for these firms exporting fall as the tariff comes down. In contrast, if we don't have any change in the number of firms participating in the markup in the market, we actually get no change in the prices. And so the sort of key lesson here is that we were hearing a little bit today that as we have a switch from a European single market for Britain to Britain participating through a trade agreement, and the barriers to small firms exporting from Britain to the EU or from the EU to Britain get higher, and so it becomes harder for firms to enter into this market what you get is that the average size of a firm exporting one way or the other is going to get a bit bigger. They're going to have less competition and more market power, and their prices go up. Okay. Um, and so I think I'm just about out of time. So I'll just say we also know from this type of analysis that we not only get price reductions from signing a preferential trade agreement, we also get increases in the aggregate productivity. This happens because more productive firms, when they're subject to more competition, produce larger quantities of output and they export more. And so in summary, just to, to summarize the big picture lessons from this analysis, what we find is that preferential trade agreements and tariffs are in general pro-competitive. So when a trade agreement encourages entry by not just large firms, but also the smallest firms in an economy, these small firms play a very special role in that they put outside pressure on the big firms to bring down their prices. So it's not just that small firms are valuable for what they sell themselves directly. They have an additional secondary value of bringing down the prices of the big firms. When we move from a trade agreement where there are essentially no barriers to participating in a foreign market for an exporting firm. So under the single market, a British firm just sell their stuff in France very little paperwork, very easy to do this. It made the market in France more competitive and made prices lower for French consumers and similarly going the opposite direction. So this analysis says that while Thomas showed you we've had declines in trade and Josh has showed you that we've seen these price increases, the point of my paper is to show you, well, we can understand now the mechanism and the mechanism is coming through 
the trade agreement, the nature of the trade agreement between the UK and the EU today has reduced competition between the two economies, and this is having an additional negative uh, impact on consumers that we didn't fully understand before um, the decision to form the trade and cooperation agreement was formed. Okay, so I'll stop Thank you there. so much, Meredith. <laughs> before. Before we go on to Timo, can we just have the holding slide back up with the Slido uh, QR code, please? There are no questions coming through on Slido, which makes me think that the technology might not be working. But uh, if I can just encourage people, uh, I know that some people want to ask questions in the room, but for those who are happy on Slido, can I just say, if you can use Slido, it makes life easier. And obviously those at home, if you can use that Slido QR code in the corner of the screen, uh, I'll get your questions here. What I think, I mean, I've got loads of questions actually, Meredith, but I'm going to, I think what we should do is, is go straight on to Timo. One thing, just, just think about this while Timo is speaking, because is there a difference in terms of impact on firms between reducing tariff barriers and reducing non-tariff barriers? Because I, I sort of hear anecdotally that actually the one thing that small firms particularly deal, pro have problems with is non-tariff barriers, and that tariffs are, you know, annoying and they get in the way, but you sort of can get your head around them. So I just mm -hmm. wondered whether if you'd done this for non-tariff barriers, would you see different sorts of effects? We can come back to that. I think we should keep going now. I'm desperately hoping that something happens on Slido. Nothing's happened yet, but uh, Timo, over to you. So there should be some slides coming up. So these are the PDF ones. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've broadly titled this talk, Austerity, Brexit and Beyond. And since there's only roughly 20 minutes, uh, I, I sort of, uh, you know, went with trying to summarize seven years of work across about five published papers and two unpublished papers in these 20 minutes. So I'll take you on a little journey, uh, uh, which I think, uh, you know, will obviously uh, give ob obviously room for uh, uh, potentially good discussions and, and, and questions. Um, ultimately, what my research tries to answer is, the underlying questions of how we got to the referendum in the first place, not just understanding the outcome of it, its consequences, obviously this is important, but also understanding what actually came before the referendum. When we looked at the referendum result, you know, we oftentimes uh, saw pictures like this. On the left hand side here you have the distribution of the vote leaf, the percentage across districts in 2016. Um, and on the right hand side, we have uh, a, you know, a measure from the census which measures the share of the resident population with low qualifications or no formal qualifications. And it doesn't take a lot of eyeball econometrics to see that actually those places that seem particularly dark red, which signifies significant support for leave in the 2016 referendum, are also the ones that seem to actually uh, you know, have a resident population with relatively low qualifications. Um, we actually did this a very systematic exercise, the reference is provided at the bottom here, uh, uh, in 2016, it was published in 2017, which actually tried to understand what are the variation, how can we statistically discern essentially a place that was particularly leaf-leaning as opposed to a place that was particularly remain-leaning. And the overarching observation is that it doesn't really take a lot to build a very, you know, a good uh, statistical model that allows us to distinguish between leaf-voting areas and non-leaf-voting areas. And if we look at decomposing this a little bit further, it's actually long-run structural factors that seem to really be informative in allowing us to discriminate between a leave voting area vis-a-vis -a, -vis a remain voting area. So this is things like the industrial structure, the employment structure across sectors, the educational attainment of the resident population, and the underlying demographics. Um, and obviously, you know, this is interesting, but it actually raises more questions than it answers because none of these uh, 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 patterns actually allow us to tell anything about the underlying causality. Why is it that uh, it appears as if uh, you know people with relatively lower education attainment were more supportive, more conducive of supporting uh, leave in the 2016 referendum. And actually, it doesn't answer the question of why we ended up with a referendum in the first place. The answers to that, I think, they're best found in domestic politics because that is essentially what created you know the necessary conditions for a referendum to be held in the first place. So. 
Um, the key first summary is that these fundamental low, uh, slow moving factors seem to capture a lot of the variation in the different uh, support patterns, but none of these can actually help us understanding what actually caused uh, the referendum to be held in the first place and why the referendum ended up uh, uh, in this particular, with this particular outcome. Um, and obviously, uh, this is, I, I think, the main question when it comes to understanding the underlying political economy. Um, so how did we get to 2016? Um, the answer is to be found in domestic politics. Um, and domestic politics played out across electoral contests over a long period of time, uh, which is essentially uh, what, uh, what I do in some sub subsequent work. Uh, um, in particular, uh, the window through which we can actually get some insight into the evolution of you know, kind of anti-EU sentiment across electoral contests is through studying these electoral contests. Um, and this is essentially what I, what I do in a, in a set of papers through looking at the ascent of UKIP as a force in British, in particular English politics, across all the elections that have been held at the local level, at the European level, at the, at the national level since 2001. And what we see here in the summary is already, well, there has been a notable change in the level of support for UKIP post-2010, uh, which is sort of a first observation. Now, uh, um, um, again, uh, just to convince you, I mean, looking at UKIP doesn't necessarily mean uh, understanding, uh, you know, UKIP might not be isomorphic to supporting LEAF, but actually, if you look at individual survey data, it is. So somebody who has had a proclivity to support UKIP at any point in time was very, very likely about 95% chance to have supported LEAF in the EU referendum. And that is what creates, essentially, allows us to essentially get a prism back into time to understand the evolution of this sort of anti-EU sentiment or the sentiment that came out in the 2016 EU referendum, which we quite see, clearly see in these maps that the places that are particularly purple are the places that are particularly red, suggesting there's a very tight mapping in the aggregate, but this mapping holds, holds true at the individual level as well. Now, the correlates of Brexit, so the fact that an area that is particularly has a, has a notable sort of unfavorable demographic structure, unfavorable human capital structure, unfavorable economic structure in the form of like boasting significant shares of employment in low skill routine jobs, you know, these only became correlates of support for leave or support for Brexit uh, um, post 2010. So, of course, there have been places that had notable support for UKIP prior to 2010, but actually the patterns in differences across areas, we could not really explain them by demographics, we could not explain them by uh, the educational attainment, we could not explain them by the employment structure. Those correlates of Brexit only started appearing post-2010, which is very important, again, when we look at understanding the timing and how domestic politics actually delivered the necessary condition for a referendum them to be called in the first place. So we need to understand what happened after 2010. So this is just zooming in on this, uh, on this particular plot. What this is basically saying is that uh, uh, we can only, if, if I were to look at a map in 2008 uh, uh, and wanted to say, well, is this a Brexit-leaning place, a non-Brexit leaning place, or UKIP supporting place, non-UKIP supporting place, despite there being differences in the levels of support, these differences in the level of support for UKIP before 2010 are not linked uh, or in any way correlated with the educational attainment of the resident population. It only started really mattering post-2010. So what happened post-2010? And this brings me to a blank slide. And another blank slide. Okay. Uh, so what you should be seeing is a graph that portrays uh, the structure of UK public spending. Um, so over time, uh, it, it sort of it portrays uh, the level of real spending per capita across three domains. Uh, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, welfare spending for the working age adult population as sort of a, you know, a first uh, indicator. We're looking at spending on education and we're looking at spending on health care. In another version, there's spending on the state pension, which is sort of another important welfare spending component, but it's obviously extremely age biased. And what this figure will show you is that real spending on, uh, uh, on sort of the future generation and the current working generation in terms of in-work benefits has drastically declined declined in real terms since 2010 as a result of government spending cuts 
um, that were particularly age biased, uh, skewed towards uh, uh, you know the, the state pension spending drastically increased in part because of things like the triple lock, uh, uh, where spending on the current working age adult population it actually is producing the taxes through which these transfers are being paid, uh, um, um, you know, actually uh, declined drastically. So I'm not sure whether I have any hope to getting my slides back, because at some point it'll get a bit more tricky to, uh, to wing it. Um, keep winging for now. There's front again. Perfect. I'll, I'll, I'll keep winging it for now. I always assume the best. Okay. Uh, the good thing is I have some notes here, so I, 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 can, I, I can sort of fall back. Um, in essence, uh, you know, in a very careful study that involves looking at individual data over time, looking at political preferences as expressed through voting or voting intentions, or looking at attitudes towards politicians, oh, you know, they don't work for us, uh, so, so survey responses to these type of questions. Well, what, what, what I can show is that post-2010, in particular post-2013, which was the main wave of the uh, welfare reforms, okay, now we're back to a, a wonky one, which is a PowerPoint, uh, but I can try to wing it. Okay, this is the graph. Uh, okay, how can I go back? This is the graph that I was just describing in terms of the real spending cuts. The slides don't look like this. Uh, um, uh, There's a PowerPoint version of it. The real spending cuts uh, p uh, pertaining to uh, welfare and social protection and education. So spending aw turns away from the future and the present working age uh, population towards the you know retired population, which kind of makes public spending much more age biased. Um, and it turns out that if we look at these welfare reforms, what they ended up doing was hitting those places that were economically struggling already even harder, uh, uh, which means the most deprived areas uh, actually experienced the most significant uh, financial hit from these welfare reforms. And actually within these areas, this is, you're talking about individuals. Um, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a paper, um, that uh, I tried to just summarize here, which is called Did Austerity Cause Brexit? Um, uh, you know, I very carefully ana analyzed this data and it is, it's, uh, very, very carefully uh, studied this around very specific reforms to understand how political preferences change and attitudes change around, uh, around sort of the exposure to very specific reforms or cuts such as, for example, the, uh, the bedroom tax. Uh, um, we see that people who were affected by the bedroom tax, which often hit individuals who actually had a need for the second bedroom, uh, 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 for example, for caring responsibilities or whatnot, uh, ended up uh, uh, sort of drifting uh, 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 in not favoring the political status quo um, and actually having to make adjustments to their life that might have been particularly difficult, such as moving to a smaller uh, uh, house. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to wing it again. Um, so, so we've talked about this. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I know. I was seeing how I can adjust. Um, exactly. Oh, here we go. So this is perfect. So <clears throat> uh, the key point is that had it not been for this austerity shock, um, you know, some quantification exercise suggested actually UKIP support post-2010 uh, would have been between 4 to 12 percentage points lower across all the sets of elections. Um, however, obviously it affected political outcomes um, and actually the emergence of UKIP combined with the structure of the political system, which, you know, first past the post, you know, any, any vote splitting, uh, any party that leads to vote splitting that is sort of politically biased in one direction or the other can help an incumbent win. Uh, 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 um, and that's exactly what, what happened. So austerity hurt the conservatives, but it hurt the Lib Dems much more, which allowed the conservatives to win seats where the contest was historically between Lib Dems and conservatives. And that is essentially what, and, and labor was not able to capitalize in places where it was a three-way contest. Um, and as a result, uh, the conservatives surprisingly won an outright majority in 2015, which actually then required uh, uh, um, the David Cameron to have to deliver on that promise of a referendum that he was not expected, expecting to have to deliver on uh, um, because he was expecting to continue govern, governing in a coalition. So it's this interaction of the electoral system together, uh, together with the uh, emergence of this uh, challenger party that actually was siphoning votes out, uh, but it was more damaging for the conservatives, actually created the political conditions of a referendum to be held in the first place. Um, so I think that's the main point. The F referendum would not have happened had it not been for us the austerity-induced changes in uh, sort of the electoral uh, and the political landscape. 
Now, I want to go back to the big picture. So why was austerity so important? And why is it the case that if we take a, you know, an empirical model that is trained on UK data, where we get basically regression coefficients from the UK, if we sort of merge French data on that, uh, uh, actually the UK Brexit model does a good job at predicting Le Pen voting. Why is that the case? Well, it's the case because many of the economic and social developments that we've seen over the last decades actually um, create a demand for the state or, or de create a role for the welfare state potentially in evening out or managing structural transformation that is obviously economically and socially desirable because innovation is great. Uh, it, it, it helps us increase productivity, but typically it creates winners and losers. And there's many, uh, many mechanisms that have been looked at that create, that, that sort of are skill biased in nature that can exacerbate sort of income inequalities or sort of hit one group differently from another group, which actually, you know, we would typically think that the state is a potential actor that should take a role to even out these differences to make sure that the consensus that societies embrace these these welfare improving uh, these welfare improving changes um, actually uh, uh, you know can can happen right so it's about the underlying social contract wow a lot of stuff is going on um, so very adverse circumstances. Um, <laughs> So I just want to briefly mention, we look at immigration, where the consensus is moving towards in very narrow population pockets, can Im immigration have adverse effect? But actually, it's increasing the pie, and actually, typically, uh, it actually increases the productivity uh, um, because it allows the domestic population to move up into higher quality jobs. Um, we look at globalization-induced pressures, which typically have a significant regional signature. Uh, uh, um, um, you know, the China shock has been looked at. Again, it creates uh, economic pressures that hit one set of the de demo group, demographic group differently than another demographic group, where typically low-skill individuals are more adversely affected than higher-skill individuals. We have the rise of the gig economy, the emergence of more and more market power and market concentration, the prolification of insecure employment. All of these things are adverse in many, many ways. Um, and we have structural policy failures that are common not just to the UK, but across Europe. And that's why you know, we see a, a sort of a fertile ground for populist narratives to actually uh, be able to, to, to succeed. It's not about favoring the populist. It's about not liking the status quo. Um, in terms of how this works out in the data, so what the UK did, uh, what this is showing you is the evolution of labor income, benefit income, and gross income in a large representative sample, uh, a, a, a repeated panel of individuals across the UK over a long time period. And we're removing sort of individual idiosyncratic factors, so the fact that Joe is different from Mike and so on and so forth, so that there's unobserved skill differences. So this is just plotting out the trend. What you see is there's a picture for high skill as well. Uh, I'm just showing you the low skill one because that's most relevant for this, for this presentation. We see that actually labor income is relative to the rest of the population notably declined. So this is the most leftmost panel. In the central level, we have benefit income, so transfer income that, that reaches those uh, low skill individuals. And we see that actually it has been responsive from about the mid 2000s onwards that actually those that in relative terms were getting worse off actually were compensated to some extent. Perfect. Um, uh, so, uh, so they were compensated to some extent, but obviously that compensation has started to lose momentum uh, uh, from about 2010 onwards. Um, and the gross income is sort of the sum of the two, so to say, and there we see exactly that this decline has been halted for about seven years. Uh, from about 2007 onwards to about 2014, from which onwards most of the welfare reforms became, you know, really uh, uh, striking. Um, and we see that basically since then, you can just, you know, essentially, uh, there's a, is there a pointer? No, there's no pointer. No, there's no pointer. Uh, what you can see is that the, uh, uh, the, you can almost fit a straight line through this here, uh, uh, which says that, well, this trend that was happening, that the structural forces behind this trend was not compensated by the welfare state. So, in essence, why certain areas were exposed to austerity was because there was a demand for welfare um, that was arising because of these you know, economic, demographic, uh, uh, and structural changes in the economy that are common to most of the Western, uh, Western economies. So, 
the welfare state was the band-aid and austerity was removing the band-aid from that wound. Um, and that is essentially what came out in the ele elections uh, in, 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 the, in the years running up to the referendum, creating the political realities for a referendum to be held in the first place. So, I, actually, perfect timing. Uh, now I want to talk about beyond Brexit, beyond austerity. Because obviously, a lot of voters might have approached the idea of you know, voting against the status quo for an alternative that was sold to them as a panacea, you know, as a sort of silver bullet, as a solution to all the potential challenges. So one of the additional exercises, and that's the last paper, the most recent one uh, uh, that I did, was looking at the regional economic cost of Brexit up to 2019. So that was prior to, obviously, the free trade agreement and Brexit becoming a political reality with changing uh, you know, terms of trade uh, are being politically implemented. Um, what we see is that the exercise that we do is very similar to what John Springford has done for the UK, uh, uh, except that what we end up doing is we actually look at different regions across the UK, different local authority districts, uh, um, to see to what extent uh, they have been affected by Brexit post-2016 relative to what our best statistical guess would have been uh, had they sort of remained uh, their economic integration with other regions across the world uh, in the same fashion. And what we see here is actually uh, uh, a bit striking. So uh, the left panel here is just showing you one plot out of hundreds of plots. You can look at them on this website that we put up together uh, called brexitcost.org. Um, which showcases uh, that essentially in the southwest, uh, uh, the blue line is the actual evolution of uh, you know, a GDP or an output gap, uh, whereas the red line is what we would have expected the southwest economy to evolve like had it not been uh, for the 2016, the outcome of the 2016 referendum. And we do see this gap emerging and we can quantify the size of the gap. We see we, on, the, on the right hand side, we have the London region, where also there was sort of an immediate Brexit effect. There was a notable slowdown in the real estate market for, for, for a short, short while, and actually a, a quite notable recovery back to, this, uh, back to this old trend, which is just highlighting the fact that the costs and benefits of Brexit, if there are any to be had, will be not evenly distributed across the UK. And if anything, in this paper, uh, uh, what we show is that the places that are already losing out on uh, essentially prosperity are the ones that have been uh, uh, you know, uh, significantly supporting, the ones that have the same weak uh, economic and, and, and social fundamentals. Which means, if anything, Brexit is going to increase the divides across, uh, across the UK. So what are the implications for policy? Um, it means that you know, if the UK is serious about leveling up, uh, uh, it's very important to establish funding mechanisms that actually can channel resources you know, away from those Brexit winners towards those regions that have been suffering for a very, very long time. It was a political choice of the UK for 20 years or 30 years to not do that. And that's why I'm not optimistic that all of a the sudden there will be a change of heart, uh, let alone a change in the sort of system or the mechanisms in place that could be used to actually meaningfully level up. If anything, all the evidence that we've seen is that leveling up funds become a tool to essentially uh, for political opportunistic behavior to channel funding in a way that might benefit or create certain electoral advantages for the income rather than actually tackling the problem. And this is particularly striking uh, uh, in the context of the failure to replace, for example, EU regional cohesion funds uh, um, that, that were actually meant to benefit or, uh, significantly or that significantly benefited the Southwest that are allocated as a very neutral, pol according to a very neutral policy rule that says if your area is below a certain threshold relative to the average prosperity in the European Economic Union, you would receive more transfers. Now, we can talk about whether these transfers are effective, whether they're properly implemented, but it's a clear, transparent policy function that is relying on data that is not necessarily politically captured. Um, and I think that's the direction of travel that actually uh, the UK should adapt uh, and adopt in order to really tackle uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the uneven, uh, unevenness of its economic, infra economic and, and sort of uh, political uh, uh, sort of cohesion. Um, I always like to flag up that in the German context, I'm originally German, I've been here for 15 years, the equality of living conditions has constitutional character. It's enshrined in the Constitution. It's an article in the Constitution that says 
the, 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 the politics and society will strive for even e equal living conditions, irrespectively of where you live, where you grew up in, in, in Germany. And that is why economically and socially, I think a lot of the divides that we see as particularly coming out in the US, but also in, especially in the UK, are not as severe in, in the German context because there's a policy mechanism, there's a commitment that is you know, very deeply protected politically by the, by the constitutional setup. Um, so I think, uh, let me just uh, wrap it up here. Uh, I, I, I significantly worry that actually those factors that gave us Brexit are here to stay. Things will be potentially getting notably worse. And I don't see light at the end of the tunnel that uh, promises will be delivered in a way that actually could tackle the root causes. So thanks so much for your uh, attention and despite the more difficult circumstances. I see a real potential in a game show where you get economists to give papers and you sort of put them off in various ways and you see, you see who does best. Uh, I don't know if people are trying to use the Slido and failing. Is anyone? Uh, you're, you're struggling. All right, well, I'll come, I'll come to that in a minute. That wasn't that question. Uh, I will come to you for questions. There are questions on the Slido. I'll try and share it out. I think given the nature of the talks, there are going to be two different sets of questions, but there are a couple that have come in that are broadly similar, one of which is asked in various ways. Can you say something about the distributional gains of preferential uh, trade agreements within country? That is to say, so Timo's talked about the sort of distributional impact of leaving. What has been the distributional impact of those gains and are they fairly shared? And if so, and if not, could that, is that something that ought to have been done better in the sort of political context here? Yeah, so the distributional gains that you would draw directly from my paper would be that the cost of leaving is the largest for one, for the firms that basically have to exit the market. So the, the cost of participating in the market. So those firms lose out on some market. The second group that gets hurt by leaving the trade agreement are consumers, because consumers are going to be paying higher prices. And then, in general, a fact that we know as economists, um, and this builds on some of the work Josh showed us this morning, in general, people with lower incomes spend more of their total income on material goods, food, clothing, shelter and less of their income on services, so lawyers, haircuts, private school education. And so in general, the distribution of leaving the trade agreement is heaviest on the, the financially most vulnerable people right. in the economy. Right. They, they face the highest price increases relative to their income. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this chimes very well with obviously, uh, you know, the concerns that those areas, uh, those people living in these areas that appear to have been particularly drawn into voting against the status quo on the basis of political promises that were made, uh, you know, you know, it's like Turkey's voting for Christmas at some level, um, because there's a lot of pressures building up now uh, on the cost of living side that will be, at, at some point, I'm, I'm, I always find it, I'm always just fascinated by how much the British people take uh, in terms of you know adverse shocks and you know you know uh, you know just sucking it up. Uh, um, like my sister in Germany complains about having to pay 13 euros uh, uh, rent. She's complaining about the fact that the air is dry in the house because of uh, the underfloor heating and that there's triple glazing. And uh, I mean, like you know, it's completely different standards of living in many many ways, in very real ways. That uh, I'm 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 just always surprised by how how much you know, the Brits are willing to take in terms of uh, adverse economic outcomes hitting them. Uh, um, like, to be honest, this is, uh, this is a big surprise. Uh, but hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wasn't the, isn't the referendum itself evidence of the fact that they weren't willing to take it? That's to say, I mean, you know, one explanation of the referendum is those people hit by austerity just said, screw you, we don't care what the consequences are, we just want to stick a finger, you know, it was a protest. It was a protest, but there was promises that were suggesting, you know, a, uh, a sort of a very pleasant, uh, pleasant ride uh, from then on. And I think this is when promises meet reality. You know, I, I think there's a lot of pressure building up that will potentially create vulnerability in all sorts of directions. And obviously, one direction that this could be taken politically is that 
uh, we will see more repression. Um, that's one way to actually uh, crack down on dissent uh, uh, if there's a concern that dissent is building. Uh, uh, um, because technically, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, or that there's more, you know, vulnerabilities being channeled into certain demographic groups that have no way of achieving political representation in this country, either through choice or through, uh, 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 through um, you know, their legal status in this country. Um, so I think, you know, like, I'm not sure where the venting mechanisms will be, uh, um, but the fact that this is a country that's not governed by the majority of people, but by, but, uh, but by a you know, minority, I do think at some point will create problems that, I don't know, I, I, it's very, they're very hard to foresee. Right. We're going to, I think what we might do is split this, I can see your hand if you sit down, it's fine, uh, is split this into two. So firstly, what I'm going to say is anyone got any questions specifically for Meredith on her presentation? Only one for Meredith. Okay, go ahead. I think this is the logical way to do it. Your, your central uh, thesis of uh, firms increasing market share, yep. uh, increasing market power, uh, but conversely um, reducing, reducing their profits, reducing their markup. Uh, takes, it's an observation, it takes me back to my O-level and A-level economics when we were taught you could either go for market, market share uh, or you could go for profit maximisation. Uh, you couldn't do both and uh, that was 30 years ago and your work has just backed up what I, what I, uh, what I learned as a schoolboy in my short trousers. Just park that for a minute, Meredith, because I'm going to take a question for Timo. There's one more from Slido you might want to add to your list, which is from David Bailey, who asks if post-referendum depreciation helped exporters at all. Uh, so is there, is there a, a, a couple of questions? The, the gentleman who's very keen. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to... Yeah, you can hear me, yeah. Um, I raised the question for the German gentleman. I can't remember his name, sorry. Um, Requiring you talked about pensioners doing well because obviously they had the you know the they they had the pensions physically protected from austerity. The problem with that theory is uh, when well you say the discontented people tended to vote for Brexit. Um, the problem is a lot of the pensioners voted for Brexit. I mean the majority of the older generation actually pro Brexit, and a lot of middle class and highly educated people like myself voted for Brexit. And I don't think we can just say it's the downtrodden who voted uh, Brexit. I think it's an over so half the people, it was a coalition of obviously downtrodden people, 50% and 50% middle class conservative types in the home counties who, who didn't like the EU, it viscerally didn't like it. And the EU has something to blame itself for this because economic conditions in the EU are not very good. I may remind, I don't know what your comments are on Germany. You say, I don't see how- Hi, we've only got 15 minutes left, so yeah, okay, can you- Yeah, okay, just about the Germans buying Russian oil. That's going to be bad for Germany, they have to stop. Okay, and just to add to that, Timo, and I'll let you both answer, there's a question come in, which is, was Brexit down to austerity or was it down to the financial crash that uh, preceded it? And actually, one final thing, just to add on to what the gentleman was saying, was we did lots of work on comfortable levers uh, at the UK in a changing Europe. Where do they fit in, in your picture? But Meredith, over to you first. Okay, so uh, for the gentleman who is going back to his O-level, so the the kind of classic story is if you're a firm and you want to make money, you sell a lot of stuff at a low price or a little bit of stuff at a high price. And market share is actually how much of the total amount consumers buy are you selling. And so the other lesson, which I know you got in O-level, was as my firm gets bigger and I'm, I've, I sell more of the total amount that people buy in the world, I can raise my price and you're stuck with me. You can't move to other varieties. And so the, the thesis there, it, it lines up in terms of economic theory. The subtlety here is that one of the puzzles is that it's not just your total size of the market, but how big you are compared to people from your own country. And that's one of the subtleties that kind of we kind of unpicked. For David Bailey's question about the post-Brexit, um, the depreciation of the sterling, Gosh, wouldn't it have been wonderful if that decline in the value of the sterling relative to the euro, dollar, and every other currency in the world had allowed British exporters to sell more at the same price or 
sell small amounts at a much you know higher price. It unfortunately, while there was probably a bit of a kick and a little bit of a boost in terms of um, UK sales to the rest of the world, it didn't really have any long-lasting effects. And so I have another paper where we look at um, the use of currency and different currencies by British exporters. One interesting fact is that um, starting all the way back in 2010, British exporters were using the sterling less and less and were increasingly using the dollar over time. And so in a sense, as dollar invoicers, they have a little bit of less ability to, um, to set their prices. They're kind of responding, it seems, a bit more to what the consumers are asking. And in terms of their price setting into the European Union, we have to speculate a little bit because we don't know exactly which currency they're using, but everything we can do from our economic analysis indicates it's most likely that their price setting view is they're using the euro. So in some sense, when the, the sterling um, fell in value, it didn't, the French were like, we know the sterling fell, you have to lower the euro price. And so that's, it didn't really give them any big kick on the quantity side. And so um, unfortunately, that old fashioned lesson we had from the 60s about currencies moving, it didn't, that benefit, it didn't materialize and pricing in international markets a little bit more complicated than our textbooks from the 60s told us. Team, over to you. I'm going to add one more question from Paul Giles, just because it's, it's interesting, and it ties into that last slide about the Southwest GDP. And, and Paul says, do you include the impact of the, la of the failure to replace EU funding in that figure, or is that additional? Okay, very good. I wanted to say one more thing to the, the response that you just gave. I mean, in the, in the sort of regional economic Brexit cost paper, one of the things that we observed is that, um, you know, there was a sweet spot, right, post-devaluation that actually made UK exporters more competitive. Like, it was, you know, cheaper to sell into the European market. And that's something that we actually see in the data, uh, uh, that actually firms then expanded on hiring more people to capitalize on this. But they did not expand on capital equipment, which means actually in the short term there was this sort of output boost, um, but that was essentially based on the premise of firms shifting to less optimal capital labor mixes, which actually meant that productivity was actually going down. Uh, um, and because firms were not willing to make a commitment to actually invest more fixed assets into this country, because they can easily fire workers that they might have expanded on in the short term, which I think, again, creates this sort of illusion of like a Brexit bounce in the labor market, when in fact, actually, it was a symptom of firms just responding optimally to these temporary conditions um, and then shedding, uh, you know, workers again so again obviously in the in the broader public discourse this was then you know seen as evidence oh everything is going right the unemployment rate doesn't 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 increase uh, um, but actually the structural fundamentals on which this employment gains were created were not strong ones um, and that's why you know there, there could be sizable adjustments in the wake of it because there was no genuine capital expansion in terms of the it's uh, worth adding to that isn't it that we have a bizarre situation now in terms of balance of trade where the eu immediately put all the checks in place and we still haven't so in terms of british exporters you're seeing importers having a far easier time of it which is ironic in some which, ways which could as a, yeah so which could yeah create yeah. bad conditions in in, in yeah. the uk because it's an unlevel playing field in that sense um, I think um, in terms of the point about pensioners and so on, I always see this, and this is, I mean, I, I think I wrote like a five page or 10 page uh, summary of like debunking some of the common critiques to this austerity hypothesis. We have to distinguish between the average leave supporter and the marginal leave supporter. Those people who supported Brexit who are pensioners, you know, in 2016, they most likely would have supported Brexit 30 years or 20 years or 15 years earlier as well. It's the same set of people. The key thing is the, thir the, the roughly 10, 15 percent of people who actually got, you know, who got, you know, uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, convinced or uh, actually political or, or sort of swayed by uh, um, the campaigning and the context uh, that they were living on. It's actually the marginal voters that matter uh, um, in actually having determined uh, the referendum outcome. And so I think that's a really important point that often gets missed, distinguishing between those who would have voted for Brexit had it been had there been a referendum 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, and those who actually you know, were convinced or were, were swayed by the fact that they're observing that their economic conditions are not improving relatively, they're not doing, they're not faring well with the status quo. It's the, it's the marginal voters that matters. In terms of the, um, 
in terms of the comment on the replacement of EU funding, so in this particular graph, this applied to, uh, uh, to just to 2019 when the UK was still receiving EU structural funds. So, so it's, it, mm -hmm. it's not an issue for that particular, particular uh, period. Um, I do think that the financial crash mattered insofar that it helped shape certain narratives. Uh, um, or helped create opportunities for political entrepreneurs on the political left as well as the political right to create narratives that resonate, uh, uh, for example, around the Greek sovereign debt crisis and how the EU was bad towards Greece. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously that chimed very well with the Lexiteers, uh, the political left-leaning uh, Brexiteers, uh, uh, because it's true that that, that was a massive European uh, 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 failure uh, in the grand scheme of things. And it's clear that there is failures happening, policy failures happening everywhere. Uh, um, I think uh, the key distinguishing fact about Brexit is that unlike I would say, unlike Trump, I was said in 2016, I moved to Chicago, said Trump is reversible because there's term limits. Uh, Brexit is here to stay. Um, and and uh, uh, so, you know, so, so I would, would, would think that uh, uh, systems, political systems that are sufficiently elastic can correct themselves. But for such a big decision uh, uh, as, as, as Brexit was, this is going to be very difficult to adjust. You see, I always thought the referendum happened because of a dodgy pizza at O'Hare Airport, but even though I've got to rethink my, my theory now. But Meredith, I've got a very specific question for you, which is on what might happen to UK uh, productivity if small firms uh, exit from exporting, but the overall volumes remain the same. I hope I got that right, Ollie, but I think that's what you're asking. Oh, you're here. I keep forgetting people here do this. No, go on, because... Thanks. Um, and yeah, if, if there's, so if you expect an impact on UK productivity, if exports stay the same, as we saw in earlier presentations, but the small firms drop out, and then whether that impact on productivity is one that is captured by existing work on Brexit, and sort of more generally the effects in your, in your work, I think you mentioned it at the start, but if you could just remind me whether it's captured in the existing analysis. Thanks. Okay. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if we were taking a bunch no, no. of questions. Okay. So, um, so two things with productivity. So we have in the UK, if the UK, say, for example, leaves the relatively competitive um, preferential trade agreement, and so there's a little bit less access to the UK, the EU market, and similarly, there's less competition from EU firms, what we have is essentially unwinding a PTA or stepping back from a PTA we typically think is going to be um, welfare reducing and productivity reducing. And the reason is once you, so there's two things. So I was focusing in on talking about the small firms that export to foreign countries. And so British firms that are small facing a big barrier and reaching the EU are going to stop exporting to the EU. But essentially at the same time, if Britain's just kind of surrounded by a big wall to exporting. And so you can't either export out, but you can't um, have other countries easily export to Britain. You're actually going to allow for more domestic small firms that might be less productive to survive. And so in our model simulations, what we would find in general is that if you only look at production taking place in Britain, what you're going to find is there's going to be a, a bit of a reduction because you'll get entry by less productive British firms that will only be selling domestically. And so the net productivity ex effects we'd expect from my analysis is that as the trade agreement gets less generous and less open, you lose productivity. Um, the existing studies, what they do, so like a, a standard CGE model, holds productivity of the existing set constant. And so the, the key thing, as I said earlier, there's two flavors. One is perfect competition, and one is monopolistic competition. The monopolistic competition flavor holds the productivity of the firms in the economy constant, essentially. So you don't get this distributional change on allocative efficiency. And so that's one of the things that's kind of nice you get to see in these, these models with pro-competitive effects. 
Thank you. I thought I was going to, for the first time in my life, chair a session without a question from John Pete, but he stuck his hand up. So go on, John. Sorry, I'm not on Slido. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask um, Timo Shame Petzer. On you. Um, we had the question about pensioners, but I also still buy your general analysis of austerity. But one other thing that happened before the referendum was the Labour Party elected a new leader, 2015, who everybody knew was very anti the European Union. And I wonder if any of the work you've done shows anything on what that, what that did to Labour voters in the Brexit referendum. Yeah, and the gentleman here right at the front, this might have to be the last, hang on, wait for the mic. And you, could you stand up just so people at the back here? Oh, is that okay? If we can. Uh, f yeah, question Sorry. for M Meredith. Uh, we, we've not, UK's done the easy free trade agreements like the rollover and the <laughs> EU. Uh, the, the, the remaining markets, uh, like the, the large markets, the US, China, India, either we're not, not going to get the FTA or it's going to be difficult. So is, is there something, we could, could we achieve a similar positive result on, on, in terms of PTAs through unilateral? liberalization either of non-tariff or tariff barriers and a question for we need to be quick we've got one yeah, more to squeeze in quick, i'm afraid quick, quick, quick uh just a challenge for timo uh 2019 uh red red wall uh switched to conservatives after about 10 years of austerity that they, they were kind of hard hit how do you explain that and there's one guy at the back. While, while the microphone's going to the back, let me just say, and it's been a really interesting day with economists sort of talking to and agreeing with each other. I just wonder whether one of the lessons of today is that economists are very good at talking to each other, but actually need to get better at explaining their stuff to other people. Because there's been so much we saw this coming about today. And I just sort of wonder why your average voter was uncon Were they unconvinced by this? Were they just not listening? Do they just not trust? But it does seem to be an issue we should think about. Just so thought I'd throw that in there. So following on from that, um, it, it, Bob Dylan was not an economist, but he did say, uh, if you ain't got nothing, got nothing to lose. Um, and following your point, sir, about uh, you know, what, how much can we take, uh, we had austerity and then the promise of sunny up plans, and now we look as though we're going to go down again from your, both of your pieces of analysis. Uh, Martin Lewis seems more pessimistic than me, which is quite difficult, because he's talking about riots and sporadic unrest. At what point is the tipping point for people to decide enough is enough, in your view from outside, both of you? Can I just say that's from Like a Rolling Stone? Anyway, on we go. <laughs> I think I knew that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, did you want to take the Labour Party leader question um, first? Because I thought that was yeah, more directed sure. at you, and then we can talk about FTAs and then talk Don't about Bob settled, Dylan. We've got about three, four minutes. Okay, quick. Right. Uh, so, yeah, sure, on the Labour leader, I, I do think that basically the Labour Party struggled with being a broad church and being, again, very heterogeneous in different, to different sets of voters in different parts, right? It's a party that actually appeals to the urban elite. It's a party that, at the same time, you know, has to appeal those to, to those left behind historically. Uh, and I think that's, you know, what would have happened in a PR type system is there would have been a split both in the Conservative Party as well as in the, in, in the Labour Party. And I think ultimately there was this layer of confusion uh, for voters uh, um, um, that uh, essentially you know, contributed to, uh, to there not being a decisive direction anyway, in any, any way in 2015, because it was pulled in many directions. And we saw this, uh, you know, following 2017 and so on and, and so on and so forth, uh, the struggles in the Labour Party in the same way that, I mean, the Conservative Party, because it's a much more narrow, less broad church, actually was able to tackle this uh, slightly better. In terms of 2019, again, Brexit hasn't happened yet. You know, the message still, prevails that the sunlit uplands are there for the taking. There's an oven ready uh, deal. I mean, the narrative was still powerful, very much intact. And as, as I said, it was some of the economic short term changes were actually looking not that bad. As I said, you know, firms were actually hiring, the labor market was doing well, but these were just firms optimally adjusting in the short term. But there was no 
solid foundations. And that's why productivity kept declining, because obviously you had more workers now working on the same amount of fixed capital that was depreciating, and so productivity went down. And now you have all of these anti-competitive pressures that you know, Meredith's uh, uh, paper you know, very strongly highlights that are upwinds. And I mean, again, it's going to favor the fir those firms that survive and those owners of the firms. But uh, structurally, I think it's very problematic. And the last point before I hand over to you is, um, how much more can people take? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I generally worry. I mean, this is my honest uh, assessment. I keep on saying this when I'm on, on the continent that, uh, you know, it's a very, very fragile social structure. Uh, there's, you know, very fragile uh, a, a situation where I think, I mean, w the UK had riots, you know, in, in 2011, uh, 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 was it 2012, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think, you know, these things can happen, they will happen, um, and uh, I, I'm just worried about the lack of pol the responsiveness of the political system to these developments. Um, it's you know, as there could be a one big shock that leads to a shift in people's beliefs, and then all of a sudden you have people on this on the street. Could be a uh, spike in the mailbag price would be fatal. Uh, <laughs> Meredith, U unilateral versus reciprocal trade liberalizations—you can't get the same benefits. So the the first thing, Sorry, if you get rid of all British tariffs, open to everybody, you'll get what we call the pro-competitive effect. There'll be competitive pressure. It'll force the worst firms in Britain to close down, but. By not expanding the external market for British firms, you don't give the opportunity to the best British firms to expand, and you do need that in order to get the productivity gains. So there is some sense to trying to, to hammer through some of these, these trade agreements reciprocally. Um, I am skeptical that we're going to get a lot out of them uh, very soon. And then about the riots and unrest, um, there's been some really important work studying the United States going back, I don't know, a decade or so by um, Angus Deaton, who's a Nobel laureate, uh, Cambridge grad, looking at what are um, known in the US as the epidemic of deaths of despair. So what we see in the United States is that um, low income, low skilled males are dying of alcoholism, drug addiction, suicide. And rather than people out in the streets being angry about the political system they find themselves in, they're home, you know, slowly dying of these, um, you know, terrible drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Um, and so, you know, the life expectancy of, of white males, like in the low quarter of the income distribution in the U.S., today is lower than it was 10 years ago. Um, and that's that's a, a tragedy for uh, a society um, that's been unfolding slowly. So it's maybe there will be protests in the streets if the political system's not responsive, but sometimes people respond to a terrible situation privately um, by engaging in really unhealthy behaviors and activities. Well, that's not a note I'd have chosen yeah. to end the session on. But uh, if I can thank, thank Timo and uh, Meredith, and just say actually, Jonathan, I think you're sitting at the back, that no one answered my question about economists, so you should do it in the last session. Thank you all very much indeed.
who are going to talk about, uh, um, uh, if we move on. Okay, so if we could get the, uh, the next slides up, starting with the, yep, here we are, Brexit and Trade and Services. Um, and uh, um, we have uh, um, my UK and Changing Europe colleague, um, Sarah Hall from Nottingham and uh, Jun Du from Aston. Um, but this panel will be chaired by Marine Khan, who is the um, newly minted economic correspondent of the Times. Uh, congratulations again. Um, thank you for chairing this. And I'm going to sit down and hand for Maureen, formerly of the uh, Financial Times, um, and I'm going to hand uh, straight over to Maureen and sit down and leave it to you guys. Brilliant. Thank you. And the mics are on? Yeah, they're on. Great. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us and for staying in the room uh, for this session. Uh, as Jonathan said, my name is Mehreen Khan. Uh, I recently just joined The Times as economics editor and before that was in Brussels up until last month for about four and a half years, uh, covering the EU, which also meant uh, covering Brexit and the, the politics around uh, the EU and UK's relationship. And as I told the panellists um, just a couple of minute, minutes ago in the green room, I told one of my friends in Brussels that I was doing this and their response was, ah, so people still talk about Brexit in the UK, um, which was a, a reflection of the, some of the asymmetry uh, of interest in, in what Brexit will mean, will come to mean, and what, what, um, what it was uh, when the history books are written. There's definitely a sense in which uh, I think the European Union are much... Um, uh, don't really want to talk about it and don't li really like to be reminded of the fact. So it's nice to be here and to have uh, the opportunity to talk to two wonderful speakers. They are going to be uh, having two presentations on what I think I would describe as the, sometimes the UK's much unloved services sector, but why it's so, it's so important for the economy and what it means uh, and some of the gaps that exist in um, well, the TCA and the post Brexit relationship. Uh, we're going to start with June Du. June Du is a professor of economics at Aston University, and uh, I think very recently she did uh, a very in-depth study about the changing nature of UK services going up to between 2016 and 2019. Um, June, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick us off with the presentation. As always, questions via Slido, I can see them, uh, and the, hopefully we'll be able to incorporate them during the discussion once the presentations are done. So June, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marianne. Okay, I can be heard. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jun Du. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Brexit and services trade. Um, I'm, I'm based in Aston University. So there's wrong spelling on, on the last slide. It's University in Birmingham. I'm center director of a newly established center of uh, business prosperity. One of the key theme of our research is to how to make UK a more effective trader. Um, so. The title suggests it's new evidence from a synthetic difference in difference approach. I'll come to that. It is uh, six months old. So in the kind of now, nowadays, the research rolling so fast, probably it's not that new anymore. But nevertheless, let me have a go. And this is a work uh, with, with my collaborator, Sasha, in Aston. So I'm going to cover a, a couple of things. One is I will give a kind of motivation. I don't think we need much motivation. But nevertheless, I think there are some facts that that's necessary to be laid at the table. Um, simply because they're relevant and you, you will see why. And I will make a case for services trade, which probably is not a very, is not a difficult case to make. But through that, I hope to, 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 to remind us that not only the service sector is 80%, but actually it has far reaching impact in the economy. Um, and I will very briefly come down to the technical side to explain what is the research question, how we um, kind of looked for the answer and and the kind of findings we, we, we have, and discuss what we discovered. And now I will offer a few slides, which is not from this paper, but uh, nevertheless, throw the stone in a quiet river, and hope, hopefully to raise the questions that we will be looking at and discuss in the near future. Now, the problem, the problem is Brexit, clearly. That's why we're all here. Um, why is that a problem? Um, I think there are three things I would like to say. Number one is that since maybe even before 2016, this Brexit has come to our life and we all talk about it. And there's more talked about during this four and a half years uncertainty on goods and much more than services. I think in U UK and changing Europe, there have been a lot of discussions uh, by experts like Sarah, like Jill and others to speculate why there were so 
little discussion on services compared to trade. And I think there are different kind of arguments which make sense. Some suggest that that's simply because, <coughs> um, simply because there's, you know, a uh, long distance between what UK wanted and what U e EU wanted, and some suggest that because this doesn't really hit the hit, hit headlines like fish and lobsters, um, and some believe that these sectors probably would, would be taken care of by themselves and think the problem will resolve. And I think it's because of lack of education in the public, and it, it's not really understood what would be that implication. And hopefully by looking back, we can actually you know learn lessons from it. Um, so these headlines are in the gazillions kind of headlines talking about what we will be expecting to see uh, after the real Brexit, but nevertheless, I don't think it made much difference uh, in the kind of making of the TCA. Um, I regularly speak with uh, policymakers, and one of my DIT friends told me, I think you should take Brexit, Brexit out of your, the, any titles of your papers, <laughs> simply because in no time, they would stop wanting to referring your publications to, to anyone else because you know, it's not a discussion uh, really welcomed. And I also got questions asked from the, 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 the kind of um, pundit asking, what is the point of looking back? Since now we are already Brexited, we should look forward and see you know, what's, what's outside the EU. I think that my response were, were, were essentially a couple. One is that I think it's really important to look back because that's where you can understand where we fall down. And if you don't know where you fall down, you simply cannot pick yourself up. And second, I think it's all about laying, the, laying down the facts on the table to understand not only the impacts in terms of quantifiable way, but also to understand the mechanisms of why this problem happened in order to identify what could be done. And, uh, and, and second of all, as I will show you some pictures, I think the cost and benefit, cost of Brexit and benefit of Brexit is far more than just the direct traders. It is spillovers, it's, it's linkages in the whole economy, um, it's the services and manufacturings, which in the age of servitization, services is just part of the competitiveness of manufacturing. It is all the regions, all the sectors, it is the sandwich maker and hairdressers, it is the coffee servers for those sectors which are more linked and open to the world economy. So um, it is just far too important than just 80% as a number. But nevertheless, I think, you know, as you can see here, no matter if you look left or right in terms of number of the firms, the number of jobs, the turnover value added, services economy just, just very big. Um, so this is based on the data linked at, in the, at the individual firm level from 2008 to 2017, and whatever you look at is just uh, very significant as, as a, a sector. Um, Sarah has produced the figure on the left, I think it's uh, very brilliant, and, and tell us how much the service sectors in the UK is relying on EU. Um, the trade, in terms of the, the trade over GDP figure, of UK is very similar with France, but you can see it, the differences in terms of reliance and dependence on the EU. UK is by far more than, than, than France, and we don't need to you know, look down to, to Germany, and it's, it's even, even less so. On, the, on, the, on your right-hand side, this is, uh, again, at the firm level, a statistics which, which shows you for specific type of services and how much, they, how much these firms exporting relying on EU customers and importing from EU customers. As you can see on the, the yellow side, they are export, exports from exports to the EU. Um, the, the, blue, the blue colored bars are ex importing from the EU. As you can see, they are all significant. The EU market is by far the most important. And also I would like you to see over time, some sectors actually growing quite fast up to the Brexit, um, um, real Brexit to 2020. Um, and next, I think this might be slightly complicated, just let me explain. So this shows you um, where in the UK exports, what kind of services, by what kind of firms, to where. So if you could look at the, the top ones, that's, that's a big chunk of services exported by companies in London, um, and what kind of services they are exporting by large or small companies and to which market. So I think a couple of things which emerge, which emerge from this picture is that London is, is uh, of course, very big, but it's not just London. Um, 
it is not just the professional services and business services, and it's not certainly not just the financial services, it's all sorts of services. And it's not just done by very large companies, actually a significant chunk of exports are done by small companies. And it's not just, uh, it's for the EU, I think in terms of market destination, it's by, very clear, EU is by far the most important. So I guess this tells you, in terms of regional spread, the services is really impacting on all sorts, uh, uh, all areas, and through all, all kinds of services, services types. Um, and I think one point that I forgot to mention in the, in the last one is, don't forget the services and FDI are very much linked. And if you look at the percentage of firms which uh, multinational coming to the UK to invest, many of them are services. So the service trade is really, the conditions of doing service trade is, re is really a huge consideration of FDI coming to the UK. So that's why one of the key considerations is that what is the, the kind of value proposition of UK after the Brexit? And that might, might change, and I will show you some, some statistics uh, towards the end. Now, coming to this particular paper, the paper is already on the UK and Changing Europe website. I think for, for, for people who are interested in the topic, probably had, a, had already have, had a look, so I'll just run through very quickly. The key, statistics, key research question here is, um, because of Brexit referendum in 2016, up to 2019, where the most up, uh, recent data is available, what has happened to it? Uh, has it had a loss? Who had a loss? Who seemed to win? Which sector? What type of services? And which market? So these are the kind of questions we're looking for. Um, service data of Apache, and there's a whole lot of, lot of discussions to discuss you know, what is the be better data. There's no perfect data. This, you know, there's better data. So what data we're using here is OECD WTO um, uh, harmonized and uh, made consistent. It is between 2006, uh, 2005 to 2019 for 202 countries uh, for 12 types of services. Now, all sorts of similar studies which talk about the impact of Brexit is really to measure the counterfactual, which we do not observe. The quality of any kind of analysis like this really depending on the ability to identify the causal effect. And as you can imagine, if you, you know, want, to, want to estimate someone who smoke and you know, the health impact of, of smoking, you have to find someone just like him, which, which identical with everything else but didn't smoke. In this case, exactly the same. So there are three popular methods to estimate this, and difference in difference, synthetic control, and what we use, the synthetic difference in difference. In a nutshell, difference in difference essentially just to eliminate it control for everything else the same. If you find something um, which you can capture by finding the difference before and after a, a structure break like this, it's, it, it's an intervention, then you can claim that is the causal impact. The problem of difference in different, difference method in this, in this case is that we have only one treated unit, which is UK. Um, and you have to depend on to find a parallel trend. So if, for example, before 2016, the trend of the UK is already different from others, then difference in difference wouldn't tell you, you know, how much of it, because there are a lot of confounding factors. Now we come to the synthetic control, which is by far the most popular method, which essentially is a matching of, of units and, differ and difference in difference, which is okay, it's very popular, but then nevertheless, you would have some limitations of identifying what would be similar and to find a synthetic UK for you to, to, to compare. And also we have problem with, uh, with uh, calculating the inference. So that is why we have adopted this uh, di synthetic difference in difference, which is um, based, on the, uh, based on the research from Arking Sky and Imbens. So Imbens is the person who got Nobel Prize for similar approach to identify causal impact in 2021. Uh, this is one of the funding, f funding uh, paper of, of his award. So this method allows us to build the synthetic UK um, flexibly, drawing similar units from the, from the pool of controlling, but allowing us to flexibly weighting the periods and units. So in a nutshell, we believe this is probably the best method, the most consistent and most robust and efficient. So using this method, we have tried loads of robustness tests I will not bore you with, and this is what we found. Okay, let me start with, oh, sorry. How to go back? Ah, I told you all the secret, that's no good. So where are the rest of the lines? Uh, 
Well, this, this picture has a lot of lines. So <laughs> the one you, you see is UK, uh, but then, you know, I would like to Im imagine a lot of lines at the back. And uh, I was about to say that, look, this is the, 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 the service uh, performance, service export performance of the UK among other peers. As you know, the UK is largest, second, um, second largest service exporters after US. And you will see that up to 2014, the growth rate of uh, UK services are similar. You must be able to see that. <laughs> now, between 14 to 16, and you will see that there's a slowing trend shared with, shared with many others. There's no difference. And then after 16, you'll be shocked to see that UK is uh, recovering, but in a much slower pace. And here you will see a, a great divergence between the growth of UK with others. And towards the end, UK has raced to the bottom. So you must be very impressed. And here is, is why we want to look at it and try to identify how much of it is because of Brexit. OK, this is what we found. Um, the upper panel and the lower panel are essentially the same thing. So using color code, you will see the red basically is the loss or reduction in service exports because of uh, Brexit using our synthetic difference in difference methods. And the blue ones are gains. So we kind of, you know, you, you know, gave the t title of uh, winners and losers of, of Brexit. So it's it's essentially using this method to identify what has happened to it. And overall, what we found is you, because of Brexit referendum 2016, and we did play with all sorts of robustness tests, including moving the 2016 timeline to 2015 and trying different pool and trying different uh, period a uh, time frame, and as well as trying different. Um, components to calculate synthetic UK, we find more or less the same results. So overall, UK um, service export has declined by about 18.5. Um, Let me go to the next slide to remember. Yeah, 18.5 um, billion pounds year on year, uh, which is uh, quite a huge number. We find that Ireland, among all European countries, has actually gained from this. And and the statistics is about 30, 30 billion US dollar, 24 billion pounds year on year, which is about 14.8%. And the UK loss is about 5.7%. This is less than the estimates provided by other places, including the UK uh, uh, TPO. And, and some colleagues in LAFRA, they, they use synthetic control. So the, the estimates are ranging between 7% to about 9%. And here, using these methods, we find it's less. But nevertheless, 5.7% drop year on year is a, is a massive number. And we find that not, not all the sectors were impacted equally. We find that transport travel were by far the most impacted um, sectors. And insurance has lost. Um, telecom has also declined. So these are statistically significant estimates. At the same time, um, European countries do not overall win apart from Ireland, but some countries did have some, some gain. So for example, we find in the transport service, the UK has lost grounds, Germany and Spain have gained grounds. And the travel services seem to be kind of compensated by the gains in Spain. And we find, for example, the insurance loss for the UK, Germany has shown 10% um, up. And Switzerland has gained about 6%. And we find, for example, the business services, Ireland um, has grown about 18% up. And the other winner is <coughs> Netherlands. OK. So, and I think it's worth mentioning that overall, we did not find significant reduction in financial services. But we did find that. Um, which country? Luxembourg, yes. L Luxembourg in the European countries has actually lost as well. So a lot of discussions we, we have written in the paper, but in terms of financial services, which has drawn most of the, the interesting discussions, I think it's interesting to see that financial services did not lose overall over this period, which of course doesn't mean that it's not going to decline in the future. Now we see the last share uh, trading center has moved to the Netherlands, and there are other things go moving, um, moving um, um, trends happening. Uh, but as you can see here, maybe the Brexit is not one-way street. So some European countries didn't run a loss, 
and we also find some some growth in the Bermuda financial services as well. So there are some anecdotal evidence to suggest that some of the services has moved from the UK to Bermuda in order to s help US companies to serve European countries in the future. Um, okay, so overall findings are here. I'm not going to repeat. And the other additional analysis we run was to compare, was to run a slightly different um, methodology to look at how outside the EU, UK trade to outside EU differ from the UK uh, exports to EU. And to our surprise, we find that in terms of general trend of, 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 of growth or decline, has no, not much difference between the, two between the two destinations in terms of growth trend. So this is really interesting to us because in, this, in a similar research we've done with goods, we found very strong, very consistent evidence to, 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 to describe the UK trade diversion. So to the run-up to the real Brexit, UK companies have already introduced much more new, new products to outside EU than EU. We also show, see some evidence this, this morning. But for the, for the services, we don't see that. Now the question is, why is that the case? Is it because there was not, nothing really happening over this period, so, so companies are holding on? That is clearly not the case for transport and, and, and travel and telecom and IP. So is it because there's limited markets to move towards outside EU? Maybe. And that highlights the difficulty of, 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 uh, of, of expanding the services in the area where, limit, uh, where service uh, trade liberalization is limited. Um, and again, we find transport, uh, travel, insurance, telecom, the most affected one, and Ireland by far is the biggest winner. And the Netherlands experienced growth in business services, intellectual property, and there's no significant uh, uh, reduction in financial and services. Now, so given that we have learned this, I think Sarah will tell you a bit more of, uh, about what's happening more, more recently and future. So what do we do with the dwindling trade? So this is one, one discussion I think you know, we could have plenty. So looking to the future, when I think about this, what can be done? There's so many discussions, there are so many discussions and telling us it is not quite possible to really liberalize services like in an easy way uh, than, than goods, which is, which is completely true. So what, what can UK firms do in the service front? When I think about this, I think about two things. Trading is <coughs> essentially are two things. One is a trader, one is a condition to trade. So the conditions to trade has deteriorated big time. And there's, you know, it, it, it looks very bleak in order to improve that condition anytime soon in, in a significant way. But looking, but looking forward, there are areas that perhaps something can be done. So one area is to, to increase um, in, to find the possibilities to allow mobility of business travel, which is, which is, which is a big, big thing. And we hear plenty um, issues with, with business com people coming here, flying fly, fly out, it's not allowed, and, and therefore the, some, some of the head offices have to be set up in EU in addition to other barriers which motivate such move. And the second area, I think, is, is, is holding the ground for the digital digital trade. I think there's a strong rationale to write digital trade um, terms or conditions in any kind of trade negotiation in, into the future. Um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's really important uh, to embed that provision in any kind of future trade negotiations. And the third thing is that I think there's a difference between the trade um, in goods and in services. In goods, there's you know, segmentation of the production, and we're thinking about the supply chain, we're thinking about just-in-time production. But for services, it is not clear how, what, is the, what some economists consider fallback position. So some of the services is, is basically either you, do, you can do it or you, you can't do it. So the, what would be you know, the back, fallback position? This is the first characteristics. Second characteristics is many services, most of service sectors, are embedded with a kind of ecosystem. It is not, not just one type of services and you know, the, everything else will maintain the same if, if there is nothing changed. So it's, it's basically the, all the different, different sectors like financial accounting, architectural engineering, and, and the legal services, these are all bounded in the network. We've done some network analysis in the past, and what we, can, what we could see is in Europe, in European network of services, UK financial services are absolutely in the middle. But not far from that, you would see all sorts of other services I just mentioned in surrounding. 
So to provide and allow that network to be healthy and to provide that condition to allow this to, to allow this network to sustain and create more space, I think is absolutely uh, crucial. And th this leads to the kind of uh, most important aspect of the production of services, which is human capital. Um, I think now the skill skills problem are becoming even worse. Um, well, I guess Jonathan will, will talk about this issue later on. I think for the UK looking forward, how to make this place more attractive to, to, for talents and maintaining talents will be quite crucial for services. And finally, I think looking forward, it is about making a long, long term strategy. Long term strategy, not necessarily in terms of trade negotiation agreements and you know, going out. You know, it's, it's about government think about this long term economic strategy and economic policy in a kind of coherent and joined up way um, to think about in the future what would bring grounds for that competitiveness, for that competitiveness condition. For example, Sarah does a lot of work in green finance. So looking to the future when the need of net zero transitioning becomes necessary, not just for UK, but for the whole world, to provide that fertile ground for the investment to coming through, for the, for, for the investment to coming to invest the technologies to allow that happen will become much important. So here, uh, one thing to mention is that if you compare UK and US, which are not really, really comparable, <laughs> but nevertheless, it provides some kind of uh, thinking. The US, um, the biggest service exports uh, markets will be in every continent, um, in every continent, in all the major countries, and their customers in the developing and emerging economies will be about a quarter. But if you look at the major customers of the UK in terms of service exports, most are in the EU, absolutely. And uh, the flows to emerging and the BRICS countries are tiny, so literally you know, less than one or two or three percentage. So can, can UK do more in that ground? Of course, it's easier said than done because UK doesn't have that gravity, the size. So then for services, apart from size, is there anything else can make UK more attractive to increase the value of the proposition? Probably the obvious front is digitalization and new ideas. Um, so this will, should be you know, part of the thinking of the economic policy making looking forward. Um, OK, meanwhile, uncertainty continues. I would like to throw a few kind of observations. So we, we talk about a lot about business relocation, because you know, when UK becomes less, uh, less uh, attractive as a gateway to UK, uh, sorry, gateway to EU, then companies thinking about going somewhere else, and there's already work done. So we looked at, this is the, the obvious data provided by BVD through the cross-border investment. And we wanted to look at where, when, when UK firms invest abroad, especially in EU, what do they invest? And the darker areas means more projects. Obviously, I have to give a warning. This is a very rough data. This is literally raw data. So this is the, all the counts of the projects invested to different, um, different space. And what we can see is from 2016, if you can you know, imagine a line, there are some areas that UK firms invest much more abroad. For example, to go for the market, uh, market access domestically, be that the Netherlands or the Ireland or, or, or Germany and market access and domestic market potential. So UK firms are going broad in order to access to the UK. And at the same time, we, we, we identify the skilled worker availability is one of the key reasons the UK firms invest abroad. Does that mean that, that this, this similar issue in the UK will be, will be one of the constraints for firms to consider investing here. Would other country, would, would firms, multinationals from other countries investing here be concerned of this constraint? So this is a clear one, one question we, we need to be uh, looking into and being uh, alerted to. So where, where do UK firms invest? Um, the most popular places we hear so far is the Netherlands, the France, and the Ireland. But from this picture, I, we, we can show you that actually Germany is by far the most popular. Um, and given the number of uh, multinationals investing here are probably not just manufacturing. So this shows you some, some, you know, some more nu nuances than just uh, the relocation of production sites. And we see that Germany, Spain, Ireland, France, Netherlands, Poland, they're all popular places. OK, so what about the, the, the money coming in? Um, so this shows you the number of projects invested to the UK. And here we're interested in understanding what 
have brought these uh, companies coming to the UK to invest. And what we can see, uh, if you can you know, imagine before 16 and after 16, what we can see is that the banking and finance, um, well, there were a lot of investment before, and there are slightly more, not significantly more. So we, we have seen a lot of anecdotal evidence that UK banks are moving their branches abroad. I think there's a statistic suggests about 10% of the old banks are moving their assets to, to European countries. But certainly you will see that investment coming to the UK as well. So the picture is more nuanced than just a business relocated away. And similarly, we see that the business services are getting more. So, so when we suspect the business professional services uh, um, competitiveness is declining, there are certainly investment coming to the UK to invest as well. Um, <clears throat> and then I think the technical, this is one of the striking ones. So there's so much, much more investment coming to the UK to invest in the technical capability and the technical companies. So I think this is certainly one of the areas that might be some opportunities to, to grow and hold on to market. But finally, I want to draw your attention to the manufacturing. And what you observe is that before 2016, there were much more investment to coming here to produce. And that certainly has declined. So I think this is beyond you know, the service discussion, but uh, nevertheless very important because we all know that in, in manufacturing sectors, the jobs are highly paid. Um, there's knowledge spillover, and there's all sorts of other benefits. And it's important to, especially to the areas which are not prosperous enough and not resilient enough. So certainly Brexit has seems to reduce the attractiveness of UK as investment place for manufacturing sites. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. Um, comments are welcome. Thanks. Thank you so much, June. Um, for giving us a very comprehensive, ooh, very comprehensive picture of what's been happening up until 2019, I also think it sort of gives light to the fact that you hear a lot that because the single market in services in the EU is one of the least developed parts of the single market, that there's not so much to lose. Clearly, that's not the case. Um, Sarah, I'm going to hand it over to you, and maybe you can give us a sense of uh, what is going to happen, uh, perhaps in the future, and some of the other contexts around. Um, uh, trade and services. Sarah Hall from the University of Nottingham and also a member of um, UK Changing in Europe. Take it away. Great. Um, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so what I want to do is look at financial services um, in more detail and this builds um, quite nicely actually on some of the um, comments that, that Yun has made. Um, I was really um, inspired I was really inspired by the um, call for the um, conference, which kind of asked us to think about what we know and also what we don't know and where um, future uncertainties lie. And that's very much what um, I think we have to do um, with financial services, where I would argue we're still in the early stages of understanding um, what Brexit and the UK's new trading relationship with um, the EU means. Um, and in fact, the presentation follows so nicely from Yun that I don't really need to go through um, this slide. Um, just to note uh, again that the UK is a services economy. I think it's crucial to stress that it's a services economy that is very strong on trade. So um, the uh, UK has typically run a surplus in services, which has allowed us to um, buy the goods that um, we import. Um, and. Um, the TCA makes services trade between the UK and the EU, particularly exports from the UK to the EU, um, more difficult. And if you're interested um, in that more generally for the service sector, I'd just like to draw your attention to a recent report that looked at it um, at the sector level more generally. So within that wider context then, um, I think it's important to note that the EU in particular was an important export market for UK um, services. Um, so over a, a longer time period, as shown in this chart, um, whilst goods exports um, to, the UK f um, to the EU sorry, from the UK fell slightly, whilst the UK was a member state, um, services exports remained um, largely stable. Um, as Yun has also um, headlined, one of the real challenges of doing research on services trade is access to data. 
um, UK official data sources on services trade are not as robust um, or as detailed as those for goods. Um, and so um, in the paper and in this presentation, I'll be using a variety of data sources um, including, dare I say it, qualitative research, uh, where we've done um, in-depth um, interviews with firms operating um, in the UK market. Um, but before we delve into some of um, that detail, um, this chart uses ONS data to show you the changing relative importance or composition of UK services exports between 2019 and 2021. Um, given this was at the height of the COVID um, pandemic and associated lockdowns, I don't think it's surprising to see that travel and transport um, both to non-EU and EU27 countries fell significantly. Um, but there does seem to be something interesting going on with financial services in this data. So even if the overall um, financial services position for the UK has not been as bad as some of the worst case estimates would suggest in terms of Brexit, which Yun signalled, which I would agree with, um, I think there is something interesting going on in terms of the composition. Um, this chart is suggesting quite significant declines in the relative importance of the EU. Um, with some of that being offset by um, growth um, internationally. Um, I think it's also important to note that services haven't fared as well um, in recent years as, as goods more generally. And um, when you look at the UK position post-COVID, post if we can say that, and also post-Brexit. Um, so exports to um, the EU and uh, non-EU countries have declined um, in services since 2019. Um, and there's something very interesting going on with um, EU imports shown on the chart on the right hand side. I think this is picking up some of the um, interesting figures that we've already um, heard about for, for goods. Um, I think it's important though to kind of situate the um, impact of Brexit, which we also have to be cognizant of how that's played out through um, COVID, within longer run changes um, when we think about financial services. Um, so the common story is that um, London was an international financial centre and during the period of EU membership, it kind of further cemented that position by acting as an, an entry um, post, as Yun suggested, um, for firms seeking to enter uh, the EU single market through passporting. That's undoubtedly true, um, but I think this over a sort of longer time period you can see that, that London's dominance as a financial centre perhaps um, was already diminishing prior um, to Brexit, or at least we were facing that London was facing growing competition from European financial centres. Um, so this chart does come with some caveats in that it's quite hard to sort of accurately measure um, competitiveness of financial centres. This is using um, one data set, which is a kind of six monthly survey conducted by a consultancy firm that uses a number of measures that it ranks um, the uh, competitiveness of financial centres on. And that includes things like um, labour market availability, uh, business environment, infrastructure environment, uh, regulatory openness, etc. Um, the data here is shown from 2007 to 2022. Um, and you can see a trend here of um, growing competition from European financial centres that predates Brexit. We've heard a lot about this since Brexit. I think as well it's also important to note um, a, a global trend within um, financial services. So here this is using the same data, um, but it's taking the top five financial centres from each world region and uh, charting those from 2007 to 2022. Um, there's been quite a lot written post-Brexit about whether, for financial services, Europe as a whole may lose out, particularly um, to um, Asia, the Asia-Pacific Asia region. Sorry, I find that very hard to say. Um, and I, again, I think um, this is just important to locate that within um, a longer run pre-Brexit, pre-COVID um, set of trends. The, the kind of broad analysis that as researchers we take from this is that um, London and New York have had dominance as financial centres for a number of years, decades in fact, um, but they have faced growing competition from um, different um, emerging markets, both within Europe but also um, globally. So it's within that context then um, that um, the UK financial services sector left the EU. And I'm going to turn to the, to the details of that, of that departure now. Um, 
so when we talk about services, I think it's really important to be clear about what Brexit is about, because it's about rather different things to what trading goods is about. So um, goods, um, as we heard um, fantastically this morning, is about um, tariffs, quotas, um, and uh, goods physically crossing borders. For services, the issues are different, and it's really a question of who or what is regulated and authorised to sell services into a particular region and to which customers. So the question of regulatory alignment or not features um, very heavily. Um, as Mehen just mentioned, um, the, the EU single market did go further than is typical for um, trade um, areas in, in services, does go further. And the UK took advantage of this through um, passporting rights, which allowed London to act as this base um, through which firms could service the, the EU market. Um, it was clear that passporting wasn't going to continue, um, and the UK... Um, financial services sector are now accessing the EU single market through um, equivalence determinations. And here I think it's important to stress that this isn't a like-for-like -like replacement. Um, so equivalence, um, as set out by the EU, is, is temporary, it can be revoked, and it acts in particular domains. Um, and the chart on your right uh, shows the um, EU equivalence decisions which were made at the point of departure. <coughs> And the UK was, was granted two, and there's currently one in play which relates to um, clearing activities. Um, the UK um, also um, developed, made its own um, equivalence decisions um, on departing the EU and has taken a rather different approach, has been much more liberal in terms of market access. Um, and the UK also um, implemented a temporary permissions regime um, I won't go through the complexities of that, but it essentially meant that firms that gave prior notice that were operating in the UK um, at the point of departure could continue to do so. Um, and I think that uh, the UK equivalence approach and the temporary permissions regime may be part of the reason why um, Yun is right to say that we should look at um, financial services firms coming into London, not just um, the challenges that UK firms have faced exporting um, to the um, EU. So in terms of what Brexit meant for financial services, the first then is a loss of passporting rights and the movement to a limited set of equivalence decisions. Um, the TCA was accompanied um, by um, an ambition to agree a memorandum of understanding on regulatory cooperation, um, and that hasn't currently um, been signed. Um, and Boris Johnson is on the record as saying that the TCA perhaps doesn't go as far as we would like. Um, for financial services. And it's for these reasons that I think it's fair to argue that Brexit has been relatively hard for financial services. Um, to get to that position, there's a, a long story. I, I think the key point is to note that certainly in the early stages of the Brexit negotiations, um, the government was asking for greater market access than the UK currently has. And there were various um, different way, forms of market access, a sort of permanent equivalence, a model, um, or a form of mutual recognition uh, circulating. Um, but these were dropped um, over the course of the, of the negotiating period. Um, so in a way, then, we're in something of a conundrum in that financial services has uh, seen a harder Brexit than uh, the UK was negotiating for, initially, at least initially. Um, um, harder Brexit than perhaps for in other se um, sectors, but the impacts perhaps haven't been as notable so far as they have been for other sectors. Um, and I think this is partly um, a reflection of the fact that what Brexit means for financial services it differs quite significantly depending on the part of the financial services sector that, that you're looking at. So what it means for banking is very different to what it means for asset management. And indeed, different parts of the financial services sector had different asks in the run-up um, to the um, signing of the TCA. And these differences have come out really clearly um, um, in in-depth interview work that we've done, and which is reported in the paper with firms. So um, you know, this interview was really clear, um, and this supports research out there, that for some parts of financial services, talking here about share trading, the impact of Brexit without equivalent was binary and very negative. You could do something legally in the UK 
whilst the um, UK was a member state and you couldn't do that on the 4th of January 2021, so it wasn't surprising that adjustments were made. I think the key point here, though, is that there are other parts of financial services which aren't as binary, um, and it's, that, it's there where um, continued uncertainty lies. Um, so I draw attention to here so something like um, asset management and questions about the, ex uh, the amount of activity that needs to take place within the EU, within asset management, is still an area of quite significant um, debate. So what do we know then, returning to the, to the um, point I made at the start, what do we know about what has happened to UK financial services? Um, I should say here, and the observant ones among you might have noticed that I'm, I'm a professor of economic geography, and that doesn't mean I colour in a lot of the time. Um, but it does mean that I'm quite committed to um, understanding the spatial impacts of Brexit. Um, and here I'm talking about... Um, European centres. I think one area we don't know very much about, and I think it would be prudent to know more about, is the impact of Brexit on financial services across regional financial hubs in the UK, particularly somewhere like Edinburgh that has a really significant asset management sector um, and, is, and is going to be impacted. But if we turn to the um, European picture, um, the job relocations have largely been lower than uh, worst case estimates suggested. Um, new financial, which are the figures I'm quoting here, um, are estimating around 7,500 jobs. The EY Brexit tracker would be another source of information, and their most latest data that came out about a month ago um, was further revised down to around um, 7,000 jobs. Um, the, we, it's, it's a picture of fragmentation rather than um, a story of one city um, dominating. I think there's some really interesting... Um, evidence when you dig down into this data about the kind of functional specialization which is emerging in these places. Um, so Amsterdam dominating in market infrastructure relocations, for example, Frankfurt in banking. Um, the notable exception here is Paris, which I think is really interesting, which has more um, of a range of financial services activity relocating there, but typically um, of, of lower value or more mid to back office activity. So there's something um, interesting um, going on there shown here as a kind of secondary move rather than um, hub. Um, but we haven't seen a kind of overall um, erosion or, or hemorrhaging of jobs from, from the UK. Um, these are, are job figures in financial services um, across um, all European countries. Um, so we're seeing um, continued importance relatively in the UK compared to other um, EU uh, European states, sorry. Um, and I just think it's worth noting that that kind of fragmentation is not unusual. Um, so the US, for example, has a, a fragmented financial services sector. London, in some ways, is quite unusual for the way in which it, it's dominated um, Europe. And this, the, the US picture um, obviously reflects the fact that all these financial services centres, so kind of tech finance in, in California, um, some sort of back office um, work um, in Delaware, for example, that's obviously all within one trading block, and that's what's uh, uh, different about the situation in, in Europe currently, um, in that London remains um, Europe's dominant financial centre, but is outside um, EU regulatory control. Um, so if we think about um, what we don't know so much about and where we might be heading. Um, I said earlier on that one of the key questions for financial services um, and services more generally in terms of trade relates to regulation. And this is particularly the case in financial services. So um, as the UK um, is operating outside of the EU and with only one equivalence decision, the Brexit dividend there potentially lies in um, what the UK chooses to do with its newfound uh, sovereignty of UK financial services regulatory reform. And you do see this quite clearly, I think, in something like the Tigger report, which identifies financial services as being a key area for, for regulatory um, change. Um, since Brexit, the UK has been active in terms of setting out what regulatory changes might, and indeed in some cases have, been made. Um, and there's been around 30 consultations and reviews announced. Um, one of the kind of most signif significant of these is the Future Regulatory Framework Review, which essentially looks 
to set out um, the UK's approach to regulation outside of the EU um, and, and also how it's going to deal with um, EU legislation which it, which it onshored. So there's kind of general regulatory changes such as that and then there's more sector specific things like the Solvency II review for insurance, um, the Khalifa review on fintech, the Lord Hill review um, on listings. So I think it's fair to say that there's been a lot of activity from the UK in terms of um, regulatory changes. But I think it might also be fair to say that there's been more activity than there has been implementation. So um, in this table, I went through some of the, the main regulatory views and updated their status and implementation. And whilst there's been a lot of activity and ambition set out, in terms of implementation, I think it, you could argue that it's been um, slower. Um, and a number of changes are scheduled when, and I quote, when parliamentary time allows. And there's some evidence that the sector is, is starting to become quite um, vocal about the, the time in which um, these, these changes um, are being implemented. I think there may also be a question here, and this picks up on, on Yun's point, about what the overall ambition and strategy is for UK financial services, which is articulated um, by the Treasury in particular around being internationally open and competitive, um, with a focus on areas such as green finance and fintech. But beyond that, I think a kind of overall strategy um, may be less clear. There are further sources of uncertainty. Um, some of these come from um, regulatory changes which are being made um, within um, the EU. So the ECB is conducting a desk mapping review at the moment, which is assessing the extent to which um, financial services activity needs to be um, re um, located um, within the EU. There's one outstanding equivalence decision which has been extended again um, to 2025, which relates to clearing. Um, but that's not certain, and so we'll need to watch closely in terms of what happens um, at the end of that. And I think also, crucially, um, how the UK positions financial services within its new trading relationships with international parties, parties is important. So historically, um, free trade agreements typically don't do much for services and don't do much for financial services. But the UK is negotiating um, a quite an innovative mutual recognition agreement with Switzerland currently, um, which the Treasury has, has now said on the record could be used as a template for agreements with other third countries. And so I think that's interesting in terms of how Brexit may be used to innovate around what trade agreements could or perhaps should do um, for services. So um, where do I think we are then in terms of post-Brexit financial services trade? Um, we've seen a hard Brexit for financial services, but lo um, lower job relocations out of the UK than perhaps were predicted. There's also been some um, evidence of activity um, moving onshore within um, the UK. At the same time, there's evidence of fragmentation of financial services activity uh, between the UK and the EU and also within Europe. And there may be some costs associated with that for, for businesses, particularly um, around clearing. But I think the key point to emphasise is that we're in the very early stages of Brexit for financial services. Um, and there are a number of ongoing uncertainties. So the Bank of England um, has been clear that they think we're only in the early stages of understanding the jobs picture for financial services, for example. There's a number of regulatory uh, changes um, in train, but they're progressing relatively slowly. And we don't know what the impact of new trade agreements and new types of trade agreements might be. Particularly, I would draw attention to the MRA with Switzerland. I'd also emphasize that um, the, the picture around jobs is further complicated by the, the COVID impact. And so um, I would very much agree with you on that kind of uh, the mobility of people to deliver services has been central. Um, there seems to be evidence of, of you know, ongoing hybrid working, but the importance of face-to-face -face delivery remains. And so changes around um, migration, but also I would stress short-term business mobility is an area that I think is yet to be um, fully worked out. And this all comes within a caveat that there are real data challenges um, in studying services trade, despite it being a really central plank of the UK economy. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. 
Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. I'm going to take them on Slido, but because I can see a hand, if you can shout, because I don't think we have mics, and just um, tell us your name. Ah, oh, there is a mic, I think. Yeah. I am severely digitally excluded. Um, but it's much better like this. I wanted to take us back to something which Adam Posen said earlier on today when he was talking about where should this country be going. And he said one of the things you need to concentrate upon is your role, this country's role as an education provider. Now, education is a service, and I didn't see very much mention that was actually being made of it. It's actually a service which probably quite a lot of these people in this room are somehow also involved in, in one way or another. Um, what we do know about education as a service, most of the things we seem to know about uh, actually have as much to do with external factors, some of those other things we talked about today, like the segmentation of the world into blocks, which means maybe where are those students from who used to come from China going to be, what are they going to be replaced by? Maybe by the effect of the war in Ukraine, and where are those Russians and others who are filling up some of our universities and some of our public schools, where are they going to be replaced by? Um, but there has also been an impact upon service, education services through um, interventions in what used to be the European Horizon Programme, the role that this country played in that, and also um, the arrangements that are supposed to follow things like Erasmus. So I wondered whether we could comment upon educational services as well. What, have, what has Brexit done or not done for them? And I was slightly surprised that nobody even mentioned this. Thank you. you do you want to take that one? Anything I say is not based on statistical analysis, which makes me feel uneased. But nevertheless, I'm from university, but in the last few years, we had overflow of applicants from China particularly, but from other places as well, especially given the, the environment of the uh, kind of relationship between China and Australia, China and uh, US has worsened. I think from university point of view, we are losing students from e EU areas, but you know, students from China has, has been you know, quite, quite a lot. So coming back to what Adam said, I, I, I think I'm totally in agree, agreement with that. Coming back to this you know, ability and the gravity to do any negotiation, you've got to be big enough. That's one of the reasons that UK hasn't really gained much ground in the way that US would gain in the kind of trade negotiations in terms of services. So I think the, the arguments to say that you've got to clean on someone's beak it can be said more nicely, but I think it's just facts. And whom you want to be friend with is a question. Uh, certainly, EU is, is area you want to be friend with, therefore further tra trade, in, you know, whatever you call it, dialogue, um, conversation, to amend the relationship, to rebuild that trust, to find common grounds to do more, is certainly you know, one of the no-brainers. At the same time, making friends with US is always there, but you know, there's much, you know, there's limited thing can do. And then with Japan, I think that the, the, the recent agree trade agreement with Japan has laid out the grounds where we can do more on the digital side of digital trade. I think that pre pre presented some examples we can do with others. But at the same time, how much you want to go to alienate China? Obviously, I look Chinese, I guess. So. <laughs> I don't think UK want to be very hostile with China for multiple reasons. Of course, at some point you, you, you need to be choosing, but UK, but, you, but China is by far a very, very large country and it supplies you know a lot of things more than students. So I, I believe you know if you look at the trade statistics, UK and China statistics are very mega. So there are a lot of grounds one can open to do more without really you know, going too much into politics. But that's only uh, an economist's view. Thank you. Um, we have uh, three questions about Ireland, which I'm just going to combine. They're basically asking, 
why Ireland has seen an uptick, I think it was 14.8% in your in your graphs, Yoon, where that is coming from, whether it's head office uh, relocation, and somebody else asked, is it a result of the Northern Ireland protocol that Ireland seems to be a winner, but maybe not as big a winner as some might have expected beforehand? And Sarah, maybe you could talk about where Ireland might be gaining in terms of the different aspects of financial services. This was one, one of the questions we really scratched out ahead, and we had a very uh, um, um, hard interview with FT um, editor <laughs> um, to explain. I think th there are a couple of things. These results are based on the kind of causal analysis we've done. So if we could believe such analysis which isolate the causal impact of Brexit, which you know can be 100% or 60%, you know, Based on econometric analysis, this is what we believe, but there might be other things going on. But from our point of view, when we think about why this has happened, I think there are a couple of things. One is trade itself. Um, you're thinking about why Brexit, even before Brexit happened, could have an impact on trade. Um, there are various literature, various studies have in the literature explaining why. One of the, the main factors is uncertainty. With uncertainty, firms stop or decline or, or, or slow down investment. This is investment for all sorts of things, innovation, investing in a factory, investing a sales agency in a place. So you know, it's not just a production, it's services as well. So with the slowing down services, uh, I mean, slowing down the kind of investment, trade declines. This is one channel. The other channel, which we learn from the trade in goods literature, is that over this period, even before Brexit, the cost of trade, the cost of trade is not just real cost, it's, it's, a, it's opportunity cost of trading, which firms could do something else with other people outside EU, declined. So this is, this is the literature of trade destruction and trade diversion of goods during this period, which evidence is very clear. So it could, might, it could be a, 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 in the same way happen with services as well. So where w this result could be driven by both the declining trade per se, and also the declining of traders. And the traders not, did not did, uh, stop trading, but it changed location. And one of the popular places in Ireland, uh, although to really pin down to this evidence, you need to look into individual firm level analysis to really understanding how that allocation of subsidiaries and multinational have changed because of Brexit. So on jobs? Yeah, um, so on um, financial services in Ireland, um, there's really clear evidence of quite significant growth in asset management in particular in Ireland. Um, and that's largely or frequently um, attributed to um, Ireland's tax system and particularly its corporate um, tax rates. Um, I think the other, the kind of two other points I'd make in relation to financial services in Ireland. Um, one is around the question of mobility, and um, I think it's quite important to, to mention the common travel area um, between Ireland um, and the UK. Um, and also, um, so I was, I was speaking with businesses um, in Dublin a couple of weeks ago, um, and bear in mind I live in the East Midlands, which is not known for its like booming financial services economy. So um, it was quite, I was quite struck by the extent to which they, they were speaking as if they were in a bubble and that capacity, they were really struggling for capacity. So um, for example, um, law firms losing lawyers from Dublin to London because the pay was um, higher in London because of, of shortages um, in London, but also um, some concerns, I think, starting to emerge about um, office space cost in Dublin um, and potentially um, some really interesting um, outcomes of that around financial services FDI into Northern Ireland. So there's a really interesting um, phenomenon taking place where there's quite significant FDI, particularly from US firms, into fintech and insurtech around um, Belfast. Um, so the growth of um, those kinds of activities on the island of Ireland, I think, is something really interesting to watch. That's very interesting. I think we I'm going to take two more. I've got one in a room and I'll take one from Slido. So the gentleman at the back. Uh, yes, um, I was quite despondent when we cancelled international trade uh, uh, support recently. Uh, but I'm quite buoyed up by the fact that we've now been so magnanimous by giving all of our trade to the rest of the world. <laughs> um, so some good news there. Um, now, I think you've both said that uh, 
you know, much of this is yet to come, so we, we don't know for various reasons what's to come. Some of it's baked in. So just a view from both of you on whether we foresee these effects to be continuous and level, you know, going linear, essentially, or just unpredictable and sort of uh, unknown uh, into the future. Uh, I think that would be a good one to end on. Uh, and I'll take one from Slido as well, um, from Stephen Boxall, who asks, if we look at the number of people employed in services in the UK, have the numbers changed as much as the change in the value of the services? I don't know if either of you are able to speak to that okay, point. The, the number of people employed in services, uh, yeah. I guess between 2016 uh, up until now, has it changed as much as the volume of trade in services? Has there been any kind of compositional effect on employment levels? Um, right, they're two absolutely huge questions. So on the kind of general trend, um, the, the data I see at the moment suggests kind of relative flatlining um, in financial services in the immediate term, I would say. But I think I do have to caveat that with quite a number of uncertainties, both in terms of things that haven't been worked out fully yet in terms of Brexit impacts, but also on the other side of the coin, um, what kind of future changes may bring, particularly in terms of growth um, with new markets. Um, on the compositional effects um, on the labour market, I don't have that data to hand, but I think the sort of bifurcated nature of the services labour market um, is really interesting and important and a, a quite a striking element, I think, of the UK um, labour market. Um, but what they both seem to share is um, potential shortages in, in labour market um, talent currently, which I think is quite striking because often we talk about the kind of um, low paid end of the service sector market quite separately from the kind of high skilled financial services, legal services side. But there seems to be some interesting trends around labour shortages in both of those from the data I've seen, which is, is quite striking, I think. You do want to have the last word on, uh, on what happens now? Thanks, Marie. I, I don't know any job uh, labor figure, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really comment on that. As for the future, I think for services, it, it's important to see what's going to happen with the equivalence. That is number one. Number two is what's going to happen in the medium term in terms of agreements with trade, uh, with, um, with the free flow of data. I think these two could be kind of very detrimental issue if things don't go in the, in the, in the right way. Um, I worry about the skills because there are a lot of evidence, evidence to suggest that the skill problem is really a huge issue. Um, it is, it's always an issue for the UK. It's not new, but uh, it's getting worse. And uh, if you think about, you know, think, when you think about trading, we, we all know from literature that, you know, productive firms trade, productive sectors trade, productive nation trade more. So it's all about productivity. And when we, when we, when we talk about productivity, what do we mean? We mean you can produce something or service something cheaper or better in a given input. So with services as well, given the, the condition of the trading is the same, it, it's about how competitive these firms are. But then, you know, if, if, if you have seen the, the kind of distribution of productivity at the firm level for the whole, whole UK, the what's so called UK productivity problem is really the long fat tail at the end. And who are these less productive and really non-performing firms? Probably are the small and not necessarily young and not and probably old. These firms are, a lot of them are in services. So they are not productive. And it's already very selective. We know that very, very tiny proportion of firms trade for goods and even more so for services. So in the long run, things are getting more expensive and human capital is more expensive. And even worse, you can't even find a human capital. And how would you do innovation? How do you implement digital digitalization? Um, how would you um, think about net zero transition? How do you have the capacity to invest? And how do you invest in management, management quality, which is a huge issue, and leadership? So all these surrounding issues which would determine the productivity of firms will be, uh, will be the key to hold the future. So that's what I... It's quite grim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to end on that note, um, after my final job is to say thank you to both the speakers. And I think we're heading for a break so you guys can go and stretch your legs for a little bit. But thank you very much. Uh, four o'clock for the next and the very final session, which will be on immigration. 
So uh, 15 minutes for coffee and then, then we'll be...
Okay, everybody, um, I'm going to start the last session. Um, we're a, a little bit behind time, which was sort of planned. I had deliberately uh, uh, um, built in a, a bit of slack, uh, particularly at the end, since I don't think uh, um, Anand uh, will, uh, will, will want to use his full 15 minutes right at the end. Um, so um, I'm Jonathan Portis. Um, I am uh, chairing the session, and although I had, uh, um, uh, and I'm going to actually um, introduce it, it, it as well with a few slides, although I won't give a, a full presentation. Um, uh, our two speakers today are uh, um, first um, Madeline Sumption, who is uh, the uh, director of the Migration Observatory at uh, the University of Oxford uh, and also a member of the Migration Advisory Committee, although uh, um, speaking today in her former capacity rather than as a, uh, a, a representative um, of the MAC. Um, Madeleine is probably um, the uh, uh, UK's sort of, as director of the foremost um, research institute focused on migration policy in the UK. Um, Madeleine is probably the um, best known economic and policy expert on migration in the UK. Um, and uh, um, somebody who has worked closely um, both personally with me and, and with UK and in Tunisia and Europe um, for, a, for a very long time, and uh, I'm delighted she's here. Um, and I'm also um, very pleased to be able to welcome Mirto Okonomio. Sorry, is that more or less? Economo, right? it's very close. Economo, <laughs> uh, um, who is uh, um, uh, a. Uh, um, uh, um, which department are you at the IMS? Uh, the research, uh, research uh, department. Uh, from the research department at the International Monetary Fund. Um, and I think we're, we're particularly lucky to have Mirtu here, who is um, a co-author of a recent um, cross-country study examining um, developments in labor markets um, uh, um, uh, across a number of countries during and after the pandemic. Um, but focusing particularly on the US, uh, UK, and Canada, um, and examining um, some of developments with respect to uh, labor market tightness, um, migration, um, and wages. Um, and Mirtu is uh, uh, also formerly of the Bank of England, and hence uh, um, somebody with uh, personal and professional connections to London, but um, is here, uh, has been recalled to duty at IMF headquarters as they segue away from uh, working, from remote working, back into in-person working, um, but still here in London for, uh, um, for another, just another 24 hours or so. Indeed. So uh, uh, um, uh, we're, we're lucky to have her here. Um, so as I said, I'm just going to um, begin um, by giving a bit of uh, um, background and context on the post-Brexit migration system before we get on to some actual economics and analysis from, uh, uh, um, from uh, Madeleine and Murtu. Um, so first of all, just to say, I mean, I think one thing which I, I do like to say when talking about this, to put it in the sort of wider back to political economy context of Brexit, is that there, there of course, has been a huge amount of, uh, we've had uh, a lot of political drama in the UK over the last few years, particularly in the 2016 to 2020 uh, period, you know, votes in Parliament, prime, the fall of Prime Minister, cabinet resignations, all this sort of stuff. Um, but I think it's important to remember that, that, you know, about what sort of Brexit we are going to have. But I think historians will actually look back and say that actually uh, um, that uh, the form of Brexit that we have, the hard Brexit that uh, um, uh, uh, particularly that, that uh, um, Sarah described um, in the context of services and, and that others have implicitly been talking about in terms of trade of goods and the TCA, this form of Brexit was driven by immigration. If it hadn't been for um, the twin red lines of the EU and the UK, um, on migration, then we wouldn't be here. We'd have a very different form of Brexit. The twin red lines being um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the UK insisting on ending freedom of movement and the EU's view that uh, um, free movement, was, that, that um, you can't be 
the, the, the four freedoms of the single market, goods, services, uh, um, capital and labor were inseparable. And I'm not going to pronounce on either the economic or political justification for either of those uh, uh, two red lines, but simply to state, as I think a matter of fact, that once you have these two formulas, the form of Brexit that we have was essentially baked in right from the beginning, at least from the summer of 2016. Um, second point is that the, in some sense, the largest discretionary economic and regulatory change that the UK has made post-Brexit is the introduction of the new post-Brexit migration system. So what does that system look like? This is the one slide summary of um, what is probably now, Madeline may know better than I, you know, 20,000 pages of the immigration rules or whatever we're, we're up to now because every time they're changed they get more uh, complicated. Um, but um, essentially um, the new system is, is not in some ways not that complicated compared to some other countries, we have a salary threshold system. For most people, for most jobs, um, you, can, uh, um, you can employ somebody in this country, if you're an employer, you can employ somebody if you offer them a job that pays more than 25,000 pounds or some, sometimes a higher number if that's the going rate, sometimes a lower number for certain categories listed here. Um, uh, you can offer a job to anybody anywhere in the world. Um, and it's worth thinking about what that means. Um, there's no cap, there's no quota. Um, there are lower skill requirements. The skill requirements are actually basically correspond to 2A levels or above. And there's no resident labor market test. Um, you know, in contrary, con you know, not, uh, this is a big change from the previous system. You do not have to show that you can't get another Brit or previously another European to do the job. <laughs> And what this means is that essentially, for by my calculations, uh, um, and, and I understand from the, the Home Office or Mac that this is broadly right, about half of all for about half of all jobs in the UK labour market, you can offer the job to anybody anywhere in the world. That's it. Um, that's quite a liberal system, uh, um, and, and that I think is is, is worth remembering. Um, we've got a new graduate visa, so if, if someone in the previous session was asking about universities, and Madeline may say more about the statistics. Actually, you don't because you're talking about labor. But both Madeline and I have written about the statistics, um, as, as uh, uh, um, uh, um, Sarah and June said, uh, uh, um, you know, that we have seen a fall off in applications from EU applicants, but also a, quite a sharp rise from, in, in applicants from uh, the rest of the world, in particular um, from India, um, Nigeria, and Pakistan. Um, and then finally a wild card, the uh, offer of uh, um, uh, uh, visas to um, British national overseas citizens from Hong Kong, it's not formally part of the new system, but introduced at the same time. So that's sort of the brief summary of what the new system looks like. So what's that going to mean? Well, we'll hear more. But here in my parody of what the new system might mean, uh, uh, depending on who you listen to, um, it could, by reducing the supply of low-skilled workers from Europe or low-skilled or low-paid workers from Europe, it's going to boost wages, force um, employers to train and develop resident workers, British workers, um, give them a greater incentive to increase productivity at the same time as allowing us to recruit the best and brightest from anywhere in the world. Um, on the other hand, it might, uh, as Adam said um, in the very first session today, lead to higher prices, staff shortages, uh, damage key public services that can't recruit people and possibly push uh, some uh, businesses. And indeed, we have seen some evidence of this uh, in bits of the agricultural sector, possibly the restaurant sector, push people out of business entirely. So uh, um, you pay your money and take your choice. We will find out. Um, so that's the sort of, those are the sort of parodied economic uh, uh, impacts of the new system. It's also, I think, just finally mentioning the politics um, because uh, I think there is something of a, there's a sort of split personality or split view of, of you know, what, was, what was the point of Brexit when it came to immigration. Um, here is one view. This is from uh, uh, the commentator Ed West. Uh, um, uh, who complains that the new system is far too liberal. What's the point of Brexit if it doesn't stop foreigners coming here? And I mean, it's a long, 
well-argued, well-reasoned article, which got a lot of uh, attention, and uh, this was just last week. Um, but it does essentially, the basic pro 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 point is, and this is a sentiment shared by a lot of Remainers, particularly extreme Remainers, who, t who, who think that the Brexit was primarily driven by xenophobia, to be quite frank, that, you know, what's the point of Brexit unless it stops all these foreigners coming here? That was surely the point. That's what people who voted for Brexit voted for. Um, the contrary view um, is, uh, is this one from uh, uh, um, Rakeem Bex, uh, said at the, uh, sorry, let me go back, um, at the uh, um, Henry Jackson Foundation, I think, which says, no, no, Brexit's all about global Britain by being open to the best and brightest from everywhere in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And Boris Johnson um, is a natural liberal, uh, small l, uh, in migration terms as, as in other things. Um, and so what we're seeing, you know, that, that, that that's the point of the new system. So this contradiction, I think, uh, in some ways uh, it remains to be resolved. But just to, to finish, uh, um, you know, this really is a reset moment for the British immigration system. It really is by far the biggest shakeup for the last 40 years. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of questions remain on what uh, the medium-term index of the new system will be, how public interaction opinion will develop, what's the interaction with broader economic policy, and that final question of, of are we going back to again to Adam's talk, are we going to be, do we want to be global Britain or do we want to be little England, again both in economic and political terms. So that's me and I'm going to hand over to uh, Madeline now. Here we are. Great. Um, super. Well, th uh, thanks very much, and thanks for your kind words. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how the post-Brexit immigration system has changed the role of migrants in the in the UK labour market. Um, and as Jonathan said, we've got this sort of two different things happening at once. So we've got the restriction on the one hand, ending freedom of movement um, and moving to a system that is uh, much more um, restrictive and bureaucratic than uh, the, the one that EU citizens previously faced. And then on the other side, we have liberalisation uh, for non-EU citizens. So basically everyone, both EU and non-EU citizens are in a single system. Uh, that is much more restrictive for EU citizens, but it is more liberal for uh, for non-EU citizens. Um, and so, the, you know, there's been a big change, effectively, to who is eligible. Um, there's also been a change to the sort of bureaucracy and the costs. Uh, now, one of the purposes of the new immigration system was to impose selection on um, uh, on EU migrants coming to the UK, so that uh, people would have to meet skill and and salary criteria. And that um, uh, the desire to impose selection basically requires a whole regulatory infrastructure that, under free movement at least, uh, didn't exist, and that itself also has has consequences that I'll I'll touch upon. Um, I should say it's still um, it's still early days, and um, the initial impacts that we're seeing so far may not be the same as the ones that we'll see a couple of years down the line, and the evidence obviously is still uh, is still emerging. So this is really just a sort of um, first take on what we know so far about about the changes. Um, so in terms of how the migrant workforce has, has changed overall, the, the key thing here. Um, uh, that makes it difficult to analyse is that um, the pandemic and Brexit interact uh, in quite important ways. So during the pandemic, we had um, uh, migration, immigration to the UK stalled, and we probably had a decent amount of emigration, particularly of, of EU citizens, uh, leaving. Now, what we would have expected um, if free movement had continued would be that EU migration would uh, would bounce back, uh, like it did, for example, after the, the global economic crisis. Um, but then we have the post-Brexit immigration system uh, that is introduced uh, in in January 2021. Uh, that's much more much more restrictive, so prevents um, EU migration from bouncing back in the way that uh, that we would have expected. Now, the best data that we um, have uh, currently is from HMRC, and unfortunately it only goes up to June 2021, so it captures the pandemic period and the first six months of the post-Brexit um, immigration system, and it's also only for employees. So this um, chart, for example, shows um, in the two years ending in June 2021, um, the relative uh, change in the number of jobs held by people who were EU, UK or non-EU nationals at the time they registered for a national insurance number. Um, 
And what you can see is that um, uh, the EU, uh, the largest decrease during the pandemic, I sh uh, do I have a pointer on here? Um, I'm not sure I do. Anyway, the largest um, uh, decrease in employment uh, during the pandemic took place among um, EU citizens, so that's the dark line at the bottom, and it didn't bounce back as much um, during as the economy started uh, started to recover. Whereas non-EU citizens, the, that's the grey line, um, their numbers didn't fall as much um, in uh, in around that you know in the spring of 2020, and then grew actually pretty robustly throughout. Um, March of uh, 2020 and, and 2021, which means that um, by the end of that uh, two-year period, um, the number of EU employees in this data set um, was 6% lower than the beginning, whereas for non-EU citizens it was 9% higher. Now, this picture is actually really different by, um, by industry. Um, so this um, this chart shows the absolute change in the um, number of uh, jobs held by EU citizens by industry, um, and as you can see, the actually most of the decline in EU employment was driven uh, by two industries. The biggest is hospitality, which saw a decline of almost uh, 100,000. Um, so EU migrant employee numbers in hospitality. Um, in June 2021 were still 25% lower than they had been at uh, the same month two years earlier. Um, the other one, the second biggest impact was in this um, sort of catch-all category of administrative and support services, which includes um, uh, a number of low-wage service jobs, things like um, building, cleaning, and maintenance. Um, it also, I think it contains probably a fair number of seasonal workers, but there's some fuzziness in how those, um, uh, how the category is defined. But effectively, you've got this big decline in a couple of industries, particularly hospitality. Um, and um, But you, at the same time, you actually have an increase in the EU employee workforce um, in some industries, uh, transport and storage and construction, which you might have expected um, to uh, be affected by low EU immigration, um, both during the pandemic and in the first six months of, of 2021. Um, so I think, um, and these trends, I should say, are, are not... Uh, uh, they're not just driven by the fate of different industries during the during the pandemic. Um, the the EU migrant share was also changing. Um, so uh, this is just for hospitality. You can see that um, the number of EU workers in, in hospitality fell much more than the number of um, of other workers. Um, similarly, uh, in construction, the EU um, EU worker numbers grew faster than than the UK, although not quite as fast as as, as non EU. Um, so, I mean, I think, sort of, and I should say, you know, these are just the number of jobs. It doesn't tell us, um, uh, it doesn't distinguish newly arriving people from people moving between industries. So one story here, um, and we, so we don't know exactly kind of um, how much of each of those two things is responsible. One story here is that hospitality has traditionally relied on people who are newly entering the country. Um, and so it was hit first. Um, and whereas if construction relies on maybe you know some new arrivals but also people who've been in the country for for some time and then move into that industry the effect on that industry might uh, might be delayed regardless of the precise reasons I think we can say um, that you know so far the um, the change in the EU workforce has been has been very different in different industries and it's created the conditions for a much more difficult adjustment for uh, uh, for employers in some industries, particularly in hospitality and some of those uh, low-wage service jobs. It's also, at the same time as this has happened, and I, I'm not going to talk a lot about it because Mato I know is going to uh, cover this, but we've had um, uh, very high vacancy rates in, in, hospitalities and, in hospitality and very large um, shares of businesses reporting difficulties recruiting in hospitality compared to uh, many other industries. So there is some evidence that um, employers are experiencing um, uh, sh labor shortages or you know, difficulties recruiting. Now, um, there are different uh, ways that, um, t different types of response that we might expect to the end of free movement. And Jonathan already um, uh, touched upon some of this in his uh, parody slide. Um, the, uh, the one that everyone talks about, obviously, is um, attracting workers uh, from the domestic uh, from the domestic labour market, maybe by raising wages to make those jobs more attractive for them to, to come in. I should say this is not just about attracting e uh, UK citizens. There are also a lot of non-EU uh, migrants in the workforce with work authorisation, and they may be also attracted by, by higher wages. Um, 
Another um, potential response is to sponsor workers from, um, from overseas. Uh, that could be either EU workers under the new immigration system or, um, or non-EU workers. The big question there is, you know, are they allowed to do it? Does the system, because the system only permits um, employers to sponsor people in particular jobs. Um, and then the third kind of response you might see is just to try and, is for employers to respond by reducing the need that they have for, um, for workers from any country of origin. Um, and that might be as a result of um, you know, producing less um, or uh, automating or you know, a couple of other uh, responses I will um, uh, mention in a moment. I think um, in theory, and I'm not going to say too much about wages because that's the, one of the things that Moto is going to talk about, um, but in theory I think we shouldn't expect um, adjustment via wages to be the main impact that the ending of free movement has. Um, you know, based at least on previous research that suggests that immigration doesn't tend to have uh, very big impacts on uh, on wages or employment in uh, of the UK workforce or indeed of the workforce in other countries as well. Um, and this is especially the case in the long run. Um, if we do see impacts, the previous research suggests that th those should be mostly short-term uh, impacts before the before the market adjusts. And obviously, we are currently sort of in the short term, as it were. Um, and so that's something I think that we need to wait a little bit longer to see, um, you know, what if there are any sustainable impacts on on wages. I think what's more likely, um, at least you know, in theory, is that um, industries that were previously really reliant on um, on EU workers simply won't recruit as many people as they did as they did in the past. So that could be as a result of, of automation. It could be a result of uh, producing less, so having you know uh, reduced opening hours, serving fewer customers, perhaps. In some cases, switching the mix of goods and services that they produce in order to um, effectively produce less labour-intensive. Um, stuff, um, or in some cases, um, going out of business, and you know, one would expect some combination of all of those things um, to happen. Now, there is actually some, there's some early evidence starting to emerge of some of those kinds of adjustments um, taking place. So we have, for example, snippets um, of evidence from qualitative projects, like the one that there's a project at Leeds on the um, uh, on agricultural workers that uh, identified a trend as kind of some automation. Um, in the agricultural sector where it's possible, so for example, in the, the packing function. Um, there is also actually, there's uh, the ONS um, Business Insights Survey uh, asked employers who said they were facing shortages um, what the impact of those shortages was, and one of the most common responses was that they were unable to meet demands. So part of the um, response is, is likely to be simply sort of doing less of labour-intensive things that, uh, that in the past were, were done on the, uh, using an EU, an EU migrant workforce. Um, there's a, a one, I think, industry that's often of particular interest is social care. There's actually a, a report from the Migration Advisory Committee that was um, published about three hours ago, um, looking in depth at the impact of ending free movement on the on the social care industry, and it basically include it concludes that um, there are serious workforce shortages, uh, but that they are not primarily due to the ending of free movement. They're mainly due to underfunding in the sector, but that uh, the end of free movement exacerbated um, those existing problems and, and contributed to uh, to the shortages, which actually is a, that's quite a common story across different industries when you look in depth, whether it's of HG, HGV drivers or butchers or any of these um, occupations that have hit the headlines. Often the end of free movement is one of a number of factors um, that have contributed to making it difficult for employers um, to recruit and not necessarily the only one. But what we have seen in social care, um, the, the, the MAC report earlier today um, illustrates this, is you, you have, for example, um, social care businesses handing back contracts saying we're just not going to prov provide this care anymore because we don't have the workers to, um, to do it. There is also actually some um, early indication that um, that social care employers are using um, the, the new immigration system to hire non-E workers, either as carers or senior care workers. Um, so which brings me to um, uh, to the next point, which is, you know, what about this other potential adjustment? So, are employers um, sponsoring people under the new um, under the new immigration system? There's been a lot of debate about this, and a few headlines um, in the papers suggesting um, that effectively what we're seeing uh, is we've got reduced EU immigration and increased non-EU immigration, and therefore uh, this means that employers are simply substituting away from EU workers towards non-EU workers as a result of these changes in the immigration system. 
I think it's actually a little bit more complicated than that um, in practice. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily expect employers just to be able to switch from EU to non-EU workers uh, under the new immigration system, um, because, as Jonathan said, you know, there's still around half of jobs in the in the UK labour market that uh, that just aren't eligible for for work visas under the new uh, under the new system. Um, in, and kind of in addition to that, um, EU and non-EU workers have traditionally filled slightly different roles in the UK labour market, with non-EU workers being in more skilled positions on average than. Um, than, uh, than EU workers. So what we see is that um, effectively the, um, the, the increase in non-EU work-related migration is driven uh, by the health sector, while the decrease in EU is driven by uh, hospitality and low-wage uh, services. Um, now, uh, another reason, in the, I mentioned eligibility as a sort of constraint. You know, some employers can't substitute towards non-EU workers simply because they're not, they're, the roles that they're recruiting for don't meet the skill criteria and they're not, they're not eligible. Um, uh, there are also other there are bureaucracy related barriers that play a slightly different role um, uh, in that um, it can be off-putting, it's, it's expensive to use the immigration system um, and there's a lot of bureaucracy that particularly smaller employers uh, tend to be quite nervous about, particularly nervous about making uh, you know what will happen if they make a mistake, if they hire someone and then they make a mistake and they lose their license. Um, so um, this chart shows uh, the number of, this is for 2021, and it shows the number of um, uh, skilled workers sponsored under the new immigration system as a percentage of the total number of, of jobs held in that industry at the beginning of the year. And um, what you can see is that, and I should say this is uh, skilled, uh, skilled workers who are sponsored, both EU and non-EU citizens um, combined. Now, the, the ones at the bottom that have a higher percentage, these are the sort of traditional users of the immigration system for non-EU citizens. So you've got financial services, healthcare, um, and an IT, for example, at the, at the sort of three top ones. Um, many of the industries that um, under free movement relied really heavily on, on EU citizens um, have quite low use of the skilled worker route, um, even though there are some jobs that, um, that are eligible. Um, you know, hospitality, is what you know, chefs would be eligible in hospitality, but not uh, waiters and waitresses. Um, but yeah, hospitality, construction, manufacturing, um, agriculture uh, are all up there with, with very low use of, uh, of the skilled worker route. Um, there's also some, um, there's some data which, uh, which I haven't uh, showed here, but is in a, a piece that I'm currently producing that shows that the, the employers who are sponsoring EU citizens under the um, under the new immigration system are larger um, than the employers who are sponsoring non-EU citizens. Um, and I think what this probably indicates initially is that, that um, there are some startup costs of um, the employers of EU citizens getting to grips with, with the system, um, whereas small employers, um, small and medium-sized employers have over time been able to sponsor non-EU citizens, but the ones who are who traditionally relied on EU citizens aren't quite there yet. So there's a question about sort of how much that will change over time and whether we'll see kind of low use now in the beginning of the system, but then employers will sort of start to work out a little bit how to use it. Um, having said that I don't think that there's a straight competition between um, yeah, sorry, straight substitution from EU to non-EU workers, um, there are some um, some cases where we do see uh, substitution. I think there's evidence of it in the health sector, in the NHS, um, and there was a slide that I had hoped Jonathan was going to show, but he didn't, but um, yeah, maybe it's buried somewhere in the, the back of his slide pack, um, that, that shows um, that the growth, there's been uh, a lot of growth in the number of um, non-UK workers in the NHS over time, and before 2016, that growth was mostly um, provided by EU citizens, and after 2016, when um, the, when EU migration started to decline, um, non-EU uh, health workers to start to, um, to pick up the slack and come in much larger numbers. Um, so the health sector is one area, I think, where we have just seen a, a substitution from, uh, from non-EU to EU workers. Um, the, uh, the other one is agriculture, um, and that's because there's a, a specific scheme that is designed to enable people, and enable agriculture employers um, to do exactly that, to, to, uh, to hire non-EU citizens uh, in roles that pre where previously they would have needed to rely on, uh, on free movement. 
So, um, so what can we conclude? I mean, I think in general, um, again, you know, as I said, it's early days. In the initial months of um, the new immigration system and the pandemic, we've seen very uneven impacts across different industries. Um, even some of the industries that we would have expected to be affected by lower levels of EU migration, like um, uh, transportation and, and construction. This isn't going to last forever um, uh, for two reasons. Firstly, because um, uh, industries that, like hospitality, that are experiencing significant shortages at the moment are going to adjust in some of the ways that, that I mentioned, um, you know, whether it, including by going out of business, we're going to just see slower growth in those industries most likely over time. And the second reason is just that the industries that have been less affected so far um, uh, are like, will, may just see an impact further down the line um, if, if the reason for the slower impact is that they just haven't relied as heavily on people who are newly coming to the country. Um, so I think the, yeah, the basic takeaway is that is it's likely to take a few years for the impacts of the ending of free movement to work its way through the system. Um, second main takeaway, I think the use of the new immigration system um, in some industries is, is still quite low. Um, and the increase in the, the use of visas that's, you know, it's appearing increasingly in the papers and there's been a lot of reporting on EU migra non-EU migration going up in general. Um, a lot of it is driven by the health sector. I think that some of that would have happened anyway and so it's not all a, uh, a Brexit effect. Um, but, and I think there's, there's still uncertainty about whether employers in other sectors will embrace the new immigration system as much as, um, as the, the health sector has. And then final question is more about politics. Um, I think one of the big uncertainties at the moment is how stable will, uh, will the policy be? And we've got different um, sort of political pressures, I think, that we'll likely see over the next couple of years as the uh, impacts of ending free movement and implementing the new system um, sort of play out. So on the one hand, um, there is pressure uh, on the government to address shortages that have been exacerbated by, by the end of free movement. And we saw that last year, there was an interesting illustration of this when um, the government uh, introduced sort of emergency visas for HGV drivers, um, for butchers and for poultry workers, uh, which I think indicated that yes, you know, they are, um, they do feel the pressure to do something um, when there is concerns about shortages. Um, but I think it also indicates that there actually wasn't a huge amount of um, willingness to deviate significantly from the underlying plan. The, the emergency short-term visas that they introduced uh, late last year were uh, was sort of quite a, um, you know, changed things really just some trimmings around the edges. It wasn't a fundamental change of, of the plan, which is still very much that there's a skill selective immigration system that will be very restrictive for, for low wage workers. So that's on the one hand, you know, potential pressure for, for openness as a result of shortages. Um, at the same time, um, there may start to be more political pressure to slow the increase in, in non-EU migration. Um, if you think back to sort of four or five years, total migration numbers, um, particularly right before the referendum, they were a really big deal in, um, uh, in the media and in the public debate. That stopped um, for you know, a whole host of reasons that I won't go into um, fully, but they stopped it in part because the numbers, um, because migration numbers were falling. And then more recently, the numbers disappeared. Um, so because of COVID and various uh, problems, statistical problems, we actually haven't had a very good overview of, um, of what migration or net migration to the UK has actually been. And when those numbers um, come back, it will encourage more scrutiny and, and potentially more pressure um, for politicians to explain, you know, why non-EU migration um, is increasing. And I think at that stage, the interesting question will be, do we start to see the, the political pendulum um, uh, swing back the other way towards uh, a less liberalizing position on the non-EU side? Thanks. Great. Um, so uh, let me first say a big thank you for the invitation to be here, uh, to uh, Jonathan and colleagues and presenters for this uh, amazing conference. I've learned so much today. Um, so for the next part, I will be uh, taking a step back and looking at something slightly different, which is how uh, migration in the post-pandemic landscape relates to current labor market conditions for UK, uh, offering also cross-country comparisons, 
and how it ties, uh, it fits into uh, a labor market puzzle that has merged not only in UK, but actually in several advanced economies around the world. Uh, I'll be drawing material from a recently published uh, staff discussion note uh, on labor market tightness in advanced economies, which is co-authored with uh, other colleagues from the Structural Reforms Unit um, of the International Monetary Fund. Oh, did I go back? Okay, so let me start by what I mean by saying labor market puzzle. So on the one hand, we are seeing uh, uh, vacancy levels soaring in several advanced economies. Vacancy levels are now 80, uh, 50 to 80 percent above what they were prior to the pandemic, and that's more pronounced across English-speaking countries. But uh, more recent data for uh, continental European countries coming in uh, show a similar pattern. Uh, so we have plentiful vacancies on the one hand, but on the other hand, labor market recovery remains incomplete because employment rates, which you can see in the middle chart, and the intensive margin average hours worked, uh, <coughs> remained below their pre-pandemic uh, levels. So we are seeing a puzzling coexistence of having plentiful vacancies, plentiful job vacancies on the one hand, and scarce workers on the other hand. And it's quite interesting to note that this is the case in countries that employed very different government uh, policies uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, so this is the case in countries like the UK and Australia that employed very broad-based furlough schemes, and in countries like uh, US that focus more on protecting uh, workers via expanding unemployment uh, insurance programs. If we look at the standard measure of labor market tightness, which is the ratio of vacancies to unemployment, the VU ratio, we see that um, all countries in our sample are more tight today than they were prior to the pandemic. The only exception uh, is Japan, which is a very special case. Uh, I won't go into details for why this is the case. Uh, it's in the paper. But uh, if, as you can see in, uh, in the right chart, vacancy to unemployment uh, gap is, is high for most countries in our sample when we compare um, uh, when we compare to 2019 Q3. Um, it, you see that tightness is higher for 14 out of 17 cases. And when we incorporate more recent data coming in for 2021 Q4, uh, that is in fact the case for 12 out of 13 cases. Again, the only exception being Japan. So that begs the question of uh, why. Why do we see uh, plentiful uh, jobs and scarce workers uh, even across countries that followed very different policies? In the paper, we try to shed some light um, in this question and we look at several potential drivers behind uh, this phenomenon. Um, I will be focusing on the fourth one, but let me very briefly go over the, uh, the, the factors that we examine. We looked at sectoral and occupational mismatch. So this, um, the, the, the narrative there being that COVID may have induced a wave of structural transformation, as a result of which uh, the firms and the sectors where vacancies are growing are different to uh, the sectors where unemployed workers are searching for jobs. In fact, we don't find that mismatch played a big role. It, uh, when we compare it even in UK um, to mismatch during uh, right after the global financial crisis, we see that um, post-pandemic it rose less and less durably compared to the global financial crisis. Another potential factor is the pandemic itself that has created barriers to uh, the entry into the workforce, especially for some specific demographic groups like uh, elderly workers and low-skilled workers. Um, we find some evidence in favor of a change in workers' preferences, most clearly away from certain types of jobs, like non-teleworkable, contact-intensive uh, jobs. And finally, we find that migration also played a role um, in amplifying labor shortages, especially for some uh, sectors. So let me focus on the fourth factor. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, we look specifically at UK and Canada, for which we have very granular data. 
So we combine data from the jobs posting website Indeed with uh, um, uh, labor force survey data. And uh, what we find is that uh, in both countries, uh, the reduction in immigration has likely amplified job shortages primarily for low pay jobs. Um, so, uh, what you can see in, uh, in, in, in both charts is that, first of all, uh, the change in the share of foreign workers between 2019 and 2021 uh, was larger for occupations with a smaller share of uh, university graduates. These are, uh, these are depicted, the low-skilled occupations as we call them, these are depicted with uh, the blue dots. Um, and what you can also see from this chart is that there is a negative correlation both in uh, uh, Canada and UK between the growth in unfilled vacancies between uh, the, the 2019 average and 2021 Q4 and the change in the share of uh, uh, foreign workers. This is a negative correlation for the low-skill occupations, whereas it's a positive correlation for uh, high-skill occupations. So these, uh, these, uh, these facts suggest that uh, uh, the reduction in immigration has likely amplified uh, labor shortages. Uh, and uh, there is a... There is a um, there's some uh, th there's a gray uh, a range that's missing from the chart, but uh, um, the the source is at uh, at the very end, so uh, you're more than welcome to cross check what I'm about to say, uh, which is that vacancies for low wage occupations were the ones that recorded the sharpest increase in vacancies. Uh, so in the paper we show the uh, 10th to 19th percentile range. Um, for the entire distribution of vacancies across all occupations, and that is consistently below the black dotted line, which is showing you the um, uh, the nineteenth percentile uh, of low wage uh, for vacancies for low wage occupations. Um, this is the case for UK, US, we looked at this also for Canada and Australia using data from the Indeed uh, job postings website. And what this suggests is that while vacancies are growing across the board, they are growing faster for low-wage uh, occupations. Uh, as you can also see, there are some specific occupations that have featured in uh, the media a lot, um, like uh, truck drivers. There was a question earlier about how shortages uh, for truck driving jobs relates to uh, an increase in food prices. Uh, also warehouse workers, construction laborers. These are occupations that are seeing a very sharp uh, rise in vacancies, whereas some other occupations like shop sales assistants, for example, are seeing a more um, muted response perhaps related to the rise of e-commerce and uh, the reduction in personal uh, shopping. So uh, we have very hot labor markets, very tight labor markets, and a uh, key question is what does that mean for wages? What does, it, what does higher tightness mean for aggregate wage inflation? And uh, what does it mean for wage inflation across different set of industries, like low pay industries versus other industries? To answer this, uh, we employed the wage Phillips curve framework. We estimated wage Phillips curves at the sectoral level for US and UK, for which we have uh, data uh, being available. And uh, I won't uh, bore you with uh, the technical details. Um, I, I, I will focus on the findings, which is that there is a strong historical correlation between tightness and wage growth. And this correlation is stronger for low pay sectors. And you can already see this in this chart. These charts are plotting the bin scatter plots between uh, quarterly, year on year uh, nominal hourly wage inflation, uh, and tightness lagged one quarter. And they are plotted for uh, low pay industries depicted with red dots and other industries depicted with blue dots. You can see that there's a strong historical correlation which is even stronger for uh, red dots, uh, the low pay sectors. And this result is confirmed when we run in-depth uh, regression uh, analyses. A given rise in tightness has over twice as large an impact for low-pay sectors than in other sectors. 
Uh, and based on these estimates, we try to quantify what is the impact of the increase in tightness that we've seen from 2020Q2 until 2021Q4 on the pickup on wages over that same period. Uh, our, our analysis shows that tightness has uh, fueled wage growth, particularly for low paid jobs. Uh, industry, sorry, in both the US and the UK. And that is because, first of all, tightness increased more in those sectors, and second of all, because wage inflation is more responsive to tightness for those sectors. Um, so if you look, for example, focusing on uh, UK, we estimate that the direct, and I want to underline direct, contribution of tightness to wage inflation was um, uh, at least uh, six percentage points between 2020Q2 and 2021Q4, and that impact is much smaller when we look at other uh, industries, remaining industries. When we turn to the overall impact of uh, higher tightness on uh, uh, wage inflation, that is dampened. It is, um, uh, it is around 1.5 percentage points. And uh, a key reason why this is the case is because uh, low pay industries account for a small share in firms' total labor costs. So before I underlined the word direct, and the reason is that in this analysis, we don't take into account second round feedback effects, the so-called wage price spiral. So a situation where you have higher wages, sorry, you have higher wages, uh, these um, uh, feed into price inflation or inflation expectations, workers then demand higher compensation for the increase in uh, living costs, um, uh, which leads to uh, a feedback effect, essentially. And we also don't account for uh, non-linearities. So a situation where the impact of tightness on wage growth is higher when markets are tighter. So we don't account for this uh, two effects. That's why I highlighted, uh, uh, I highlighted that this is the direct effect. Um, so the, um, there, is, uh, there is a positive note to take from this chart which is that uh, so far um, tightness has, uh, has, uh, has resulted in wage increases, particularly at the lower end of the wage distribution, reducing wage inequality, and the impact on overall uh, inflation, wage inflation has been manageable because of this uh, small share of uh, low-pay industries in uh, firms' total labor costs, but of course, uh, one cannot be too optimistic because uh, with current price increases uh, fully or partly or fully eroding wage gains, what will be even more important for inflation dynamics going forward is the extent to which workers um, respond to these price increases by demanding higher wages and the extent to which higher wages are then passed on to prices. And with uh, price inflation uh, being as high as it currently is, this is a very material risk. So just, um, just to close off the session, what is the key policy uh, takeaway from this? We need, uh, we need policies that will help bring back workers into the workforce. This will help ensure that the recovery is uh, inclusive um, and inflationary and labor market pressures remain manageable. Um, and migration policies uh, uh, that help bring back workers into the labor force could be part of um, this policy agenda. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, some uh, fascinating data and statistics there. Um, uh, just, uh, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, th I find Mirti's stuff fascinating because um, this question of what's actually happening in UK, the UK labor market now, and in particular in low paid uh, um, labor markets that have been affected both by COVID and the uh, um, uh, uh, and what that's done to the sort of domestic labor market, but also to, break, to, to, to migration patterns is, is one that's very mysterious. Um, and uh, in particular, a sort of disjunction between some of the commentary that we had in the press uh, six or eight months ago uh, uh, about how wages were going up a lot for low paid occupations and everything that the data actually says, which is that um, there is relative wages um, the, the earnings distribution 
has essentially not changed since two years ago, except that actually people at the upper end may have done very slightly better uh, 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 than, than people at the lower end. So there's no compression of the earnings distribution. And that in the sectors that are most affected, actually, hospitality in particular, uh, you know, the, the, the accommodation and food services sector, which Madeleine highlighted earlier, is the one that's lost most workers, um, actually, um, wages have underperformed, again, distorted during the pandemic by uh, uh, people being laid off and furlough and so on, but now they are relatively lower than they were uh, compared to, to the median wages. They're relatively lower than they were before the pandemic. And so trying to understand what's going on here is, you know, I think we, we, we simply don't know. I think, Leo, I sort of share Madeline's view that I don't think wages are going to be the main margin of adjustment. Um, but there is some evidence from history that says that, that tightness does matter. So I think this is a sort of very uh, 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 interesting question for the next few years. Um, I've got quite a, a, a lot of questions now. Um, so uh, um, I'm going to start with uh, um, um, one from uh, um, Vijay Shrau, um, which I think is primarily from Madeleine, although uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Mirtu may want to answer, would, would a time-bound guest worker scheme like EU workers had help build the rebuild UK economy and also give time for a credible immigration policy to be worked out? I know some, this is something the Mac has thought about a lot as to, you know, the balance between temp, you know, what are temporary work schemes good for and what's this mm -hmm. trade-off between, you know, allowing the economy time to adjust and actually um, as in social care, possibly, and I think the, the the MAC report today on social care, which you mentioned, this is quite, you know, uh, we the MAC has been saying we need to adjust for ever since it was uh, in, in social care that you know the sector really needs to adjust for ever since it was set mm -hmm. up, and it hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I think there is this interesting. Um it's a dynamic in the debate where um, the, the argument, you see the argument again and again, um, well, you know, that there's a lot of reliance on, you know, foreign workers in industry X now, but if the industry can just have a few years to implement, you know, this new plan for, um, you know, uh, drawing more on the UK workforce, and if it can just have a little bit more planning time, um, then everything will be fine and it won't be necessary to have as much migration. And I think that... Um, uh, I have come to the view over the years that that argument basically just doesn't make sense, that those adjustments don't happen um, until they have to. And I think partly just that, you know, at the sort of micro level, running a business is really hard um, and, um, and employers often won't make the changes uh, unless they're forced to, basically. And so sort of planning for something a year ahead is, uh, is really difficult. So as a result of which we see sort of, you know, if you go back... Um, a decade or more, you will see the same occupations on shortage lists again and again. It's not; it doesn't tend to be the case that kind of occupations are, you know, they're on a shortage list and then and then they sort out the problem and um, uh, and uh, don't have such demand for for non-UK workers. It, it's the usual suspects that that crop up again and again. On the question of guest workers, um, there are some really big trade-offs with um, with guest worker programs, by which I assume you mean sort of a temporary um, a temporary scheme where people would be expected to go home after a certain amount of time. Um, in addition to the issue that you know adjustment may not have happened during that period, um, there are also I think there are some negatives of of temporary migration in the sense that. Um, the, the people on those routes, um, sort of integration is designed out of, of the system, um, and people who are on temporary routes are, are probably more vulnerable to certain types of, of exploitation. Um, they never get to the stage of permanent status where, uh, where they have more rights and are able to move freely around the, the labor market. Um, they also tend to be tied, uh, tied to their jobs, particularly if you have a sector-specific route. So that's actually one of the reasons that um, the, MAC, um, the, the MAC report out today, the MAC could have suggested a temporary scheme for, for social care. And it might have, you might have expected it to be a good candidate for that in the sense that these are low wage jobs and around the world, generally, you know, governments often like uh, temporary schemes for, for low wage workers. Um, the MAC decided not to go down that route. And part of the reason is just that um, some of those, those costs of having a temporary scheme of the workers having fewer rights and the greater risks of, of exploitation. So the MAC's position was that, um, that care, if you're going to admit care workers for, you know, to do these jobs for several years, um, then they should have an opportunity to, um, to get permanent status and, and, and stay long term. 
Um, completely agree with uh, what Madeline said. Um, I just want to uh, to add one one thought, which is that. Uh, the nature of these programs would, uh, uh, would not do much in mitigating uncertainty, which can uh, uh, be a drag on business activity. So that is uh, communication. If such programs were to be implemented, communication, very clear communication about the timeline, the conditions, and so on, would be critical for uh, uncertainty concerns to be uh, mitigated. Yeah. I'll take one question from the room. Yeah. There a mic? Yeah. Please. Hello, this is Bernard, not Mike. Um, I wanted to refer back to some of the alternatives which came up um, right at the beginning and were thrown in at various points. And particularly, I was interested in the role of automation. Now, I'm not going to repeat what Boris Johnson supposedly said a few months back somewhere or other, but um, there were interesting references to what was possibly going on in some bits of agriculture with respect to what appear to be more qualitative studies than something else. Um, I have had an interest in the role of um, artificial intelligence and robotization in the area of social care, which is something which has come up. And it's something, again, which I have talked about a lot to people, both in Japan, where it appears to be happening, but to some extent to people in China, where they are thinking about this as a potential way forward. I'm also aware of developments and that, again, seems to apply to places like Japan, where um, food delivery automated, I don't mean sort of d delivery at home, but I mean actually sort of machines delivering effectively food in canteens and removing um, the uh, role of, of direct workers there is something which, which we have seen. So we're talking about a number of low or co conventionally sort of low skill occupations, low wage occupations where automization is potentially um, under consideration. And whilst, I mean, yes, we're in very early stages of this, I wonder whether to what extent that can be linked to migration control. And I come back to Japan again, because Japan had almost no inward migration, all kinds of reasons for this to happen. I was intrigued by what Adam Posen showed this morning when he had some graphs which had Japan having massive increases in shares of um, foreign-born workers. He didn't explain what was going on. I wasn't sure whether this was about large rises from a very low level, so the numbers were very small, or what it was. But whether that has anything to do with, um, you know, sort of alternatives to automization, or that is a supplement to it, or what? Um, there's a lot there. Um, I'm an on Japan um, on Adam's point. Yes, it is rises from a low base, but they are significant rises, and um, I mean, uh, they, you know, the Japanese government, this current Japanese government, has taken the view that, uh, um, yes, migration, particularly for lower skilled jobs, is necessary and desirable, um, despite the fact that, as you say, Japan has probably progressed rather faster on automation. So I think there's sort of, a, you know, there, there are limits, I guess. But Madeline uh, may have, a, you know, uh, um, presumably the MAC did address the question of on, you know, in, pretty, in social care specifically, mm -hmm. to what extent automation was a substitute for migration, potentially at least. Yeah, I mean, there is a little bit of evidence that, um, uh, that, that you know, from the US actually, that um, there's, uh, the automation is more likely in areas where there is uh, less, um, uh, where there are fewer migrants and, and low wage jobs. Um, the issue with automation in general, it's, it's easier for some functions than for others. So if you take a hotel, for example, you can automate the check-in function and you will have been to hotels where you, you know, tap on a little screen yourself. Um, but room cleaning is actually very difficult to um, to automate, and basically still needs to be to be done by by people. Um, it's also you know there, there are various machines that you can use. They are expensive, and so the incentive is is not to do it. Um, 
uh, and uh, and you, you can't sort of necessarily rely on automation and keep the size of the industry the same. Um, so you may end up with a sort of smaller, more in automated um, industry. I think there's a lot of scope for that in, sort of in um, agriculture in, in particular. In the social care um, case, there is some possibility for automation. The UK system actually, um, there are no incentives for it um, because and one of the odd things about the UK social care market is that employers, um, the, 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 minimum, the minimum wage is basically baked into the system um, because local authorities are commissioning care and they um, uh, and the the care employers basically are commissioned with a with a specific number of hours of labour in mind, and there's a wage attached to that labour. So employers actually don't have the ability um, to uh, to raise wages unless it's you know unless it's funded, um, and they don't necessarily have an incentive to to innovate and maybe you know use some technological um, solutions. Obviously, you know there's a big debate about whether you know whether people want that, but if there were some um, uh, some people with care needs who, who were interested in those, um, you know, more sort of remote uh, solutions. Uh, currently, the, the system has no incentives to provide it. Yeah, I mean, I, I also don't. Sort of, I remember looking at this not particularly in a migration context, but almost um, 15 years ago, when uh, um, at, at Deep, when I was chief economist at the Department of Work and Pensions, um, in the context of uh, um, self checkout at supermarkets. And there was a view, you know, because I was basically doing welfare to work and job centers. And we were, of course, worried by far the, large, the easiest and largest way where we got people off the dole and into jobs, particularly uh, um, uh, um, less skilled women, um, was uh, um, sending them to Tesco's uh, to work. And so, you know, this was going to dry up. Well, you can look at Tesco employ the number of people that Tesco had employed over the last 15 years, and you cannot see self checkouts in the data. Um, I'm going to take one from the. Uh, um, Can you just uh, sorry, uh, sorry, quick, quickly add sorry. that we're we're now sorry. starting a project along those lines. So hopefully, uh, in a few months, past we will have something to say about it. But. Uh, uh, to the extent that uh, so, so automation technology will take some startup costs, right? And if we're talking about labor substituting technology, it makes sense to pay those fixed costs uh, if wages are higher. So, to the extent that migration leads to uh, persistent labor shortages, uh, the, the the reduction in migration leads to persistent labor shortages and has an impact on wages. That would create the conditions for firms to the, the right incentives for firms to uh, indeed pay those startup costs, keeping in mind, like Madeline said, that not all firms have the capacity to invest in uh, automation uh, technology. I'm going to take this one because I think it's an interesting one that I, I, I sometimes get in, in my um, economics of migration class, um, um, which is you know, uh, um, from Nick Feltz. Does the visa income threshold push Brits to take low income jobs as there is more competition for jobs above the threshold because of immigration? Because there's an interesting way of sort of flipping the idea, well, we should only take skilled migrants. They're good for the economy. We need them. And we don't need these low skilled migrants. Um, and the flip side, of, which sounds good, until you also think, well, that, what, what that means is that we reserving all the low skilled, low paid jobs for us Brits, um, but happy to give the high skilled ones away to, uh, to, to, to people from anywhere in the world. Um, so there's sort of general questions about short and long term impacts on the structure of labor markets and earnings distributions. Near to thoughts? Um, absolutely. And uh, in several studies, uh, um, that look at the impact of uh, migration on, on uh, native workers, the end result is that native workers leverage on their communication skills and uh, upskill in response to an inflow of uh, low-skilled uh, workers. So uh, if it was to be the case that only high-skilled workers are allowed, that uh, raises the question of will we see any downskilling happening? Uh, so yeah, I agree with uh, Jonathan on that. I guess I would assume that probably the incentive still for you know for the workers to try and get a job that is paid as much as they are able to get, and so you may see substitution or sort of movement and displacement sort of within the high skilled jobs. So people moving, and I think this is what some of the evidence that you're referring to sort of implies: people moving from uh, for, you know 
natives working, moving from jobs that um, don't require much communication to ones that, that do, um, and those may in some cases be sort of equally skilled or equally highly paid, or in, in some cases more. I'll take one more um, here, and then we'll, I think, have to wrap up um, about 10 minutes late. Thank you very much. Uh, I just had a very quick question about Murto's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, does, uh, is there an element of the uh, increase uh, of wages for uh, low earners? Um, uh, part of that is, is part of that due to the um, minimum wage increase increases recently, or has that been stripped out of the analysis or uh, taken into account somehow? Yes, very good question. So uh, we uh, for our this back of the envelope exercise, we used estimates for the wage Phillips curve that I briefly mentioned, uh, and we estimated uh, this wage Phillips curves. Um, our sample was early 2000 until 20, uh, 2020 Q1. So we did not include uh, we did not include the pandemic period exactly to control. That was a period where a lot was happening, including changes in, in uh, minimum wages. So to control for what you mentioned, we exclude the pandemic period. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, thank you. And I think we will wrap it up there. And um, uh, thank you very much to both our speakers, Mirto and Madeleine. Um, and uh, I'll just ask. And Anne to come up and uh, um, close the uh, the conference. But uh, from me, um, thank both to the last panel and to everybody who's spoken today, and to all of you for coming. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, <clears throat> I can be very very fast. Firstly, I just want to thank all our speakers and discussants today. Uh, it's been a really fascinating day. I want to thank the team who've done everything from setting things up to the live tweeting and all that. It's worked really seamlessly, so well done. Particular thanks to Ollie, who, uh, as ever, has put this whole thing together. And, of course, to Jonathan, who was the brains behind today's programme. So thank you all. It's been a real uh, interesting event. Just finally, I mean, for those of you who don't know us as an organisation, you can get all the working papers from our uh, website. And most of you probably know we've just had a three-year extension to our funding agreed, which kicks in on the 1st of May. And one of the things we're quite keen to do is sort of boost our numbers as we restart. So if you can, if you don't already, follow us on social media, sign up to our newsletter and get a few friends to do likewise. We will consider that repayment for the lovely lunch we gave you today. Uh, have a really good evening. Thanks all for coming and we hope to see you at future events. Take care. Thank you.